Well, we're here at the eight o'clock hour, just about within 30 seconds of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We wanna welcome all of you out here today. We appreciate uh, all of you that are attending. Uh, we appreciate the university presenters that are here today that we'll hear from today. And also particularly, we wanna thank the participating seed companies. Uh, we appreciate them coming together in this forum. I know it's not ideal, uh, you all would normally be doing your own meetings across the state here this uh, spring and winter. And uh, because of, obviously, because of COVID and restrictions that we have, uh, this seemed to be a good option. So we appreciate very much all of the seed companies coming together and uh, participating in this meeting today. And hopefully, hopefully uh, you, you all gain something from it today. Also want to thank Iman and his team and Kyle. Kyle's the man behind the curtain, so to speak. Uh, don't pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, but he's going to be running the meeting for us from behind the scenes uh, and, and helping us to all stay on time and, and do everything that we need to do. So uh, with that, I want to just go over a few things here real quick with Zoom. I think probably most of you are familiar with Zoom, but uh, just a couple of things I want to point out to you. First of all, on the bottom right, or excuse me, bottom left hand corner of your screen, if you're in the app, then you're gonna see a couple of controls that are related to your, your microphone and your video. Uh, we encourage you and ask that you mute yourself unless you have a question or unless you're speaking, obviously, then you can unmute yourself. But otherwise, we would ask that you keep your microphone muted and that just helps us reduce the amount of ambient noise on the presentation. So please make sure you keep yourself muted unless you have a question. We're, we're, we've got a full agenda. Um, we don't aren't gonna really have a full lot of time for questions, but what I do want you to do is if you do have a question, we can use this chat box. And that chat box is gonna be continuously monitored. You'll notice the little link there in the bottom center of the uh, toolbar at the bottom of Zoom. You can click on that chat box and it will open up a little box that you can type in messages and questions. Uh, we'll have some handouts. I know a couple of people will have some handouts that they'll put links to in the chat box. Uh, the chat box will be recorded. So all of the questions that you put in there, they'll be saved. Uh, and we can respond to those questions as we go throughout the day. So. You know, it's a little difficult on Zoom to have a whole lot of interaction and discussion like we would in a normal meeting room. But, uh, but with chat, we can type questions in there and we can respond to those questions accordingly. So feel free to use that function uh, to, to type any messages that you want to share. All right. All right. CEUs. Now, as you know, we have four and a half CEUs that have been granted for, for the meeting today. When you all registered, you were asked to provide your name, phone number, email address, and your license number for CEUs. If you provided that information, that's all we need, okay? That's all we need. We have your participation from the participant list. We know that you're there online and you're in the meeting. Uh, so if you typed in your license number and gave us that information, there's nothing more you need to do. However, if you did not give us your license number at registration and you want to receive CEUs, we need for you to type that information in the chat box. So just open up the chat box, type in your name, give us your email address, please, and also your, your license number. And then what we will do is submit all of those to ADA and you'll receive four and a half units for participating in today's meeting. The other thing that we will do is send you a confirmation email. So everyone that registered and is part of the meeting, if you provided us with your license number, we will get those CEUs recorded and we will send you an email, confirmation email saying that we submitted your name and license for four and a half CEUs. Uh, and we can only do that, obviously, if you register for the meeting and you provided us your email or if you type that information in the chat. Box. So please uh, make sure you do that. We want to make sure you get the four and a half CEUs that are that are available for this meeting today. Uh, then the last thing I mentioned, we are going to put some links in the chat box, and I will put in a link there to all of the results. We finally have all of our variety testing results. 
um, in, a, in a booklet form. And we will put a link that's for all the upland and all the FEMA cotton variety testing that we did across the state in 2020. I will put a link in that chat box. And then we'll also send it out via email to all the, all the individuals that are registered for the meeting. So you'll get it that way too. But uh, if, you want to, if you want to download that and have that to be able to look at it while you're listening to the meeting, uh, a lot of the seed company reps are going to be talking about varieties and variety testing. And so uh, if you want to have that information to kind of look at it as, as they present some data, I, I will put that link here just shortly. And you can click on that link and download uh, that booklet, the variety testing information. Now, uh, we are going to try to stay on schedule here today. And as I mentioned before, Kyle's going to help us do that. And I appreciate his help with this today. Uh, just for all the presenters, uh, for the U of A presenters, we have 25 minute time slots. And when you have three minutes left, you're going to hear a verbal announcement from Kyle. He's going to interrupt you. And he's going to say you have three minutes left. For the seed companies, you guys, most of you have 50 minute slots. Some of you have elected to only have 30 minute slots. Uh, so for you all, Kyle is going to interrupt you at five minutes when you have five minutes left and just announce to you that you have five minutes left in your presentation. So we, we want to try to be respectful of everyone's time and not, not get you know, behind schedule. So I've asked Kyle to do that here for us today. So I appreciate him taking that, taking that on. Okay. So with that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, although we do have just a, just a minute or so, if, if anybody does have any questions before we get started, uh, we can take those. Is there anybody that has a question that they want to bring up? Okay. Well, if not, again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to put them in the chat box. I can see we've already got a few, few of you have already responded in the chat box with your information. Thank you. We will make sure we get that and get all of those uh, CEUs processed. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in. Um, question about a program. Yes, there is an agenda. You should have received the agenda via email, but I will place a link in the chat box for you to download a copy of the agenda. I'll do that right now, as soon as we get started. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Blaze. Uh, Blaze Bancho is with University of Arizona Cooperative Extension in Pima and Pinal Counties. Uh, work with him on a lot of projects and he's gonna to talk to us today about uh, resistant Palmer amaranth in Arizona and some of the issues that we're dealing with there. So Blaze, it is all yours. All right, can you see my presentation and hear me? Yep, you're coming through good. Beautiful. All right, well, good morning, everyone. I'm happy everyone could be here. Uh, this program, I, I just started this year working on this Palmer Amaranth project. So it's, uh, it came to, I mean, it's pretty obvious it came to my attention as soon as I started driving through the county that uh, there was small populations here and there but in 2020 cotton season, it seemed to just explode. So it could be due to several reasons. Uh, I guess they'll tease themselves out over the future, but I just wanted to show you what we're doing and give you some background information on Palmer and uh, hopefully hopefully uh, get everyone on board to try to try to control it, get rid of it before it totally and completely annihilates us here in central Arizona. <clears throat> Come on, baby. Okay. So we have resistant populations pretty much all across the state and into California. Uh, down in the southeast, we have problems in our nut trees, uh, along with hairy fleabane. You come up by 10, it's in the Marana, it's all through central Arizona and Florence and Coolidge, down in Casa Grande, out in Stanfield, uh, head on up to Buckeye, pretty much it's in all of our field crop production systems uh, and it's it's visible. It's not even it's not even kind of hidden anymore. It's it's out in blatant open 
uh, showing itself off and just begging to be controlled. So we're going to go on a quick, a quick tour through Arizona and check out some, some problems. Here's beautiful Moran, Arizona. This picture was taken two years ago. And what's unique about this one is you could see in the background, there doesn't seem to be much of a problem. You can see a green field there, but you could see where a piece of equipment came down a row, hit the resistant population, spread it down one strip and turned around and came down the edge strip here that's closest to the camera. And it basically looked like there was two strips of uh, resistant polymer planted in that field. So at this point, this was towards the end of the season, you could see that they were manually, there was actually a person out in that field pulling plants out by hand, as you could see them laying in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, but it, at that point, it's already late, too late. If you could see that stand population, there's, there's about two plants for every 10 feet. So uh, the, the Palmer one in the, in the infested areas in this field. Next, we go up by 10 a little bit. Head up into Coolidge. Here in Coolidge, they uh, this field is is basically a loss. There's uh, it's completely infiltrated from end to end, east to west, north to south. Um, if you were to run a picker through here, you would you would put your picker uh, loaded with seed, which would potentially spread it through every other field you went into for the rest of that year. And it's also going to be probably a bust on on yield as well, since you've been in competition with this Palmer for the whole season. So then we hop on, hop on the road, head down Cottonwood to, towards uh, Casa Grande, and you see this field, which is, which is pretty strange. On the left side, you see a cotton field with almost no resistant palmer in it at all. On the right side, you can see that it's streaked through the entire field and only separated by a 20 foot row. Again, I, I think this is a, a spot where a picker came through and, and hit a population and just basically spread it throughout that field as it was moving to the north. So it's, it's, it's here and it's, it's out there and it's everywhere. Uh, we got one more of the original population that was tested and determined to be resistant in Buckeye way back in, I believe it was 2012. Uh, this particular field had been sprayed three times with Roundup before uh, Bill McCloskey, our now retired weed scientist, got his hands on it and sent it in to determine that it was in fact a resistant population. And you can see it's, it has inundated the entire field as well. So, you know, it's spread everywhere. So if you think that you might have a problem, it's time to start to control and employ some more tactics. If you don't think you have a problem, you might have a problem and you should change it change up your tactics. And if you think you might have a problem, you almost definitely do have a problem. So just be aware and be on the lookout because identification and eradication while this pro problem is small is the best way to handle it. And you'll see that as I go through these slides. So Palmer, also known as careless weed, also known as pigweed, as you see in this picture on the left, it's a big healthy plant, uh, has lots of flowering inflorescences, but produced lots and lots of seed. <clears throat> it is also a dioecious plant. So it has male and female plants and, prem, and per, uh, propagates itself by seed. So in, in stands with competition in the field, these plants can pop, produce as much as four to 600,000 seeds when they're growing alone by themselves, just out in the open with nobody to, nobody to compete with it. They can produce over a million, up to a million and a half seed per plant. So this turns into a huge infestation problem really fast in your fields. Uh, a row, a foot row of crop can have 375 million seeds. So this, there's some good news with it. Uh, some seed bank studies that have been done show that it can lose about 85% of its viability after only three years. So if you have 375 million seeds and then after three years of maybe following, it drops down to 80 or down to 15% viable. Unfortunately, that still leaves you with about 50 million seeds per foot. And at that point, you still need to still need to manage that at a, at a very high rate if you're gonna if you're gonna recover that field. And here's another reason why it's so hard to, to control. See that picture in the bottom right hand corner of the seed? It's small, it's black, it can get into basically anywhere and hide. 
And if you know all the nooks and crannies in a cotton picker, uh, there's basically a, a, a unlimited place to unlimited places to hide. And if you're that small of a seed, it can get in there and one or two or three shake out and, and that's how a problem can easily spread. <clears throat> so I mentioned it is a dioecious plant. So that basically means it's an obligate outcrosser. It only relies on pollen or seed from another, uh, another plant, another individual. This means that if you have a female plant in your field and you let it go to seed and you don't have a problem and you know you don't have a problem, it can have, it can have pollen from a resistant plant move into your field and pollinate that plant, thus producing resistant seeds. So it's, uh, that's why you, you basically have to assume that every mature plant out in your field is a resistant plant. Even if it's an escape that didn't get sprayed, got missed, whatever the problem is, if it's not glyphosate resistant and you let it go to seed, it very well may become resistant. So these pictures pretty clearly depict the difference between the male and the female flowering parts. You see on the top, they have those little yellow anther sacs that are basically the limiting factors between male and female plants that are, that are most easy to identify. They're both spiky and they're both not friendly to, to try to pull out by hand, but uh, those anther sacs kind of give away if you have a male or female. <clears throat> and then the, the growth rates of these plants, they are C4 uh, photosynthetic plants. So they have, they have an advantage over most of our crops. Cotton in particular, you can see these plants have the same germination time and the Palmer amaranth is already up well above this two, two leaf cotton. And it's going to just grow faster and faster throughout the season. It's going to pull water and nutrients away from your cotton crop. It's going to shade out your cotton crop. It has the ability to create a canopy over your crop and just basically make it, as you saw in that picture I put on at the very beginning, uh, just kill your stand and make it, make it a total loss. So I mentioned that C4 photosynthesis. That basically means it can fix carbon at a much faster rate, especially when it's hot. So the C4 Palmer amaranth to a C3 cotton plant produces about 2.3 times the amount of uh, photosynthetic sugars that a, that a cotton plant does. That just allows it to grow and outcompete anything in that field. <clears throat> so here's, a, here's the study I alluded to early. So this is a study of North, uh, Norsworthy and, and all it was done in the Southeast, but it basically just depicts how this Palmer amaranth population can easily and quickly move through a field and just uh, eliminate its production. So what they did, they put a small population of resistant seed, 20,000 seeds at the, at the furrow irrigated end, so at the top of that field in one year. Then they grew out their crop and they did not treat for resistant Palmer. So it was, it was basically let to, let to go, but they treated for other weeds. <clears throat> so you see this population in the map on the right. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is where they put the population of seed in resistant seed at the beginning of the year. And this is that harvest. So they had, they had, it spread out a little bit, but then there was just a couple guys here at the North end bottom end of that field that made it to the end of year one. Remember, this is still the very first year. By year two, be it from wind, be it from uh, equipment, be it from irrigation water movement, this population spread throughout the entire top end of that field and down to the bottom and basically created a nice painted strip right down the middle which sort of to me re resembles that picture that I showed you just outside of Casa Grande at the very beginning. There are streaks throughout the field. There are some spread uh, east and west, but that strip right down the middle is a uh, clear as day to see how it was spread. So at this rate, you know, it's 20% it's infested. There wasn't much of a yield problem. So you could potentially think, oh, well, you know, we have a problem, but it's small and we could, we'll have it under control. Uh, but maybe we don't want to use all our tactics available to try to control it. Well, that is the wrong answer because at the end of year three, there is no yield map because there was it was not able to be harvested. The whole field was inundated, uh, complete loss. 
and, and your toast without any additional chemistry. So just three, three short years, you go from a small population to uh, no, no yield at all. So that's why it's so important to jump on those fields early and eradicate it as quickly as you can. That's no escapes, that's no mature plants, that's in the field, that's next to the field. So you gotta, you gotta be on it or else it just, just takes over, to be honest with you. So here's the little table that Bill McCloskey put together a couple years ago. I'm sure all of you have seen it before, but it's, it's coming back and we need to work on it as much as possible. Uh, using our multiple herbicides, our there are multiple me uh, mechanisms of action, that's used in pre-emergence also, that's over the top if you have glufosinate and 2,4-D or dicamba re uh, resistant cotton, you need to use as many of them as possible. You need to hit those weeds while they're small and manage those populations and kill those escapes. I know hand, hand pulling weeds and rogan weeds is not the, a favorite of any grower. It's very expensive, but when you get escapes and they, if they get large, there's really, there's really no other way to do it. Uh, putting steel back in the fields, cultivators back in is very helpful. I've seen it used a lot in fields that are basically at that year three field loss uh, position. And unfortunately, we didn't have to wait till that field was in that position before we put some uh, cultivators back in it. Uh, it could have helped rescue it earlier. But it's worked. I've seen it in Morana in several fields where there is a very large problem. Uh, be able to recover some fields. You just got to get on it early and knock those plants out while you can. Uh, our cultural methods. So using crop rotations, that gives us other additional mechanisms of action gives us different herbicides we can spray through those fields uh, and basically allows us to knock them down. The plant population and row spacing, if you can develop a canopy and choke out some of those weeds early before they take over, uh, that'll give you a, an advantage also. And, you know, I've been, we've been working on planting date for years. Uh, there's a lot of things you would like to do, but you know, it's a gamble. If you go early, you're potentially in disease area if you go in too late, there could be pest complex issues where you have the youngest, most succulent cotton and, and pulling pests. Uh, so that's, that's best to be dealt with your pest control advisor and uh, see what you guys could do to manipulate that. And then not necessarily fertilize your whole field. If you're fertilizing everything, you're, you're feeding those weeds even more. So you know, try to give your crop the beneficial advantage of having nitrogen availability and not necessarily the whole field and, and just uh, drip run fertilizer. And then, you know, cover crops have great suppression. They really do. Uh, I know you don't make any money on them, but they give you some disease control and they also give you a little bit of, of suppression on these weeds. I've grown field cover crop trials where uh, we didn't even have to control weeds at all because the cover crops suppressed them with the amount of biomass that they had. So there is a long list of things that you could do uh, to try to control it and none other better than pre-plant, uh, pre-emergent, pre-plant incorporated herbicide. There's plenty of tables that Bill has shown you over the years, but nothing tells you better than this picture. That forward plot there, no treatment, the plot closest to the camera treated with, with uh, Prowl H2O. If you're going to deal a populate deal with a resistant population, you'd much rather deal with this closer uh, furrows than the farther ones. This close area is manageable. The top one is it's going to be a wash, and if you don't get on it sooner than later, I mean you you lose it. You lose it fast. So if you think you have a problem, pre-plant incorporated herbicides is a great place to start. <clears throat> And then here we go. This is a slide from Kevin Caffrey, BASF. Uh, they've, the map on the right shows you where, where they mapped out populations in the southeast. And you can see that one region in the northwest corner up in Arkansas, I do believe it is. They, they kept multiple modes of action. They kept using their residuals and tillage, and they were able to rescue a lot of that land that, or never, never lose it to resistant herbicide where other places just dealt with it year after year and, and lost a cotton for several years. And then really we need to take a holistic approach. So looking at all areas, 
that's ditch banks, that's along the road, that's the storage yard and clean equipment, uh, borders and all the crops on the farm. You know, it, it pops up in corn, we see it in corn problems. And then after the corn gets cut, people just leave the field to go to a sieve of Palmer Amaranth. And with our problems like this, we just, we just can't have that. Uh, it happens in alfalfa along the, the borders. You know, you harvest the fields, the palmer gets cut there, but those borders there, some of them have six foot tall palmer amaranth on them, that's not controlled. So we just need to be really careful and kill all those escapes. We cannot leave anything go to seed. And then here's some of the products we're putting together to try to help with this. We've already, we're really close on that document in the bottom right hand corner. It basically gives you some background like I gave you today and <clears throat> some of the methods that that can be used to really hold down and tamp down those resistant weeds. And then we're going to create this basically a, a quick reference list of chemistry that you can use at different parts of the season, some tank mixes and uh, show you everything that works good and, and has shown to be uh, scientifically proven in, in Bill McCloskey's studies over the years. So that should be, we, we're working on that currently and should be available soon. And then the overall project uh, started here just this winter. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the overall project. Uh, we're working with Arizona Cotton Research Protection Council. We are gonna put together a resource map, basically a population map of all the resistant populations. Uh, hopefully I'll have that for a meeting similar to this or the seed meetings next year. It's, I think I'm gonna try to represent our population area by irrigation district. Uh, we'll see how that goes when the, when the data comes together. But we, I wanna know where the populations are. I wanna see where we're controlling them. I'm hoping to see lots of net negative uh, plant populations over the years. So hopefully we'll you know, reduce our, our inventory of resistant weeds and be able to show some, some good improvement over the year and not, not the opposite way. So uh, all the industry folks are working with me, all the seed companies. Uh, there are several, if not all, that are incentivizing the use of pre-plant incorporated herbicides uh, and really trying to get you guys to, and the growers to want to put in and control this pest before it becomes too late. Uh, I hope that it's not too late. I really hope that we can control it, but I, I, uh, I, I wanna use every tool that we have and every outlet we have to try to influence everybody to, to use multiple modes of action, use, use tillage if need be, uh, get in there earlier than later. And if you don't think you have a problem, you very well may be wrong. So, so be on the lookout, identify those populations early and, and please, please, please control them. All right, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much. If I have some time for questions, so hopefully uh, I can answer them. Yeah, we do have we do have some time for questions. So if you have any, please feel free to unmute yourself, or you can type them in the chat box. We're monitoring that as well. All right, that must mean that everybody is going to knock the piss out of their resistant Palmer amaranth this year, and we won't see any. I like it. I have a question. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Rustin. Oh. Um, we brought in a lot of manure from central Arizona. Would that have seed in it? Absolutely. I would be on the lookout for, for wherever you spread that manure and, and, and kill those Palmer as soon as, as soon as you can, as small as you can early in the season, just get rid of them because, uh, that's definitely going to be a source, a source of resistant Palmer amaranth. Okay. Blaze, I have a question actually. Hi, um, yeah. hi Blaze, how are you? Um, regarding the, the tillage itself, do you know anything much about how resistant the seed is once it's kind of tilled into the soil? Does it tend to kind of uh, lay dormant for a long time? Is there any kind of data on how long it's gonna hang around for? Yes, there, there actually is. Uh, so if it's deeper in the soil profile, it has, it has a longer ability to just sit there dormant. It's that top couple inches you till and kind of knock down the population. 
and and then hopefully you could eradicate it slowly over time. But if you do say you know uh, a mold bore plow or some deep ripping and bring some of that bottom soil up, you are going to be bringing up new populations to the surface and and potentially having a problem again. So uh, you know that's one of the one of the other problems that's hard to deal with. And as I mentioned at the beginning, long term studies have shown that after 17 years, there's, there's still seed in the soil that's viable. So it's a, it's a long haul fight, to be honest. And, you know, hopefully we could get ahead of it because if it's only a few plants here and there, it's not that hard to manage as long as they're identified, but uh, it's definitely a, a complex fight. Cool, thanks. Okay, Mitchell Bartlett's got his hand up. Mitchell, do you have a question? You wanna unmute yourself? No, that was an accident. My bad. Go ahead. All right. Thanks, Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful where you click, what kind of sensors <laughs> you send out. Uh, before we move on to our next presentation, those of you that might have joined us after the very beginning came in late, I just want to remind you that uh, we, there are four and a half CEUs available. Uh, when you registered for the meeting, you were asked to provide your license number and an email and your name, obviously. Uh, if you did not provide that, please type that information in the chat box. Uh, you can see a lot of people have done that. Thank you. Uh, I know some of you, I've gotten texts that a couple of you are having issues with the chat box. If you can't get it in the chat box, just feel free to text that information or email it to any of us with the university, and we'll make sure that you get your, your CEUs credited to you. All right. All right, let's move on to our next speaker. Dr. Alex Hu is our extension plant pathologist based in Tucson. And uh, he's gonna be talking to us about managing cotton diseases here today. So Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Okay, Randy, can you see my slides? Yes, go ahead and go into full screen mode and let's make sure they're, we're seeing Okay, let's see. Looks good. Looks good? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. And uh, so this talk, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about, you know, some of this uh, cotton diseases I have seen in the last season. Um, I would like to share uh, some of this uh, information uh, with you. And uh, okay, so um, before um, I'm going to talk about, you know, the diseases, I want first to introduce this, you know, disease triangle or disease pyramid, uh, which is a core concept in plant pathology, you know. And uh, you probably will see, um, uh, very common, you know, some diseases on cotton plants, but a lot of all of these diseases actually, uh, you know, cause economic losses. And uh, so in order for a disease to occur, you, you have to have a, you know, a virulent pathogen. This usually influenced by the crop history, you know, the cultural practices and what, excuse me, somehow, okay, so, um, you also need to have, have a susceptible host and, uh, and uh, you have to have a favorable environment which can tip, you know, tip the balance towards the pathogen instead of the, you know, the plant health. And uh, lastly, all of this factor has to be together at a critical time and uh, at a certain growth stage of a, you know, a cotton plant in order to cause uh, significant damages. So cotton uh, susceptible to uh, many diseases and uh, uh, from early on, you can have seedling diseases and you can have laminary issues. The most important group of diseases is soybean and vascular wilt diseases. So those are diseases actually really can rob your yield, can cause the you know, premature plant deaths and also you have some bar rots and also leaf spots or leaf flights. In Arizona, in general, the bar rots and the leaf spots a lot, uh, it's common, but uh, it's a minor issue. And uh, 
So here I show you a few pictures. On the top is root, root not nematode, and we have some saline disease, some bottom to the left, and a fusarium wilt, and some bar out caused by sclerotinia here, and some fusarium wilt. So let's talk about saline diseases. Okay, so saline diseases are, are pretty common. Uh, you know, as I said, you know, Arizona is a minor issue here. Saline diseases actually refer, you know, it's a disease complex. It's caused by several uh, plant pathogens. And it's, for example, uh, PCM, resagatonia, you know, Cevelopsis, this caused black rot and some maybe by fusarium species. So what I want to point out is it's very important to know, um, you know, what caused uh, the Sydney disease problem, you know. To, so it's very important to identify the, the pathogen. Uh, because this could have some uh, significant, you know, management uh, ramification. For example, if the Sydney death was caused by PCM species, and uh, that dictate, you know, that means you have to use a uh, particular uh, uh, chemistry to control PCM. It's it's going to be different from Rhizoctonia and uh, Cevelopsis, you know. Um, so. In terms of symptom, uh, normally during, you know, after, uh, you know, the plant in the first week or the first couple of weeks, and uh, if there's a Sydney issue, you probably you will see in the field, there's some patches uh, with poor stand account. And uh, it can cause, some of this pathogen can cause the seed rot. That's, you know, pre-emergency uh, damping off. And the, the actually kill the plant before they even emerge from the ground. And a lot of times what you see, the symptom is the, called the post-emergency damping off. And you will see a symptom like, you know, uh, the like, necrotic condition uh, at the, um, on the stem just above the soil line as you see in the picture on the right panel here. And uh, a lot of this have hypocardial conditions. And uh, so, it's sitting in disease is actually hard to diagnose because it can be easily confused with like coat damage, planting issue, herbicide injury, and insect damages, you know. So if you have a field that really have, you know, a patch or spots of poor standing count, you better probably, you know, get us involved, get the extension folks involved, and uh, we can collect a sample and then send it to lab and get it, get it identified. So in terms of management, right now, most of the uh, seed has been treated with fungicide. And uh, uh, as a general rule of thumb is, you know, don't plant uh, until the 10 day average, average soil temperature at eight, eight inch depth, it's uh, at least the 65 Fahrenheit. Um, so recently, Randy and uh, me put out uh, this uh, uh, extension publication on this, you know, seeding disease. And in terms of identification and management. And um, the nice thing about this publication is, you know, we have a, a table and detail all some of those commonly used fungicide available uh, for seed treatment. And, uh, and it, it lists, you know, you know, which fungicide, you know, can be used to treat which uh, plant pathogen, you know, what kind of, you know, application methods. So it, uh, if, so the publication number is AZ1856. It's available online. So let's, I'm gonna switch to nematodes. So over the last few seasons, I visited quite a few cotton fields uh, in Graham County or Central Arizona. What I noticed is a lot of fields, you know, at early season have this, um, uh, you know, patch, or, or section of field to have, you know, really have a stunted plant and poor stand. And uh, if you look closely, um, you will see, uh, you know, a lot of plant deaths. And, uh, um, you know, I pulled some sample out of this uh, field and uh, it turned out to be uh, several nematode population are quite high. Uh, we can have a root knot nematode, uh, 
some of this field have stunt nematode and also have um, uh, stubby root net, stubby root uh, nematode and also stem and bulb nematode. Uh, so I think it's very important in order to manage the uh, the nematode uh, uh, problems. It's very important to um, to check uh, the nematode population in your soil. But it's not easy uh, to do that. And we have a extension publication here put out by my predecessor, Mary Olson, and as Mr. Here. And this kind of, uh, if you want to pull a sample, this you know, kind of detail you how you should do that properly to get an accurate estimate of the limit of the population in the soil. And uh, so in terms of ma management, as Again, it's very important to get identified and to check the, you know, the, the, the population level in the soil. And the most effective uh, management strategy is to, uh, you know, use rotation, you know, rotate to a long host crop. And uh, so for root not nematode and, uh, um, you know, the beans, cartons, uh, sorghum, corn are the host of the root knot nematode, so don't rotate with those. Actually, the alfalfa and wheat are pretty good non-host crop for root knot nematode. And so the concept here is, you know, when you switch to a non-host, um, uh, you know, crop, that crop will not support any reproduction of nematode in the soil. If you have a susceptible host, you will get a lot of reproduction of nematode in the soil, you know. And uh, for the resistant and the tolerant one, you get a, somewhere between, you know. Um, so, and also always use uh, resistant varieties if it's available. And uh, we have some uh, nematic set available uh, to control. Uh, you can apply it in furrow or seed treat treatment to. Uh, Applied nematode. If you identify a field really have high population of nematode. Now I'm going to talk about this uh, soilborne wilted disease, which is very um, important. And historically in Arizona, we have you know cotton root rot. That's our number one problem here in the state. Um, and we also have verticillium wilt and fusarium wilt, especially recently. Um, you know, there's a, a particular risk called the risk four of fusarium wilt and has been spreading in other states like in Texas and New Mexico. And uh, so uh, for verticillium wilt and the fusarium wilt, they are more like a vascular wilt diseases. And normally the infection can, uh, you know, appear at any stage of the, the cotton development. And the time of infection actually will affect, you know, extent of the yield, uh, the impact on the yield. And uh, I'll here show you a few pictures I took uh, in our cotton field here. On the uh, top right is a, a field with the cotton root rot. As you can see, this field is particularly have a lots of cotton root rot uh, pathogen. And the, low, the, the picture at the bottom, those are the field with the fusarium wilt. So uh, a quick introduction about cotton rot, since probably most of our growers are pretty familiar with this disease, so I'm not going to talk, you know, talk a lot, whole lot on this. So it's a soil fungal disease caused by the fungus called the Phematotricopsis omnivora. And it causes rapid wilt and death of the plant, especially after the flowering and in the mid summer. And uh, so the symptom is that you have this uh, you know, circle they will appear year after year. And uh, so right now, most of the cotton variety are pretty susceptible uh, to this pathogen. And, uh, uh, but you know, the, the molecules are pretty immune. Um, so crop rotation seems to be a lot of effective measure in this case. And the fungus can actually produce the sclerotia, which can uh, persist in soil after several decades. And uh, so right now, the best way to control this disease is uh, use the top guard terror. The active ingredient is the flutual alpha. And uh, 
it can be applied, uh, you know, through the T-band or modified in furrow or drip irrigation. I think uh, uh, Randy ha has been doing a lot of trial on this and uh, um, he probably will show you some of the data um, later on. Um, uh, right now also, uh, you know, the, 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 the company was uh, uh, coming up with some new uh, chemistry, especially there's you know trials of fungicide uh, in the development, um, be, because the top cut tear uh, could cause some phytotoxicity uh, in some cases. So um, we are working to uh, you know to uh, either you know use newer formulation, trying to um, experiment with new application methods. Um, so this is a, a publication that's going to come out soon um, on this particular diseases. Um, so verticillium wilt. Um, so the, in last season, 2020 season, uh, I have got quite a few calls about this verticillium wilt. And uh, um, it showed up pretty late. Uh, it's late August or early September in our field here. And those pictures I took from uh, last season here. So in general, the verticillium wilt symptom uh, is started, occur, you know, symptoms start to show up during the blooming and uh, it get intensified, uh, you know, during the ball, ball field because of, you know, a lot of physiological stress. Um, it can cause, you know, stunting and the defoliation, especially if we infection early and it may cause, you know, this cotton plant uh, severe and stunted. And the way this fungus cause damage to the plant is uh, once it's, you know, this, the, the fungus leaving the soil as a macrosclerotia, and then uh, they, they invade the xylem of the roots, and then they kind of, uh, you know, uh, sp uh, spread through the whole plant and through the, the xylem. And uh, eventually they will produce this, you know, their spores to clog the xylem, you know, that's why you show the, the wilt symptom. And uh, normally uh, the symptom uh, it will coincide with temperature increase. And uh, actually the, if you over irrigate your field and it will make the problem worse because, you know, you may think, you know, you have a wilting plant. Maybe that's because, you know, it's lack of water, but actually because, you know, if in that case, even if you over water, if you put more water into your, your field, it won't help because that's actually make the problem worse. And so unlike the cotton root rot, the verticillium wilt cases, there's no, right now, no uh, fungicide available to control this uh, disease. Uh, here, I want to show you a picture uh, from uh, Texas AM by uh, Jason Woodward. And they, you know, verticinema wilt is uh, a more severe problem in Texas. You know, uh, over there, as you can see, those two pictures show you uh, the difference in terms of the, uh, between the resistant variety and uh, versus a susceptible variety. And uh, um, I want, what I want to point out, uh, is this fungus also have two different strains, you know, one strain causes severe defoliation. And, uh, you, you know, if you have uh, the, uh, that strain and uh, in fact, early, it could cause a lot of impact on, on the yield. Um, and uh, so most of the information uh, recently I've been summarized and put into an extension publication. There's a lot of information about the biology of the pathogen, the, in terms of symptom, and the diagnosis and also the management strategies. Um, so the next one is fusarium wilt. And, uh, you know, we, in Arizona, cotton field here, we usually just have cotton rod and verticillium wilt, and uh, we don't have fusarium wilt. And, you know, in other production area, and uh, fusarium wilt is uh, it's pretty common, especially like in Texas and and even some some of this southeast state. And uh, so fusarium wilt again is caused by sorghum fungus called fusarium oxysporum uh, best infectant. Uh, there there are quite a few um, unique 
races or genotypes, you know, or, or strains. Um, in, in, in United States, it used to be, a, a, you know, race one and two as a, um, you know, your cotton uh, production area. And uh, so for race one and race two, the cause of fusarium were normally they associated with the uh, root knot nematode uh, in, in sandy, acidic soil. And uh, uh, so, but back in 2003 in California, St. Joaquin Valley, you know, there are new races called race four emerged. That race, race four, was very uh, aggressive and virulent um, on Pima cultivar. And also some, you know, upland cotton can be affected by this particular resist. And uh, after that, uh, in 2017 and 18, it was also detected, you know, in El Paso County uh, of Texas and also just across the that river in New Mexico. And uh, so this particular risk is uh, pretty, um, uh, you know, uh, damaging. So uh, that's why I think that we should be vigilant about this risk. And so far, uh, I have been doing a, a survey uh, program trying to monitor, uh, you know, whether we have FOV4 in our cotton field. Uh, so far, we have not detected FOV4 in our field here in Arizona. So this is a field uh, in Graham County uh, have fusarium wilt uh, problem. As you can see, uh, in this particular field, the symptoms really show up late. Uh, it's almost uh, early September. And the, normally you will show randomly in a few rows here, you will have a yellowing and uh, a wilting plant as it get, you know, uh, as a disease progress, a lot of this plant will be killed. You know, when you, um, here uh, to the right, this is how you can identify the fusarium wilt. You know, when you cut them open, you will see uh, some staining in the, uh, in the center, especially the dark staining in the, uh, in the central center section over there. And the staining, um, may be concentrated in the um, in the table root and can extend it up to the stem as you see in the picture here. So in this particular cases, you know, we 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 collect sample, bring back to lab, do some do the passaging isolation and do some you know molecular DNA fingerprinting. It turns out to be risk three. It's not a risk four. Um, that's the great news. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about FOV4. So FOV4, um, you know, both Pima and upland cotton are very susceptible. So it's caused a disease more like a seedling disease problem. So it's normally, you know, cotton plant with leaf stage one to six are pretty susceptible. And a lot of times on susceptible cultivars, they will kill the plant. And if a plant survives, it will cause severe stunting. And if you check, you know, if you cut the root open, you will see this dark staining, um, you know, in the type of roots. The difference between, uh, you know, risk four and the other risks, you know, risk four, the dark staining uh, mostly concentrated in type of root. They normally don't go up the, uh, extend it into the stem. But other risks like risk three, I just show you uh, in the previous slide, they will extend, extend into the stem. For risk four, normally this uh, dark staining stay in the uh, tap roots. Um, so in terms of uh, spread, uh, you know, within a field, if you have a field already being introduced with this FOV4, uh, within a field, uh, it, it's mainly spread through the uh, contaminated soil and from one side of field to another and also by you know, the shoes of the prisoner, it travels through, walks through the field, also can spread the eloculum. And also the, the infect the plant debris can carry it in the irrigation water or equipment move, you know, between the you know, uh, different field section. In terms of long distance spread, the disease actually spreads through 
you know, infect the seed. And there's a, a, a few studies where it clearly show the, the pathogen can live, you know, under the seed coat, they can live inside of the seed. So, um, so that's, uh, that's uh, you know, uh, it's very hard. Even after the fungicide seed treatment, the pathogen will survive because, you know, they are living, you know, internally. Uh, so, and in terms of management, you know, the, 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 the most effective is to plant the resistant cultivars. There are some uh, cultivars uh, are pretty resistant to this FOV4. And, uh, you know, the other one is, you know, trying to prevent or spread the spread, uh, restrict the spread of FOV4, you know, once it's detected in your field. So you don't, you know, plant seed from that, you know, uh, collect from the infest, infested field and uh, always use clean uh, equipment. Anyway, the sanitation is very important, you know, if you, if a field has been identified, uh, you know, with the FOV4. And uh, so a lot of this information also has been uh, summarized and uh, put into this extension publication, uh, number AZ1852. You can get a lot of detailed information about this disease. Um, so I want to talk uh, this, uh, you know, Ordinary leaf spot very quickly, and uh, ordinary leaf spot, you know, it's it's got occur in uh, Arizona. Um, it's it's pretty common, um, but uh, it's vary from year to year, and uh, it's really uh, don't cause much, uh, uh, you know, impact on the yield. A lot of times, uh, this particular disease is show up late in the growing season. It will cause some defoliation. You will see the symptom, this leaf spot, you know, on the leaf, on the, on the boss, you know, and, and uh, it's throughout the canopy, and it's normally associated with, you know, the stress of the, of the plant. Um, so, uh, if you want to know, uh, so sometimes it can be uh, confused with uh, cotton sauce west rust, as shown in picture bottom left here, and. Uh, the rust that you're always looking for, this yellow, um, you know, uh, pastures or uh, yellow spores. And for the uh, ordinary leaf spot, you won't see it. Um, so uh, for a lot of times, you don't have to manage this diseases. And uh, uh, since they show up late, sometimes occasionally you may see some ball rot or, or stem blight in your cotton field. And especially if your field has been grow uh, with the beans, uh, with lettuce, and because those uh, crops are also susceptible to a soybean uh, pathogen called sclerotinia. So sclerotinia really uh, can cause the bar rot if there's a you know, high electron memory. In the Sorry, studio. Alex, Alex sure. uh, just to let you know, three minutes left, less if you wanted to have some time for questions. Okay, sure, uh, I'm going to wrap up, sure. Um, okay. So uh, the the unique symptom is the um, you know it's the bleached stem. It's like a bleach the stem. That's kind of um, easy to identify. Um, so the last disease I want to uh, to mention is this cotton blue disease. Again, we don't have it here in Arizona. Um, it was uh, original discovery in Alabama back in 2017, and. Uh, um, Later on, it spread to Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, and then Mississippi. In 2019, it was dis discovered in Central Texas. So as you can see, it's moving uh, west. And uh, so this uh, is a virus. It's a virus, and uh, it's transmitted by cotton aphids. And uh, you have uh, so this virus also have additional hosts like pigweeds and hemp beets. So. Uh, it's very important to, to, um, to, to control this weed, um, you know, as in most of viral diseases, you know, control the weeds is, is, also, is a, a good uh, um, option. In terms of uh, symptom expression, and uh, um, so for this diseases, you know, the initial symptom would be, uh, you know, this blistering uh, and the, uh, crinkling of the leaf and the, the, you know, and the, if the infection start, start early, it will 
cause severe stem demand. And later season, you can see some of this uh, uh, elongation of the internode uh, because that's, that plant is very tall. And uh, so uh, right now, in terms of control, um, you know, it, the control strategy, you know, is to control the weights and to, um, uh, you know, to control the aphids. And I think uh, uh, there's a, quite a few research has been ongoing in Texas and Georgia and trying to evaluate, you know, how to use the, uh, the insect that to control the cotton aphids. And I think that's what the, all I got. Um, I have one minute, I guess, and uh, I can take some questions if you have one. Any questions for Alex? If you do, we're gonna to try to stay on schedule here. If you do have any questions, please type them in the chat box and Alex will monitor that and he can respond to them. Um, so. So I will be around, so. Great, thanks Alex, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to our next presenter, Dr. Peter Ellsworth, you all know Peter. He's our extension IPM specialist based at Maricopa. And uh, he's gonna to talk to us about some trends in cotton insect management and what's coming down the pipeline. So Peter, if you are here, there, I see your screen coming up. Yeah, you've seen this old dude with a cigar? Yep, you're looking good. Perfect. Um, I guess I can start my video too, if that helps anybody. Um, yeah, so here's the old guy with a cigar, uh, wondering what he's looking at you all about, but he's a, a doctor from over 100 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, he, he was a, a, a scientist and researcher in the health sciences and um, was so well regarded that actually even a movie was made about his life. Uh, and there is Edward G. Robinson, if any of you are old movie buffs, an old black and white movie. I've not seen it, uh, but in fact, it's entitled The Story of Dr. Ehrlich's Magic Bullet. Um, I don't know that anybody will be making any uh, movies about uh, the scientists on the program today, uh, but that's okay. Dr. Ehrlich was a luminary, and it's worth reviewing his, um, his work here. Um, Dr. Ehrlich won the Nobel Prize in 1908. So we're talking about a long time ago. Think about what was known and not known in, in medicine uh, back then. And, and largely he re received this because of, he developed a cure for syphilis, which at the time was actually quite controversial. I won't go into why, but um, he, he was an interesting figure in history. And he is really uh, the first person to conceive of and develop antibiotics and much of his work contributed to um, the development of chemotherapies and targeted medicine. Now, he is the first person to coin the term magic bullet. We sometimes hear the term silver bullet, but he was the first person to say magic bullet as something that would hit its target without fail and with no collateral damage to the surrounding environment. Uh, that was, again, over 120 years ago, pretty amazing uh, to be thinking in those terms about medicines, but he was thinking about these things and thinking about antibodies and, and what a topic to be talking about today when we're all worried about antibodies to COVID and, and developing those so that we won't uh, get COVID and distributing vaccines. But he said antibodies are in a way magic bullets that identify their target themselves without harming the organism. And uh, up until the point time of uh, Ehrlich, uh, we'd spent the previous 5,000 years uh, battling cancer really only through surgical treatment by, by excising or, or um, removing tumors physically. It wasn't until the turn of the century that uh, uh, radiation therapy came into being and then still later chemotherapy uh, and then most recently, in the last generation or two, targeted therapy, and then this last one uh, that involves um, harnessing our own immune systems. These are major turning points in oncology, and, and you might be scratching your head thinking, well, what's that got to do with um, IPM? Well, we'll get to that in a moment, but I'm going to share with you uh, one more example, um, and that would be 
uh, the advances in lung cancer treatment. Same thing, a lot of uh, chemotherapy developing through time and then targeted drugs came about in this century. And then most recently, and really very recently, the use of um, uh, targeted, uh, I mean, immunotherapy. As I said, it may not be immediately clear why we'd be referencing this in, uh, in a cotton IPM or insect management talk, uh, but there are a lot of parallels and I hope to share with you why that is. Um, I, I've often taught IPM as a pyramid, uh, which has multiple facets on it, one for each um, pest in the system. This is true for insects, weeds, diseases, everything you've heard about Palmer and, uh, and, and all the diseases that Alex covered. Each of those would be a facet in your integrated pest management program and they, there's something you have to consider. Uh, and, and I think there's a relationship between the development of advanced um, medicines and cancer therapies and agricultural IPM that we'll talk about. But if you don't like that analogy, I can go to this classic one, which is uh, just an open question. What's your approach? A sniper rifle that hits its target perfectly each time or a shotgun blast? Now, each one might get the job done, but one does so with greater hazard, right? And greater risk to other things. Uh, I think in all walks of life, this is applicable, right? If where possible, we like to have sort of a sniper rifle approach uh, to things because we'd much rather uh, be on target with our, with our management, our um, interactions with people than, than to have more of a shotgun blast. But Dr. Ehrlich did say some really important things in his writings, and this is one of them. If a compound could be made which would selectively target an organism that is causing the disease, then an accompanying toxin for that organism could be delivered together with the agent of selectivity. Well, that's, that's really um, crucial here. Again, imagine uh, uh, over a hundred years ago, he's thinking in these terms of, of, select, of selectively targeting an organism. And, and where is that more crucial than in cancer therapy, where you actually have an entity that has taken over the, uh, the internal cell machinery of the human body. So it's part of the human body. Uh, and that's what makes cancer therapy so challenging because you, you really want to um, selectively target the, the cancer without harming the, the body. And anybody that's um, uh, had family members or friends that have gone through cancer therapies, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, they may have gone through very harsh chemo treatments or radiation therapies that were really designed to almost kill the body as well. Uh, you're, you're bringing the, the body to the brink of um, lethality in order to kill the cancer within. So selectivity has really been something that scientists have been thinking about for a long time. And Dr. Ehrlich is really the reason why he started that um, that process of thinking about that way, uh, way back when. Today, um, we talk about selectivity all the time and it really refers to selective toxicity. And this is the classic definition, a chemical that produces injury to one kind of living matter, such as a cell or organism without harming another form of life, even though the two may exist in intimate contact. And again, think about that cancer example because that's uh, really what's operating here. Now, why are we talking about that in an insect management talk? It's really all about the promise of selectivity. I would submit that the industry and growers have been making investments for, for over a generation now in selective practices, in things uh, and achievements in their industry that would set us up for more selective systems. That includes the eradication of the boll weevil that happened officially in 1991, the pink bollworm eradication that officially occurred in 2018. That includes uh, the investments and deployment in Cry1AC BT uh, that went into Bullguard and other cottons thereafter to control our LEP pests. That includes all of the selective chemistries and there really have been a tremendous amount of industrial development of selective uh, insecticides uh, in the last 25 years to control leps and ligus and aphids, white flies, mealybugs, the list goes on. Uh, and then most recently we have a BT now that's in development, CRY51, the Thrive On trait for control of ligus and um, Western flower thrips. Now, uh, 
I've shown this chart many times before, and it's updated here with 2020 data, thanks to all the hard work that PCAs do in attending our crop dust losses sessions and, and giving of their time and their data so that we can get this aggregate view of what's happening in the industry. And it's really quite telling. It tells us something about our history. It tells us one, that we used to depend exclusively on broad spectrum insecticides. Think of that as, you know, the old, you know, radiation therapy, you know, we got, it, it, you know, the only good bug was a dead bug at that time. And we really didn't have much choice. There weren't selective therapies available to us. And today we have sprayed as few times as 1.99, just under two times in 2020. This movement from where we were to where we are today is extraordinary. Is it a credit to the entire cotton industry, all the growers, all the pest control advisors, all the industry and, and um, technology providers uh, have come together to accomplish something that's almost unparalleled worldwide. This is really quite a success story around the world. And it's due to a lot of things, progressive improvements over time, the introduction of technologies that you've all heard me talk about in the past. And it also includes challenges where we had um, a stink bug outbreak that disrupted uh, our system for several years, uh, and then uh, regaining stability over the system and uh, some recent innovations like uh, the predator thresholds that we introduced at the end of 2019. But what you should see in this description of our history is this word selective used over and over again. Again, that's, that's really at the heart of what's taken place through this history. And, and I'd like to explain a little bit more about how it is we even knew at the time and know uh, that we're dealing with selective technologies. Well, it happens because we make the investments to test them that way. You can imagine that there are people tasked um, like Alex and myself and John Palumbo and others to test uh, pesticides to see whether they work in the system they're designed to protect. But fewer people, I would, I would submit very few people actually test in the real system, in the ecology of the, of the place where it's to be, to be deployed in the cotton acro ecosystem how are these insecticides performing in terms of their safety to non-target arthropods? That includes all the predators and all the pollinators and other beneficials in the system. Well, that's something we invest in uh, in, our, in our program and we field test this technology routinely. We try to do that and accomplish that um, uh, in a pre-commercial phase before things reach the marketplace so that you as a grower or PCA are well equipped uh, to know whether this product is either toxic or non-toxic to the um, uh, arthropods that are out there in your fields. And we've distributed this information through tables. I use this um, red, yellow, green metaphor often to, to signify you know, the green things that are all the things that pose low risk to beneficials, the yellow pose moderate risk to beneficials, and the red high risk to beneficials. Now, just like you saw in the lung cancer treatments, we still make use of radiation therapy and chemotherapy, which would be considered pretty broad, broad spectrum. And there are going to be times when we will have to call upon these broad spectrum therapies in, in cotton insect management too. But we're trying to um, suggest to you that there are benefits to making use of these low risk approaches um, to the overall system. And one way we can do that, again, through re reviewing this history is to take all of the pesticide reporting data that you guys submit to the state, we harvest that data and categorize each application as whether it's um, safe or moderately safe or not safe uh, to the non-target arthropods. So we can transform this chart into this chart. And it tells us that, yeah, there's a sea of red of non-selective or broad spectrum materials that were in use in the early 90s. And we've seen this progressive shift over the industry. Uh, due to technological innovations and, and really the, the progressive uptake and adoption by, by you, the grower and PCA uh, managing these fields. An extraordinary accomplishment, uh, not without its setbacks. There are times in our history where we spray more and, and oftentimes that's associated with more broad spectrum insecticide use. Now let's just take 2017. This was a high watermark year for us for selective uh, chemical use. So let's look at that in a pie chart. It shows again that we spray mainly using fully selective materials. We still make use of partially selective and broad spectrums. 
And on average, we're spraying very modestly, only 2.2 times in Arizona cotton. But let's look at California cotton for that same year. A very different picture, I would submit. First and foremost, uh, you know, they're spraying a lot more broad spectrums than we would ever even consider doing and haven't done in quite a long time. They also use partially selected materials and they do have access to much of the same technology that we do, but they just don't make as frequent use of it there in California. They sprayed almost 10 times that year. I don't know all the challenges they are facing. Uh, I'm not uh, casting aspersions to our regional neighbor, but it makes for an interesting comparative um, uh, analysis, right? You know, what, you know, why we've we been so successful in, in leveraging uh, and reaping the benefits of selectivity. Well, here's what they do in, in California. They use acetamiprid, that's intruder or a sale. We use that compound as well. It's a partially selective material, it belongs over here. But they also use the other four neonicotinoids, uh, the other four insecticides in the neonicotinoid class, which almost never get used in Arizona cotton. As well, they use about 15 compounds in total that would all be classified as broad spectrum in their effects and their impacts on non-target beneficials. Uh, that includes um, several familiar things, including uh, you know, six pyrethroids and seven other um, OPs here, uh, most of which are hardly ever used in the Arizona system. Now, uh, a, a few years back, I, I was uh, thinking about this issue of selectivity and, and thought, well, now since 2006, we've had selective agents for control of ligus in the form of carbine and later with the development of transform, which are fully selective ligus uh, uh, control chemicals. So the idea here is if, if we're using those chemicals exclusively in control of ligus, we shouldn't be flaring any secondary problems. So I asked the question, should there be an, any relationship between ligus sprays and sprays for secondary pests? Well, I was very shocked to see this, this positive relationship, suggesting that the more we sprayed for ligus, the more we were gonna spray for secondary pests. That went counter to what I was expecting and I was really, um, I was really dismayed at first. So we went ahead, um, looked at the data more closely and realized, well, in fact, in this 11 year period, there were three years in which we did use broad spectrums more regularly. When I excluded those three years, I ended up with a non-significant relationship, a flatlined relationship, meaning when we're spraying for ligus, we aren't flaring secondary pests and incurring the cost of additional sprays. So that was affirming for me. It, it told me that we are on track. This is something we wanna do. It also showed me that in those broad spectrum years that we really do see a very steep relationship. When we're spraying with more broad spectrums for ligus control, we're gonna cause more secondary pest problems and the need to spray for those secondary pest problems. Now we have two distinctive eras, the broad spectrum era and the selective era that basically started in 1996. We can take all that data and ask questions about it based on, uh, on these use practices. So how does the use of non-selective sprays impact spray frequency? By now it might be obvious to you that based on what I've been saying that the more we use non-selective sprays, the more likely we're gonna have to spray more. And that in fact is a very, very strong relationship representing over 5 million acres of cotton over this, um, over this 25 year period. Um, but let's look at it in terms of the fully selective uh, materials and ask the inverse or the converse of the question. How does the use of selective sprays impact spray frequency? Now here I decided just to use 2019 data and show you individual data that PCAs have provided um, that give us a glimpse into what the role of selective chemistry is. And indeed it shows the steep decline in the number of sprays made in total with the more frequent use of fully selective materials. So if you're using all selective materials, you're gonna be spraying fewer times than if you are using all broad spectrum materials. In fact, this relationship predicts what would happen if someone today were still growing cotton like it was 1992, they would be spraying seven times instead of what ended up being the mean for 2019 of about 2.1 times. So that's a five spray differential. That is what 
um, PCAs and growers are saving themselves by adopting these technologies so readily. This is the relationship, the same relationship for 2020. Now it's, it's still steep, it's still very significant, um, but the differential is only about three sprays between here and what the average was for 2020. That in part reflects the differences year by year. There was less insect pressure in general in 2020, and that's reflected here. Here are both years together. You can see they show the same general relationship. The more we use fully selective materials, the less, less likely you will have to spray more. But if we do the analysis on both, here's the net analysis for both days. And again, it shows about a five spray differential uh, between using all fully selective materials and using no fully selective materials. Now we don't have anybody that is out here, thankfully, uh, but you know, because of circumstances, whatever it may be, some people are having to use more non-selective materials. And let's look at this one here. Here's someone that 22% of the time they were using fully selective materials, sprayed about six and a half times that, uh, last, uh, la on average the last two years. Um, not much of a benefit over seven sprays. So where is the threshold? How, how far do, does the whole community have to go before we see, to see, before we see this watershed advance for the industry? So what proportion of selective use do you need to really see benefits? I don't know the answer to that, but we're gonna analyze it further uh, moving forward. But it's interesting to note that 22% didn't look like it was very saving for an Arizona grower. And 27% doesn't look like it's enough to save the cotton industry a lot of sprays. So there does seem to be a level at which we need to be adopting these selective technologies. We need to be committed to using them if we really want to benefit um, from them. So uh, we, we provided these um, tables for you uh, that show you the efficacy and selectivity of chemistry, but we also provide additional risks here. Now, this is just uh, you know, sort of a yes, no thing, but we're able to tell you about resistance risks for some of these compounds, as well as all these other non-target risks, risks to aquatic wildlife, risk to bees, risks to humans, that would be bystanders to fields, and risks to terrestrial wildlife. Now, this doesn't mean you would never use these compounds, and it doesn't mean somebody's um, going to kill a bird or a fish or, uh, you know, a quail as a result of their use, but it does mean that mitigations are needed to prevent those um, risks from being manifested in a negative consequence. We don't discuss economic risk in that table because you know what, you guys are the experts for economics. So, uh, you know, prices change all the time. That's a discussion between grower and PCA as to how they're gonna proceed. But what we can do is analyze your investments in foliar insecticides over the years and show you that in 2020 dollars, you are spraying, you're spending far less money than we used to have to spray. So going back to our turning points here in modern oncology, I wanna focus here where we are in most recent history. And this is true in cancer therapy. Now we're looking for things that um, remove inhibitions to our immune system, that energize our immune systems or somehow activate our immune systems. And you know what? That's what we'd like to do in- Sorry, Peter, three minutes. Thank you. Agricultural IPM as well. We count pests but we want to also now count um, what would be the antibodies in our system. And that would be the predators, the things that are already in our system that can be energized and harnessed in our favor if we pay attention to them and count them. There are six key groups that we've identified as key for tracking in your fields. And as growers or PCAs, you should wanna know more about how many of these are, are operating in your field at any one time so that you can make use of the predator thresholds that we have distributed and talked to you over the last two years. With the help of industry, we distributed these pocket guides to every PCA. If you don't have one, let us know. We'll definitely get one out to you. It goes briefly through the system, provides you tables in how to use these predator thresholds. So what's next? Where are we headed? It should be obvious by now, we're headed towards more selective technologies. That's where all the agricultural industry is going. There aren't registrants trying to develop broad spectrum therapies. 
And in cancer therapy, you'll find the same thing. Everything is about targeting these therapies directly at the problem, whether that's a cancer or another disease, or in this case, an insect pest. And Thrive On technology is the latest in that development. It is effective on ligus. It is effective on Western flower thrips. It is coming to us. We're gonna see it this year. We're gonna see it commercialized very shortly. We're investing time now. I'm not gonna go over the results of it, to understand this web, this food web among predators and pests, to understand whether Thrive On is really completely and fully selective. What's interesting is it is targeting Western flower thrips and is quite effective on it. And we know in the Western system that Western flower thrips play a dual role. They serve both as predator and pest. Certainly Western flower thrips can feed on the cotton plant at the seedling stage. That's not a big issue here in Arizona where we have excellent planting conditions, but it's a big deal in the rest of the cotton belt. Out west here, it really serves a role more as a predator of mites, in particular mite eggs, as well as white flies. And these are benefits to our system. Now, my graduate student is Philip Bordini, finished a study of four chemistries. And these are, this is part of what we try to do over time to understand how they're gonna work in our system. She found that these four, XRL, PQZ, Sivanto, and Transformer, are all effective at reducing their pests that they're targeting, but they are also conserving the key predators. That's what makes them special. That's what make, makes them useful to our system. And that's what supports these improved predator to prey ratios or the predator thresholds that we need to activate biological control to allow this cotton system to use its natural defenses against these pests. This is what Ehrlich was trying to teach us. He was trying to teach us all about targeted therapies without collateral damage, disabling the inhibitors of natural defense. And I would say in, in cotton pest management, that means use your selective insecticides and the selective biotech traits and maximize your biocontrol and, by using the predator thresholds uh, and the selective chemistries that we've talked to you about. I've gone through that quickly. I appreciate you guys bearing with me. Um, I do want to acknowledge all the funding that uh, supports our programs. We can't deliver the things we do today or all the research that underlies it without their help. Also my collaborators and the IPM staff that, um, that work so hard in, in collecting this information. I look, looks like I'm right on time. I don't know if that leaves time for questions, but I, I'd be happy to answer them now or in the chat box or, or afterwards anytime. Thank you. Great, thank you, Peter. Appreciate that. It looks like Naomi's put up several publication links in the chat box. So take advantage of those links and, and uh, download that information. Appreciate that presentation, Peter, that's great. Thanks, Randy. And if, you, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. All right, we're gonna move on to Dr. Pedro Andrade, our Extension uh, Precision Ag Specialist uh, based at Maricopa. And he's gonna talk about new planting technologies. And so Pedro, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen. Okay, can you hear me, Brandy and, and the rest is good? All right. Yeah, we can hear you good. All right, so <clears throat> I'm gonna start with this uh, graphic. And, and um, this is my way to, to, uh, to inform on recent, recent research that we've been carrying out at, at the Maricopa Ag Center in precision planting. So what we've been doing for the last two years is to build this uh, four row system that we can instrument with different uh, systems and then uh, test them for our conditions in Arizona. So we've, we're making good progress and today's, today's uh, presentation is, is more than anything a, a report to you and, and what we have done and where we're heading. So uh, also to give you some context on, on what type of systems I'm, I'll be talking about, uh, I put these different pieces of hardware that are, that are critical to the work that we're doing. So right on top is a display manufactured by Precision Planting is the 2020 display. And out of this computer that goes in the cab of the tractor, all things are controlled. Uh, all the systems are controlled, all, all the active components 
our control and, and the sensors uh, that provide feedback communicate with this unit. So on A, I put a picture of a variable speed drive uh, for seed metering. That to say that with a system like this, we can change the seeding density on the fly. Okay, it's just a signal to that motor to turn fast or to turn slower, depending on what we want to achieve. On part B, it is a weight transfer mode. We tested the pneumatic system that is on the, <clears throat> on the left of part B. Uh, and lately, since, since last year, actually, we've been doing the, uh, the active hydraulic system that can go up and down. The pneumatic system can only provide pressure down, but not up. Um, and it's difficult to be actuated in a variable rate form, uh, but the hydraulic system is, is built for that, for a um, very fast response in either direction. And I'll explain more on weight transfer in the rest of my talk. Uh, this year, we are going to be working with, with a system to automatic control of the depth where the seed is deposited. I call that trench depth control. So. Um, it can be uh, maybe said in a different way. Part D, it's also becoming a critical component of these systems because these are sensors that provide feedback to the display, okay? So on the, on the bottom, we see a instrumented firmer, seed firmer. So it has sensors attached to the tip and it provides us uh, information. I will also present information on, on this type of sensor. And the one on top is a seed counter that, that keeps, keeps uh, monitoring the, the populations that we're, that we're uh, doing in a field. This is a brief uh, description of the research in 2020. Really what I want to get your attention is in points two and three. We tested the effect of soil compaction at the time of planting. That was a variable that we induced. That we included, and the other the other was the downward force setting that we have in our control. It's a number that we punch on the on the display, and then we look at how that those two variables affected the seeding emergence and vegetative growth uh, of the seedlings. And I will also include very briefly what what is that we we're doing in twenty in this twenty twenty one season. Okay, so. <clears throat> Let's start with um, weight transfer. The picture on the left shows the, the unit that we have. And you can see these round beams inside the toolbar. This is a six by six toolbar. That's the weight that we can then transfer to the row units in different amounts, okay? You can probably see, I don't know if you can look at my, my cursor, but uh, the mouse, but you see a hydraulic cylinder here. So this is the actuator. This can go up and down and transferring weight in either direction. Before I forget it, I added this, this, um, this picture on the, on the right, this is drawing to say that there are, there are, um, there are more elegant, more effect, um, better ways to add weight to the, to the frame. Like in this case, this, this is a John Deere uh, um, <clears throat> bracket. And, and the beauty of that is that you can remove weights and put more as you, as you, as you need. Um, but we are constraints, this work for us, but what you see on the left. All right, so planter settings and, seal, and soil seed bed conditions. That is the first part of my talk. And this is the unit that we use in Maricopa. <clears throat> All right, so first um, to understand how this system works and, and how what's the behavior in a very generalized uh, way, uh, what you see on the left, it is pointing to a pin that in most planters is just a pin, it's a pivoted point. But in this case, it's an instrumented pin. So there is a force transducer in that pin and that provides us force reaction of the soil um, as, as weight is transferred to the units. On, the, on these bars, which is the horizontal axis, what we have is the, the, the setting that we select. This is in, on our control. We we input those, those numbers from zero to 240. Um, those are our settings. Quick note, um, you see that at zero and 60, they're basically identical. That means that at zero, 
no weight transfer, but the, tra the weight of the row unit itself is, is providing a fair amount of reaction, uh, similar to when the system thinks that it's gonna add um, <clears throat> 60 pounds. But then from that, that point on, it's, it's, uh, it's increasing as, as, a, as a system aims at, at a higher weight transfer. Now, when I mentioned about soil treatment or soil, so, uh, soil strength at the time of, of planting, this is what I meant. We, we created four different conditions that I'm calling compacted, consolidated, firm, and loose only as a way to describe, to, to differentiate them. It's not necessarily that it's compacted in a negative uh, sense of the word, but we quantify the, those with a cone index penetrometer, okay? So, <clears throat> that force transducer, um, the feedback, the response that we have from that instrumented pin is, is shown here. And uh, you see on top is the, the, the graph that I already described. What is the response on the, on the, the, the soil reaction uh, as we change the settings? At the bottom is what is that also, the, that same soil reaction when the system is set at the same weight uh, weight transfer, but the soil condition is different, okay, mechanically speaking. So the low, the bottom left image shows you that when we're looking at 60 pounds, there is a definite response um, that is different based on the soil condition at the time of planting. The image on the, the graph on the right shows you that at 240, only the soil that was more compacted uh, and only superficially compacted, it's, it's showing difference from the rest. So this is a, this is a, a um, these two variables uh, need to be studied in, uh, together, right? If you set your unit only to one type of soil and that's all your research that you do, you're gonna be losing the other dimension that is important here. Okay, so we went ahead, we planned, and uh, we then came the time to, to evaluate how this system uh, uh, performed. And the first one was uh, 10 counts. So let's take a look at what we found. When the difference are only meant to be our settings, regardless of soil condition, we see that there was no response. 120 got a, 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 um, a lower value uh, we had some issues at the time of planting that particular treatment, uh, but regardless, there is no trend to follow. So I call that as a no effect type of uh, situation. Now looking at um, when the soil strength conditions change, was the, the, um, the plant population any different? I, I don't think so. So we look at 60 pounds when we added 60 pounds and when we added 240 pounds, really the values are very, very similar. There's some more dispersion at the higher end, but there's no trend. So we found that populations were not different. It, it just ranged from 35 to 40 plus thousand plants per acre, no effect. But visually, and this is a, this is a, a good part of uh, what I wanna share, visually they look different. Okay, they were growing at a different rate in a, in a different um, uh, health condition as well. So what we did is to proceed with um, vegetation rate growth uh, e evaluation. So we wanted to see, okay, how different these plants look from each other in, in those treatments. The picture on the right, it is uh, a three point hitch mounted. So this is the rear side of the tractor. Uh, instrumented with, with uh, two sensors, two active spectral sensors. Uh, the angle of this picture might be deceiving, but these sensors are right on top of the seed lines, of the two seed lines in the center of the track. And to provide you a, a, a brief background on what is it that we measure, we use the NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. This is a spectral index, and the image on the left tells you how it works. So there is light being um, directed towards the, towards the plants in the near infrared and the visible. And depending on the amount of light that bounces back to the sensor, it tells us something about the vegetation condition in the field of view. 
So a higher NDVI is always indicative of a larger plant, more biomass, and more active um, um, in, in, uh, photosynthetically. And, and the opposite is true for a lower value of NDVI. Okay, so having that in our minds, um, I'm, I'm gonna finish with this, this only this graph for, for that, that particular uh, response. What we found in a very consistent way is that there is actually a optimum, an area of optimization between the soil strength condition created at the time of planting and the setting that we select uh, at that particular um, planting. Okay, so very clearly, very uh, consistently, we have in this particular test, 90 pounds of added um, weight transfer created healthier, bigger plants. This is at 46 days after planting. Uh, the, the, um, it, the deviation bars that you see on top really represent the, the, the four different soil conditions. So it is, a, it is a similar effect on all of them, right? But this, this is a statistically significant difference, okay? So it, with this was, was um, also one, one quick comment to make, uh, a point two difference in NDVI at this time in the season, it's a very significant difference right, in biomass. All right, so also in 2020, I'm gonna go really fast on this. Um, there, um, we tested the smart firmer instrumented um, unit, and we wanted to see well how useful that could be for our purposes here in Arizona. So you can see on the left an image with a red uh, circle. That's where the seed firmer is is deployed. Okay, so it's it's this. All most of our planters use use seed firmers. So when the, when the seed is dropped in the trench and then it's, it's uh, compressed against the, the bottom of the trench or the side walls, and then provides that good moisture uh, condition around the seed plant. The picture on the, on the right shows you uh, a little more detail. And you see that there's some, there's some uh, LED um, lights coming out of the, of the, on the tip of, the, of this uh, seed firmer. And um, this is a proprietary, um, sensor from precision planting. So there's limited information, technically speaking, of what is it that, that it does. I don't know about the algorithm that they use. Uh, I, don't, I don't know more details, right? So, but what I do know is what the system um, <clears throat> reports back as, as, as feedback information of, around the soil condition. So <clears throat> this is a test that we run in Yuma, Arizona around November of 2020. And you see the four variables that we can um, obtain with this, with this uh, instrumented um, unit. So soil temperature, it's interesting to me, as when we look at cotton, uh, there is uh, clearly an effect of soil temperature. And this image tells you that there is a gradient on temperature. Okay, we think about soil temperature that is optimum for, for planting, but we need to also look at there, is, there are differences inside the field. So there, there are, um, it, it's, it's, it might be good for one part of the field, not, not optimal for other part. Uh, the unit on the top right uh, map, it, I mean the image on the top right, it's a map of organic matter. Uh, for some reason that the, the, uh, the legend disappeared, but it's very low in our cases. So it, it really has not much of a value. At the, at the bottom, left moisture content, I think that is a significant uh, um, variable for our case, right? Because it relates to soil texture. It relates to conditions that uh, provide higher or lower um, moisture retention in the, in the soil. And uh, four or 5% um, difference in the field is, is significant. And a new one, new variable that I'm still investigating more is, is, is some to, uh, chemical uh, to chemical um, composition of the of the soil, and this is the CEC uh, variable, and you can you can tell that CEC it's correlated with moisture content. These two maps at the bottom are talking about soil texture, 
Okay, so we can see that there is value in this information. It's going to be generated anyways. It's the same pass. We're not going to do a, a second pass to generate this data. It's generated at the time we are we are planting. Okay, so I'm I'm going to finish with this image, and this is a work in progress. This picture, this all these pictures were from yesterday to tell you how much work in progress there is. Uh, but starting on the image on the left, that is um, on, on, the, on the rear side, you can look at there is this other um, piece of hardware that was added. In, in conventional planters, what we have here is a lever that we changed in alternating motion uh, to set the depth of the, of the discs. Uh, or set, set the, the limit of the gauge wheels more properly. Uh, the image in the center is a little more close to show you uh, uh, um, a more detailed image to show you that the top portion, it's, the, it's an electric drive. And the middle portion here is a gearbox, okay? The image on the right gives you a little more detail there where you can see where is this piece acting and you see this shaft here so by the rotation of this drive on top it changes the position of this um of this shaft okay which changes the mustache position or the stopper of the of the gauge wheels okay this can be adjusted on the go we're looking at the uh, we're working out the the, um, uh, the software um, details on how to implement it, and um, but this is this is going to be reported in in uh, at the end of our 2021 season, and we have great expectations about this this particular development because uh, we have tremendous variability in Arizona in in field soil texture. So if maps and uh, prescriptions can be made of our depth uh, automatically, uh, we don't need to be changing depth half of the way or half of the field into in, in our in our in our work. Okay, so with that I'm gonna finish. Um, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Randy, for inviting me to this uh, meeting. Questions, you can put it in the in the chat. You can contact Randy uh, or Kyle. Anybody will, will get a hold of me and we will be delighted to work with you. And I want to recognize Cotton Inc. and Precision Planting for the support. Thank That's you, all I have, Randy. Thank you. We do have a couple of minutes if, if we have any questions. Uh, if no one does, I actually have a question for you, Pedro. On the, uh, the smart seed firming device, would it be possible to connect that information to your planting depth adjustment so that you could, I mean, is the, is the response time quick enough that you could actually adjust as you plant based on the input from the seed firming device? There is a commercial claim that that can happen, that can be made to do that. We're dealing with the software because we don't see that that particular function enabled. Okay, so this is this is still um, very much new to to understand all all those details uh, that that in our operation. By the end of 2021, we're going to have clear information about if that's possible and, and to what to what accuracy and what uh, response time. But I can tell you this, even if you plant one year, you obtain that information, then next year you, you have another good element of information to decide on variable depth. So whether it's real time, whether it's prescribed from, from previous years, uh, I think this can, the, it will be a way to work it out. Yeah, because obviously soil texture is going to change from year to year. Now moisture might change, but soil texture yes. is going to change. So once Correct. you have the map, you're set. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Pedro. Any other questions for Pedro? Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this section of the meeting, which is our university presenters. Um, giving you a little bit of an update on the work that we have been doing related to heat stress evaluations. Am I showing up okay here, Kyle?
was good. Okay, thank you. So, so this is work that we started in 2019. Uh, you can see here my co-authors and collaborators on this project, Blaze Bancho, and then uh, Naomi Peer, who's an assistant and extension there at Maricopa, and then three of my technicians that work for me, Caleb, Omar, and Kristen. Uh, they're the ones that are doing a lot of this data collection in the field, along with Blaze and I. Uh, we're collecting this data in the field each year to evaluate these varieties and their response to uh, heat stress. So as, as you all know, uh, cotton production in the state of Arizona is characterized by hot, dry climate, uh, high yield potential, relatively low disease pressure, as Alex mentioned. Uh, we have noticed over the years, and, and I don't think it's surprising to anybody, but we have noticed over the years as some new varieties have come into the state. A lot of them are coming in uh, because we do produce a lot of seed. We have a lot of untested varieties that might come into the state and that you as growers might be asked to plant for seed production which can be very beneficial to you as a, as a grower. But oftentimes we don't know a whole lot about these varieties and how they respond in our environment. And we saw early on some particular varieties that, that struggled with some of the heat stress events that we have uh, in, in, our, in our environment in the low desert. So what we wanted to do was begin to develop a protocol that we could use to evaluate a new variety, a particular variety, um, and how it responds to heat stress in our environment. So a lot of the, this work, the background work was done back in the 90s. Paul Brown and Carolyn Zire did a lot of work looking at under controlled environment uh, growth chambers, looking at uh, heat stress response in cotton varieties. And some of the main things that they came out of that research was that they saw significant flower abnormalities uh, when exposed to heat stress, high levels of heat stress. And we'll define heat stress here in just a minute. But basically they saw smaller flowers, they saw asynchronous development of the male and female structures, saw failure of anthers to release pollen or to dehisce the pollen as that flower opened up, and then saw the presence of elongated stigmas and shortened anthers and filaments. So a, a, a disruption in the morphology of the flower and what that flower looked like. So when we talk about heat stress, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a value that is calculated uh, that gives us a value for crop canopy temperature. And we know that level one heat stress occurs between 82.4 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And doesn't really have a significant impact on the crop, we don't believe. But when we get into this, this uh, canopy temperature of above 86, that's when we begin to see things fall apart in some of these varieties. Uh, it is calculated based on air temperature, relative humidity, and vapor pressure deficit. And I do have a link here for a publication that Paul Brown did several years ago uh, to where you can read up a little bit more about some of the heat stress uh, calculations and how these were correlated to actual measurements in the field back in the early years when this was being developed. So again, what we wanted to do was look at some infield measurements that we could make that we could use to evaluate a variety with respect to its ability to tolerate heat stress, and then correlate these observations to meaningful outcomes, particularly seed set and seed production, fruit retention, and the quality of the fruit, uh, meaning the symmetry of the fruit and how, how well that bowl fills, and then obviously ultimately to yield. So we started this in 2019. Uh, the, the, the way that we set this up, we wanted to look at flower and fruit development, we looked at pollen dehiscence, flower morphology, the incidence of abnormal or asymmetrical bowls. And then in 2020, we added a flower tagging component where we actually go in and tag the flower on the day that we made our evaluations and then followed that flower through development and see if it was retained by the plant and if it was a symmetrical bowl. And then at the end of the season, we did a plant map out to four positions and we, we evaluated whether or not it held the fruit and whether or not that fruit was symmetrical. Then at the end of the season, we collected seed counts, uh, seed per bowl, uh, seed cotton per bowl, and also developed a seed index where we looked at grams of seed, grams per 100 seed, and then obviously lint yield. So we evaluated uh, 39 entries in 2020. We put in there a couple of varieties that we believe to be fairly heat tolerant. Uh, particularly this one, Delta Pine 1044, and we also had uh, Delta Pine 1549 and those are control varieties.
So we, we in 2019, we saw a lot of, of variability among the varieties with respect to flower morphology, pollen dehiscence, seed attributes, final plant map, and with yield. But we didn't really have real good correlation between what we measured in 2019 uh, and, uh, and what we saw in terms of a final yield. But 2019 was a relatively low heat stress year, as you, as you recall. Uh, we didn't really have extended periods of level two heat stress. So it wasn't a real good year for evaluating. Uh, this is what we had in 2020. This shows crop canopy temperature as a function of day of year. You can see this red line right here is our level two heat stress. The yellow line is our level one heat stress. You can see here that in late June, early July, we had an extended period of level two heat stress. And again, here to the latter part of July, and then, as you recall, in 2020, it stayed warm well into the fall, and we actually had level, heat, level two heat stress days all the way into the end of August, which isn't real common for us. Uh, this, I know this is a busy picture, but I want to just show you this is air temperature as a function of day of year. Uh, the maximum here at the top of the bar and the minimum at the bottom of the bar. Uh, this is a graph showing crop development over the course of the season, heat units accumulated after planting. And I've noted on here times where we have uh, developmental stages of the plant, first square, first bloom, peak bloom, and cutout. And this is for our plots planted in 2020. Down here at the bottom, you can see these are level one heat stress days that are indicated by the yellow dots, and level two heat stress days indicated by the, the red dots. So you can see we had several consecutive days strings strung together of level two heat stress. And the other thing that you notice where we have level two heat stress, we see very high nighttime temperatures. And that's what's really driving the heat stress in our environment, is elevated nighttime temperatures where that crop cannot cool off at night. And that's where we begin to see the issues. And this is just a comparison of 2018, or excuse me, 2019 and 2020. This is 2019, you can see this is a minimum temperature of 85 degrees. Um, you know, for the most part, we got under 85 degrees at night with Maricopa Axon. But if you look at what happened in 2020, you can see again, quite a few days strung together where we never cooled off below 85 degrees at night. And those are the times where we see it's very well correlated to our level two heat stress days. So just in terms of a number of days that we had in 2019, we had 55 days of level one heat stress, 24 days of level two. You compare that to 2020, where we had 63 days of level one and 36 days of level two. So we saw a significant increase in level two heat stress days in 2020 versus 2019. And it bears out in our data that I'll show you. So basically what we were looking at was flower morphology. We gave flowers a rating of one to five, depending on the separation between the male and the female floral components. So you can see in this picture, this is would be, would be uh, Evaluated as a two, where the anthracs are fairly near to the stigma. We go here to a number five, where you see a huge separation between where the pollen needs to land in order to get good pollination and where the pollen source is. So there's a big separation just physically between those floral components. We also looked at pollen dehiscence, and I know this is going to be difficult to see on the screen. But you can see here in, in a zero, all of these pollen sacs have no pollen on them whatsoever. They're completely bare. Uh, here is a three. You can begin to see the pollen grains that are being released on these pollen sacs. And then this would be characterized as a four flower with all of the pollen sacs dehissing pollen. And here's a good close up of a what we would rate as a, as a one in flower morphology and a four for pollen dehiscence, so a very good looking flower. So again, what we did in 2020 is we tagged these flowers when we evaluated, we came back two weeks later, found those tags, and then evaluated whether or not that bowl had held, if it aborted, and whether or not it was a symmetrical or asymmetrical bowl. Uh, these are some pictures that Blaze took with his camera in 2020, uh, showing the differences, some of the, the pretty ugly looking flowers quite frankly, that we saw in 2020. Now uh, you can see huge separation between stigma and uh, anthracacts and very little pollen shed in several of the dates that we evaluated. There's another picture of a, of a pretty poor looking flower. And we'd also see this phenomenon, which I call cavitation. 
uh, where these young bulls, three to five day old bulls remain on the plant. Uh, they obviously are not living, they're not gonna produce any fiber, but they just, they desiccate and remain on the plant. And here's another picture that we commonly saw in 2020 due to the heat stress events that we experienced. Now I will say just, just kind of parenthetically here is you will see this under heat stress environments when we have low to heat stress days. You can also induce the same phenomenon in plants that are water stressed. What happens when that plant gets water stressed? Well, it closes down its stomates, the internal temperature in the leaf uh, begins to increase and you begin to see these, see these same symptoms under heat or water stress scenarios in the crop. And then ultimately what we're looking for was also the presence of misshapen or hook beaked bowls uh, as a result of, of poor pollination. And then at the end of the season, this is what you see. Those hook beaked bowls don't open properly. You get poor fill in several of the lots where seed does not develop. Or so you might only have one or two seed. And that is a very difficult bowl to pick. With a, with a harvester. So let's look at some of our sampling data. So we, we looked at four different uh, sample dates during 2020, around the 15th of July, the end of July, around the 12th of August, and then towards the latter part of August. These were our four sample dates that we looked at in 2020. Now I'm gonna show you a series of figures here that, that show the, the flower morphology and the pollen shed ratings for these different varieties and whether or not those bowls were held. So in this top figure of the next one that I'm gonna show you, on the left-hand axis, you see flower morphology from zero to five. So these green bars are indicating flower morphology from zero to five. So increase in malformity as these bars get bigger. On the right-hand axis, we see increase in pollen shed. So this line at the top is showing increase from zero to four uh, pollen shed. So the higher the number, the better the flower, the more pollen shed. These bars right here are two control varieties, Delta Pine 1044 and 1549. And you can see the, the varieties listed across here. I know it's difficult to see, uh, but basically I just wanna show you the trend. So on this bottom graph, we see percent flowers retained and percent bowl asymmetry on the, on the right-hand axis. So as, as this number goes up, more bowls were retained. As this blue, a uh, line goes up, we saw more incidents of asymmetrical bowls. So this was the first date, 16th of July, I actually had very good retention. Some of the varieties had 100% of the flowers that we evaluated actually turned into bowls and, and fairly low uh, bowl asymmetry rates. Now, just another comment about bowl asymmetry. We did not evaluate the degree of asymmetry. So if that bowl was not completely symmetrical, we counted it as asymmetric but we did not do any evaluations on degree of asymmetry. This is what it looked like on the 30th of July. You can see very, very poor flower morphology. A lot of these are way up in the fours and fives. And, and this line right here indicating pollen shed. You can see that a lot of these varieties had zero pollen shed that we could, that we could evaluate. And then as we came back and looked at those same flowers in two weeks, we saw very little percent fruit retention. We had a few that had that held on to about 10%, you know, 20%. But all of those bowls that were held were all malformed bowls. All of them had uh, asymmetrical bowls. But the vast majority of that fruit that we tagged on the 30th of July was aborted. Now we look at the 12th of August, things began to, to uh, moderate and to return. Uh, we did see uh, an improvement in flower morphology and a dramatic improvement in, in pollen shed on that uh, day of the 12th of August. And bowl retention rates went back up. You can see we're, we're hovering here between 40, most of them between 40 and 60%. And we saw a decrease in the, in the amount of bowl asymmetry on the 12th of August. And a very similar response on the 27th of August. So, so the main impacts that we saw were that early on where we were just entering entering peak, you know, first mid bloom, coming up on peak bloom on some of those varieties uh, there at the middle of, middle of July. Uh, this was our data for the 27th of August. Again, uh, we ended up with about average, about 50, 40 to 50% bowl retention. Uh, again, uh, with our asymmetric, asymmetrical bowl percentage decreasing on that 27th of August date. 
This is just looking at across all varieties, and this is a little bit easier to see across all varieties average on those four separate dates. Again, the green bar is flower morphology. You can see averaged about a two, jumped up to between three and a half and four on the 30th of July, dropped back down here to a little over two on the 12th of August and 27th of August. Pollen dehiscence again was very good early on. It drops precipitously on this 30th of July and then rebounded fairly well here back in the 20, 12th of August and the 27th of August. So this is the percent asymmetry and flowers retained again, average across all varieties on these four separate planting dates. A 16th of July retained nearly 80% of those bowls. You can see here on the 30th of July, we dropped down here to less than 5% retained for that, that two week period. And then rebounded back here on the 12th to the 27th. So what I wanna show you now, just to kind of finish up here is correlations between some of those values that we were, those, those uh, parameters that we were evaluating, looking at flower morphology and fruit and, and uh, pollen shed, and correlate that to some of the observations that we saw in response to fruit retention and fruit um, asymmetry. So this is uh, retention, uh, percent retained bowls as a function of flower morphology. So you can see that as flower morphology increased, meaning the flowers became more deformed, we saw a drop in percent retained bowls. So that's a fairly decent relationship, R squared of 0.295 for that, for that relationship. If we look at percent asymmetry as a function of flower morphology, again, you can see as flower morphology increased or as that flower became more deformed, we saw a higher percent asymmetrical bowls with an R squared 0 0.07, not a real tight relationship there. But if we look at pollen dehiscence, this is where things begin to tighten up significantly. So this is pollen dehiscence, uh, percent retained bowls on the y-axis, pollen dehiscence on the x-axis. So as pollen dehiscence goes up, increases, we saw a significant increase in percent retained bowls with an R squared of point, uh, about 0.6. So a pretty tight relationship between pollen dehiscence, uh, what we're measuring in the field, and what's retained by the plant. And again, if we look at asymmetry as a function of pollen dehiscence, we see the inverse relationship. So as pollen dehiscence goes up, the, the amount of asymmetrical bowls that we observe in the field goes down, okay? Which makes sense with an R squared of about 0.4. So if we look at some of this information from our final plant map, so we looked at percent fruit retention. These are, these are across all varieties. We ended up with about a 44% fruit retention, uh, maximum of 66%, minimum 20%, height to node ratio one and a half, maximum 1.8, minimum one. Uh, not a whole lot of difference or correlation between main stem nodes or percent fruit retention or percent height to node ratio. But this last one right here, percent asymmetrical bowls, this is at the end of the season doing a final plant map on these plants. We saw a range of percent asymmetry from 49, about 50% as an average, um, a maximum of 72 and a minimum of 26. So what we did is we then took this percent asymmetry at the end of the season, and we wanted to look and see how that correlated to seed cotton yield. And lo and behold, we saw a pretty good correlation with an R squared of 0.34. So as percent asymmetrical bowls increased towards at the end of the season, that's measured at the end of the season, we saw seed cotton yields decrease. Now, you know, this is a pretty good relationship and we still have some of these outliers. You can see this variety right here had the highest yield, but it also had about 65%, a little over 65% asymmetric, asymmetrical bowls. So we know that there's other things going on there. And we've, we've begun to look at some of these things, looking at seed size, um, seed per bowl, uh, seed cotton per bowl. We're not really seeing a whole lot of good relationship between that and seed cotton yield. So there, there are some other things going on, but I think we're beginning to be able to describe fairly well by looking at the flowers in season to begin to develop some recommendations on, on the heat tolerance of a particular variety by looking at those, at those uh, in season parameters. So where are we going from here? Well, so in 2020, 
We definitely saw more heat stress than we did in 2019, which allowed us to evaluate uh, in a much better way, I believe, than what we did in 2019. Uh, we did see, again, a lot of variability with flower morphology, falling to hissing, the seed attributes, final plant mapping, and the yield data that we collected. And we are beginning to see very good correlation between these flower parameters, pollen dehiscent and morphology, and the in-season retention and the quality or the asymmetry of those resulting bulbs. And we're able to do that from the flower tagging data. And again, a pretty good correlation between percent asymmetry and seed cotton yield in, in 2020. And that, again, is not our in-season uh, evaluations. That's our end of season evaluations, plant mapping, where we're looking at the four positions on each fruiting branch. So again, moving forward, we want to continue to do this and, and primarily to be able to capture the variability that we see within uh, from year to year. The other thing that we've talked about doing, uh, Blaze and I have had these discussions about decreasing our sample interval. We're currently doing this every 14 days. I'd really like to do it every seven days, and our plans are to do that in 2021, and hopefully better pinpoint the correlation between the heat stress event and the effects. Because if you look in the literature, it's pretty clear that the, the heat stress event precedes what you see in the field by anywhere from 12 to 18 days. So, so what we're measuring in the field in terms of flower morphology and pollen dehiscence is as a result of heat stress that happened, could be as much as two weeks earlier. So by decreasing our sampling interval, I think we can better correlate what's happening in the field, what we're observing in those flowers to, to the heat stress event that occurred. The other thing that we're gonna do in 2021 is, is implement another location, a contrasting environment, greatly contrasting, uh, up here in Safford, we, we basically get no level two days, very few level one days. And so we're going to evaluate these same varieties in both environments and, and look at the response in flower morphology, pollen dehiscent, fruit retention, fruit quality, and all of those same parameters that, were, that we did at Maricopa in 2019 and 2020 and do those in Safford as well. Um, so I, I just want to Shout out to our supporters of this work. This couldn't be done without the support from the participating seed companies, Bayer, BASF, Corteva, Americot. Cotton Incorporated has shown quite a bit of interest in, in this work, and I, I suspect that we'll probably likely see some funding from Cotton Incorporated as we move forward with some of these projects in the future. But we appreciate the support from the, from the seed companies that allow us to, to do this work and evaluate these varieties. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I would be happy to answer any questions. If we have any questions, stop sharing my screen here. Randy, this is Jerry Roby. Hey, Jerry. Yeah. Hey, um, any correlation between irrigation timing and when these events occurred? Um, yeah. So. So that's a really good question. We, we didn't necessarily look at that, but, but that is probably something that we should look at because I think there could be. I mean, when you irrigate, you're creating a, a kind of a, an alternate climate in that canopy with increased humidity, increased water, uh, that, that very well could be that there's some correlations between those events. I mean, that's an excellent question. Thank you. So in the chat box, there was a comment about uh, management, uh, discussing uh, planting date management for trying to avoid heat stress. You know, we do have areas in the state, particularly Yuma would be a perfect example, where, you know, they get a lot of heat stress, but most of their cotton, some of it's already in the ground right now, planted, uh, most of their cotton is going to be through that primary feeding cycle before uh, it gets to these really high heat stress dates. Uh, alternatively, we look at, at uh, the Goodyear area with what the rainers and others are doing out there following cotton behind small grains. Uh, again, they're avoiding the bulk of that heat stress. They're still seeing those heat stress days, but the stage of, of growth of that cotton plant is not at a stage where it's going to be as, as impacted as much by those heat stress days than we see in, in simple Arizona. So, so there are some techniques that you could possibly do if you could predict the weather. <laughs> Good luck. 
and predict when we're going to have level two, level one heat stress days, and and maybe adjust your planting. But there are some some things that you could do, uh, you know, from a management perspective. And there are some products out there, and, and Blaze and I are actually going to be evaluating some of them this year that claim to have some effects on relieving heat stress. And so we're going to be doing some of these trials at Maricopa, looking at the effects of these products on on alleviating some of the uh, symptomology that we see with heat stress. So we'll. We'll see how those pan out this, this coming year. Randy? Okay. Yeah, yes. I, I just wanted to also mention, since a couple of your pictures actually showed, it certainly showed the heat stress in those flowers, but also you showed some, what looked like ligus damage to some of those anther sacs. And only to make the point that, and, and a lot of PCAs know this, that if you've gone through a really hard heat stress event, you're going to have a, a set of squares that are going to abort. They won't even make that, that point in the flowering where you even see that. And, and there, it, it really diminishes the value of, of, of controlling ligus at that very moment because that cohort of flowers is destined to fail anyways. So there's a lot of ramifications for this across the spectrum, right, including pest management. Yeah, yeah thanks for bringing that up, Peter. That's a great point. We we try to manage pests as best we can in these plots to eliminate that as a variable. But uh, I mean, Peter makes a really good point about, about looking to those things as well. Um, so we're gonna move on. We've got Paul Sawyer loaded up here, ready to go, looking good. Uh, we're gonna transition to our seed companies now. And uh, they're gonna, they each have about 50 minutes, most of them, some of them is, they'd like to have a little bit less time. But I'm going to allow our Arizona uh, reps to kind of direct their time segment. So, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you introduce your folks and, and take it away. All right, Randy, thank you very much. And hey, everyone, good morning. And on behalf of the entire Bayer Crop Science organization, really appreciate you being here and really appreciate the U of A allowing us to, to piggyback on this meeting is arguably the best alternative. Uh, to um, have uh, get the information to you guys instead of having an in-person meeting. So we've got about five speakers. I'm going to lead us off. And because we're going to try to cram about 90 minutes of normal information into about 50, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to forward go any of the pleasantries and dive right into it. So my role this morning is to talk about commercial variety recommendations. So of course, seed production is super important to us at Delta Pine. And, uh, and so these, to the extent you're doing save seed for some of these varieties, so much the better. But I'm just going to focus in on, on the commercial varieties. I'm going to try to do it geographically, kind of going from our warmest markets in the far west along the Colorado River and then finishing up with Wilcox. So if you want to take a picture or take a screen grab of this um, slide right here, this is kind of going to be in lieu of the packet I normally would have handed out that has plot data and so forth. So, all right. Diving right in, looking at the far west areas like Blythe, Buckeye, Tonopah, Yuma, uh, the short list of recommendations is the following. And the ones that have parentheses around them, that means I think these are gonna be great varieties for the future. But as we say in the business, I'm supply constrained right now, which means I don't have very many bags of it to sell. It's gonna be highly allocated. So to the extent you can get your hands on some to try, we think this is maybe the future portfolio at Delta Pine, but right now here's what we have good supply of and that has a good proven track record. So Delta Pine 1948, I'll start with, I think in this area, it's really kind of risen to the top. 1549 has um, kind of been going into decline but still available, of course. I've got an asterisk by 1948 because it is, you know, although it's obviously got the package of good fiber quality, high yields, because it has very high turnout, it often can have relatively low stored energy, which means the seedling is not super strong. So we heard Dr. Wu talk earlier today about the importance to avoid seedling diseases. And if you have a, a, a variety with low stored energy, it's harder for it to fight those seedling diseases. It's, all, it's almost critical with 1948 that you have those warm soil temperatures and a favorable planting environment for the next 10 days to emerge. So that's why that asterisk is there. Otherwise, you know, the really go-to variety is 1646. It's been the best-selling variety in the States for at least three years, I think four years now, uh, and, and for good reason, right? It has very high top-end yields, but, but premium, premium quality, especially on that staple length. Uh, so 1646, good supply. That's probably, you know, the, the go-to one. 
uh, especially if you've grown it before. But also 1725 continues to grow in popularity. This is more of our easy button, as it were, easier to manage with PGRs as opposed to both 1948, but particularly 1646. If you've grown it, you've observed it really needs an aggressive PGR program uh, to keep it under control, as with 1549, which is next on the list. But 1725 is definitely continues to be an up and coming variety. Um, I, I know the we wrote it, we've grown it a lot uh, in, in this area. Anyway, suffice it to say. So of the newer varieties, the class of 20, like we talked about last year, really looks to be a strong class, which is that it'll probably take over most of the, the business in the future, I would think. And a particular note is the 2012, which as Keelan would say, has the potential to reach yields of 1646, but in a much shorter period of time. So it can be grown short season as this number 12 might indicate, but it also is relatively indeterminate. Um, 2038, this was a pretty amazing variety, very unique plant structure. Uh, and uh, it, it has some of our top end yields, but bear in mind, I would call it an average fiber package. So if having super premium quality is your jam, then 2038 is gonna have high yield, but not gonna have the kind of premium quality that 1646 would have. And finally, of the class of 21s, the ones we just launched, we tested a variety called, um, it ended in 227. It was launched as Delta Pine 2127. This one looks very promising, able to keep up with some of the other ones, very, very limited amount of seed. So I think primarily you're gonna see it in testing and in safe seed production. But if you can get a production contract on 2127, uh, I, I think that would be a good thing. Okay, so I've talked a lot about the varieties in that first geographic section. So I'll just talk about the uniqueness in other areas. Yuma, uh, 1646 and 1725. If there's some 2012 seed production or if you can get your hands on it, that's good. We've got seed already staged at Yuko Gin of those two varieties for commercial production. All right, moving into central Arizona, Casa Grande, Eloy, Maricopa, Stanfield, et cetera. Pretty similar list. Again, I'm gonna give the nod to 1646 and 1725. For 1948, I almost wondered whether I should include it in this list because we had a lot of replant claims on 1948 in Pinal County last year. And so it's just a little bit cooler than say Buckeye or Blythe. And that made the difference because we planted a lot of 1948 in those areas and didn't have replant complaints. So if you are gonna use 1948 in Pinal County, uh, definitely be patient. Definitely listen to what Dr. Who said about, about the soil temperature and the favorable conditions. Please don't plant this variety by the calendar. So also in, in central Arizona, we've got some other options that have proven themselves pretty well, specifically 1840, 1845. Uh, these have the Bolgard 3 trait, which will give you an additional spectrum of control as well as good for resistance management. So we're seeing the market move toward these Bolgard 3 varieties, which really start with the class of 18. And again, you'll see the class of 20 I've mentioned here, uh, including 2020, which, is per, which has uh, been very strong in this area. Um, Tom Jen later is going to give you more details on some of the performance data on the class of 20. All right, as we move a little bit further up in altitude, Red Rock, Marana area, you're going to see me start to move away from those uh, mid to fulls down to the more mid to shorts. So 1725 arguably has the best fit in that area, but also 2012. Uh, Gila Valley, Safford, Thatcher, etc. As I was preparing for this presentation, I would say this is the one I struggled with the most in terms of what to try to tell you all. So in some ways we've been blessed in this area that we've over the years often had one predominant variety, one that really stands out uh, among all others down there. And it started probably with Delta Pine 164, followed by of course by Delta Pine 1044 for many, many years. And more recently Delta Pine 1549. Um, last year, 1549 had a rough season in this area, primarily driven by low staples, and I've heard a lot about it. And um, so we have to think about what are we going to do for the future? So some growers have said, I don't want to plant this anymore, and I certainly respect that down there, and we're going to talk about alternatives. But I would just, I would just pose this question to you to try to think about yourself. So if, if your goal is you're, you're trying to maximize the probability that you have good yield and good fiber, maximum prop profitability per acre. W what's less risky, planting a variety that has a five-year track record but had one hiccup, but the variety is still the same, right? So what's the probability of 1549 having another rough season in 2021? I'm not gonna answer that. You, you gotta kind of decide that for yourself. But if you do think that you don't wanna do 1549 anymore, 
Um, we have some other alternatives, although because 1549 has been so dominant, we don't have a ton of data on it. But certainly, if high staple is what you're looking for and you want a variety that's going to give high staple, 1646 is that variety. And it has, you know, 1549 typically beat it on profitability, but 1646 has fantastic staple. So that would be my lead alternative to 1549. 1845 as well was tested and we have good supply of that as well. And that was also right in there. I think number two behind uh, 1549 in, uh, in 2008 testing. And then also 2038 looks to be very promising as well for this area, perhaps the ultimate substitute for 1549. But again, it's in parentheses. I don't have very much seed supply of that. So I, I think what I'm gonna try to do is get you guys some more information for those of you on this call that are in that area. We're gonna find a way to either come down there. I need to get you some more information to help you make this decision. But um, that's what I have to say about that area. Finally, Wilcox, the shortest season and the highest elevation. And of course, we're gonna recommend our shortest season varieties there. I think 1908 has the best fit, but of course we have another short season, 1612 that's done very well, as well as 1820. So those are the three down there, some seed production down there. Of course, those, might, those are probably gonna be these same varieties. Okay, that was most of what I had to say. With regard to grower programs, really nothing significant has changed. We still wanna risk share with you on replants. So we will rebate you 75% of the value of the bags purchased for replant. Again, think of it like insurance. So if you have a replant event, make sure you contact the dealer that you bought the seed from or call me directly so we can document it. I'm your claims adjuster in those situations. And for financing, um, we, those programs are also the same. Probably the superior of the two is a 0% financing through John Deere and you have to pay in February. We do an, have an in-house one as well. The due date on that is in November. So I think the John Deere one is, is much superior. For more details on these programs, go to deltapine.com and just look for the tab that says uh, programs. Oh, and I was gonna back on for, so, for those of you who saw, you know, we didn't have our big field day in October in Casa Grande. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, see that, that website, dpazshowcase.com? You can see more detailed videos about the plant morphology and so forth with Keelan and Dave Albers uh, in lieu of doing that. So go, go look at that if you get a chance. All right. Now, our second speaker. Let me see if I can do this. So I think I have all the presentations and then... And hang on, let's see. So I need to get out of here. There it is. Right, so far so good. Did that Thrive On slide come up? It looks like it did. All right, next up, and hopefully his audio is on, is we have from the frozen tundra of Lubbock, Texas, Eric Best to talk about the new Thrive On technology that Peter Ellsworth mentioned a little while ago. Eric, are you there? Paul, I'm here. How's the audio sound this morning? I think it sounds great. It's all yours. Thank you, sir. Well, as always, I would much rather be in person talking about this stuff versus virtually. But uh, greetings from the, uh, the the frozen high plains of Texas. Today, we're having a heat wave today, Paul. Actually, it's actually snowing currently, and I think we're at 12 on our way to 17 today. So we're having Fantastic. a heat wave considering the last three days. But uh, <laughs> much rather be in Arizona, much rather be face to face. But like I said, I have a couple minutes today, gentlemen. I wanted to give you a real quick update on where we kind of are on the Thrive On technology. Uh, so a little bit of background. Most of you have heard about what this is. We're getting pretty excited about it. Next slide, please, Paul. This will be the industry's first biotech product that provides season long protection uh, for not only uh, tarnished plant bug species, but also thrip species. A lot of that work that has been done out here uh, was actually on western flower thrip. Uh, there are a couple other species and we do have control on that as well. Product is currently stacked with Bolgard 3 ExtendFlex. Uh, so the products that you'll likely see this year, there's really three of them out right now. Two of them are still experimentally numbered and we, we will be growing it in seed for future evaluation and launch. And one of them has gone ahead and been named. Uh, it wasn't in some of the literature and rollout early. It's been named since those advancements in December but there is a DP2131 uh, that y'all might see around. And the nomenclature on that will be DP2131B3TXF. So it will have the T in there uh, it, to, to indicate that it has that Thrive On technology. Like I said, we're pretty excited about it. Next slide, Paul. And where we're really focusing some of our research and testing this next year 
is kind of based on these maps on the right. So you'll see up there across the top, that is kind of a thrips map. So those areas in red typically have severe thrips. Uh, areas in the yellow uh, circles, typically moderate thrips pressure. And then where, for the purposes of this call, you can see uh, the Arizona, California area kind of in a low thrips pressure. But contrary to that, you take the bottom one, we start looking at Liga species, and you can see that Mississippi River uh, in the Delta area, Mid-South type country is red for severe Ligus pressure. Not much out here in West Texas where I am. Thrips is our bigger concern, but we get into the yellow with moderate Ligus pressure out there in Arizona and California. So like I said, this is where we're going to kind of focus some of these research, going to have some plots, going to have some groundbreakers, and then seed production will be out there in your neck of the woods as well. Next slide, please, Paul. And just to give you all a 30,000 foot view of kind of what some of the data looks like, first couple of slides will be on thrips. So for the purpose of setting up the slides, the, the maroonish, orangish colored uh, bar will be the Thrive On product. And then the other one will be the check. So the first pair of bars is kind of the number of immatures. And you can see in, an un in that untreated uh, check that they did separate significantly. Next one, number of adults. And then always, you know, we do an injury rating uh, where one is good and five is bad. And you can see uh, just visually the thrips injury rating did separate there as well. Uh, and this is based on three years worth of data. Uh, next one, Paul. And again, so the next question always comes up. Uh, well, what about on some of these higher pressure locations? So this is Texas only, but we did have a couple of locations. I believe there were five where we had severe, severe thrips these past couple of years. And you can see those bars separate out even more between the Thrive On and those checks, not only for the immatures for five plants, but the adults and then that injury rating as well. Uh, very, very visual uh, thing when you get to see it in the field. Next slide, please, Paul. And here's a couple of pictures from Scott, Mississippi, side by side, uh, where you can see the, the plants with the Thrive On technology on your left versus those without on the right. Uh, at 42 days after planting, you can see it really does uh, show up, even with the differences in seed treatment. So on your left, that Thrive On, uh, the, the pair of pictures on the left would be a, our standard or a mid-grade type seed treatment compared to the basic. Then on your right, the standard versus the elite. So even with that elite seed treatment, we are still seeing uh, that Bolgard 3 Thrive On technology provide that damage rating and that visual difference early on in that little plant's life. Again, these taken 42 days after planting. Next slide, please, Paul. Then if we talk a little bit about uh, the Ligus complex, your tarnished plant bugs, uh, looking at the number of adults, you can see kind of we had some areas that were categorized as low pressure, that would be seven, and then moderate pressure in the middle set of bars, then high pressure on the right. Again, the same setup, thrive on in the maroonish colored bar, the check in the gray bar. So, uh, you, you can see that th that would be the adult counts per five feet a row. Uh, we're thinking this is somewhat of an avoidance mechanism within these plants as well on Ligus. Uh, and then the, the ultimate question always comes back is, okay, Eric, that was good. What did we save on sprays or what did we save on yield? Next slide, please, Paul. And when we start getting into that, you can see here's the lint yield in those low pressure. It did translate to yield uh, across all three here, regardless of the pressure. However, I think Peter made a very good point a moment ago when he was talking about uh, fruit shed or abortion or missing sites, uh, whether it is you know, a dehiscence or pollen sterility issue post-bloom or whether it was pre-bloom mortality of, of ovules and squares, there's still no substitute for putting footprints in the field. Uh, you know, getting out there, looking at those plants, understanding what's going on and integrating those management techniques uh, based on your field and based on your traits, based on your uh, uh, those other management regimes that may circle around water. I think that was a very good point uh, made earlier as well. And so we're pretty excited about this trait coming forward. Uh, excited to get it out there and let everybody see some of this. Uh, and I see a, a, a chat came up from John. I'm unsure of what the price of, th of Thrive On is yet. Uh, I don't know that we have seen any of that uh, in our hands yet, but I know marketing is adamantly working on putting something together there. Uh, to price that to value. We understand it has to be uh, economical for you uh, on those acres to get it planted and be able to, uh, to uh, utilize this trait. So we're looking forward to that and looking forward to generating more data this year, especially uh, out there with some of these uh, test plots, as well as some of this uh, seed production stuff to see how that fit really is for the Arizona, California producers. Next slide, please, Paul.
and I promised Paul I would not go over five minutes and I'm already 40 seconds over, but just, just going forward, I'd say uh, we're going to be looking uh, to work with consultants or growers, especially out there. Uh, we're still working on what these recommendations look like. We're going to continue to work with academics and extension to make these best recommendations by region. Uh, also, you know, we're not saying it's a silver bullet and you might not ever have to spray. We really want to know kind of what that system looks like, uh, not only for the thrip species early on in the season, but tarnished plant bugs as well, and try to come up with whatever those optimum uh, management systems look like for Thrive On. Next slide, Paul. Sorry, there we go. I believe it should be the legal disclaimer and that would yes. wrap me up uh, one yep. minute over, Paul. No, fantastic, Eric. Great job. I really appreciate you calling in and participating. Right. Okay. Switching gears now. Next up is going to be John Bender talking about the cotton crop protection portfolio. And I think we're good to go. John, oops, sorry. John, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Loud and clear. Go for it. Thank you. All right. Morning, everybody. Uh, I'll be going over Bayer's uh, cotton crop protection update for 2021. So here's a quick overview of our uh, Bayer's 2021 cotton crop protection portfolio. Starting with seed treatments, we have Acceleron, which includes our fungicides, insecticides, and maticides, and bioenhancers, Eris, and Evergol uh, to uh, help better stand establishment. Uh, herbicides, Roundup, Warrant, and then if you notice, uh, Extendamax has not uh, been updated on here, but we'll be discussing that. Extendamax is on here as well. We'll be going over the label update. Uh, fungicides, Bellaro, Bellum Total for early season nematode control, and Spathroid, Savanto Prime, uh, excellent control in both aphids and whitefly. And then finishing off the season, we have Stance, Finish Six, and Genstar. Next slide. So proof of dicamba formulation. So we have new information for 2021. Next slide. So uh, as of 2020, uh, the following formulations of dicamba are approved for uh, Roundup Ready Extend Crop Systems, including Extendamax, Tavium, and Eugenia. And these labels uh, have been extended through December 20th of 2025. Next slide. So uh, real quick here, uh, so this is not uh, going to cover your uh, certification for the dicamba training. Uh, we will be offering dicamba trainings online, but real quick here, uh, over, overview of some label changes for 2020. Uh, conventional crops have been taken off of the list. And then as far as timing, the application window for cotton uh, up and, and two, including July 30th. So previously you could spray mid bloom stage uh, to, or 60 days after planting, whichever occurred first. Um, they switched that to a, a hard uh, a deadline and that, that just has to do with uh, getting that label to, to, uh, to get back on the market. So uh, also DRAs, so uh, required for all applications except, to the, except for what's um, on extendmax.com. Uh, looking at uh, vapor grip technology and a VRA, so there is a uh, vapor grip technology in the uh, formulation, but uh, also in addition is required a, a vapor grip extra agent or an equivalent of a VRA. Um, and then looking at the uh, downwind buffer distance, it has been extended from 110 feet to 240 feet. Next slide. And then uh, optional use of drift uh, reducing agents here, uh, looking at endangered species counties, it has been reduced from 240 to 110 feet, and then uh, also 310 to 240. So looking at single applications, uh, so they did break, we did break up the uh, pre-emergence applications into two applications of 22 ounces an acre. And then in crop, crop in, in crop applications up to two 22 ounce uh, applications for a total of 88 fluid ounces throughout the season. Um, and then as far as uh, rain fat or runoff restrictions has been extended for uh, 48 hours instead of 24 hours. Next slide. 
So as we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, here's the, uh, here's the link for the Roundup Ready Extend trainings here, roundupreadyextend.com slash training. If you go there, you will be able to sign up for, uh, for all applicators to, to get their certification. Next slide. So impact of volatility reducing agent on dicamba formulations. Here we have Clarity uh, and Extendamax, Eugenia and Tavium. Uh, both Extendamax and Tavium uh, perform best at 1.0 or less. Next slide. And looking at the rates here, so Extendamax at 22 ounces an acre, Eugenia at 12.8, and then Tavium at 56.5, and then both of those included the approved BRA and DRA. Next slide. Uh, so we have our, uh, we've, ex we've expanded our spray with early spray with confidence program here. So it's new starting with a 21 day, start cleaning with a 21 day pre at plant. Uh, and we will, we will guarantee uh, that our program will work. And if not, you will be reimbursed up to $15 an acre on respray programs. Next. Uh, Let's do next slide. So an example of this, you start clean, plus a pre-plant, pre-herbicide resi residual, and then uh, an, an application, or an example of this would be Roundup at 32 ounces an acre, plus extend the max at 22 plus warrant. Next slide. So here's another example of this in a weed cotton weed recommendation for Arizona here. Uh, so if you look at, at planting within five days of planting warrant at three pints or caparol at one quart, and then 21 days after planting around a power max at 32 ounces with extend the max and then warrant at three pints, pints. And then 42 days after planting round up power max 32 ounces extend the max at 22 and then uh, a post directed after that. Next slide. And then in addition to the spray with confidence, uh, you could also earn with Bayer Plus rewards in 2021 again. Uh, you'll have three chances to earn here. The product portfolio incentive on the top left corner, you can earn up to $15 an acre. Uh, the Roundup and Extend the Max incentives over here, you can earn up to $3 an acre and Extend the Max has been included on that this year. And then you have a chance to earn uh, 50 cents an acre on our agronomic add-ons and partnered product incentives. Uh, and if you have not, uh, if you have not signed up for this yet, you can sign up at mybearplusrewards.com. And once you have an account, you can log in and track your sales and, uh, and all your information will be right there. And that should be it, Paul. Next slide. Hang on a second, sorry. Yeah, that's it, John. Hey, I would just say um, back on your program here, it goes without saying we talked about resistant pigweeds, but this program will be effective. There's definitely chemi chemicals in there that'll control those uh, Roundup tolerant uh, careless weeds. So John, thank you very much. Well done. Anything else? Okay. Ta uh, let's see, up next is uh, Keelan Goldston from Keelan. If you're there, tell us if it's uh, frozen tundra in Mississippi. Yeah, I I'm thrilled to be here, but I really wish we were doing this in person because we've had uh, about five inches of sleet and about four inches of snow and it hadn't been above freezing since uh, Sunday and that doesn't happen in Mississippi. So my goodness. Well, we're glad you're here in any case. I agree. It'd be nicer in person, but virtually is the next best thing, I guess. That's right. It's all yours, so, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, if you'll click to the next slide, what I want to do is cover our new class of 21 varieties real quick. And, and then I wanna go through our experimentals that are going into our NPE program this year as well. So start out with Delta Pine 2115 B3XL. Um, this variety is a lot like Delta Pine 1725 in its phenotype. So it's a shorter, compact, early mid type plant. Uh, it's got a semi-smooth leaf. It, it's one that doesn't look real showy, doesn't look real impressive, but has had absolutely great yields uh, in, in all of our testing in the NPE program last year. Uh, best fit's gonna be in the Mid-South and Southeast. Uh, you know, it's got a, a mid 5,000 seed size on it. So a, a pretty good seed size. Uh, it is bacterial blight susceptible. 
and moderately susceptible for burnt wilt. Uh, I do think there's some places where 1725 has done such a good job in Arizona that uh, Delta Pine 2115 B3XF over the next year or so that, that I would encourage growers that like 1725 to take a look at 2115, fairly determinant like 1725 and, and phenotypically a lot like 1725. So our next uh, slide just simply shows it, its yield across the, the belt. And I'll set that up for just a minute. If it's red, it's yielding less than the check, which is 2012 in, in this particular slide. Uh, gray means that it's essentially the same as, and then green uh, means that it's better than either it's 75 pounds or less or greater than 75 pounds if it's dark green. So. So you can see this is a early, mid early variety that has really shown good yield potential across the belt. Our next variety is Delta Pine 2127 B3XF, one that I'm, I'm really excited about. This variety has been a really solid performer across the belt. Uh, it, it's a tall, aggressive growing variety, really indeterminate or has a lot of strength to terminal. So it is one that's going to need uh, pretty intense PGR management throughout the growing season. And it's really important on this one to start your application at pinhead to match head square of, of plant growth regulator. It's an unusual variety from the standpoint that it's got a real open canopy. Um, could be a little loose in some environments. Uh, the, the bowl type on it tends to be a little looser, but one that's certainly broadly adapted across soil types and a, a certainly a racehorse type variety. You get seed size on it, it's about 4,500 to 5,000, somewhere in that range. And as I said, it's one that goes across the, the belt, moderately tolerant for burp. Um, it really shows solid performance all the way across the, be the belt. It is bacterial blight susceptible. And if you look at the, the map, uh, compared to 1646, which as you know, has been the, the most planted variety in the US for several years now, you don't see any red on the map. So this one's really got strong yield potential across the belt. One that I encourage people to, to look at as we get more seed available. Delta Pine 2123 B3XF, uh, Really a short boxy type, not real aggressive growing, uh, very easy to manage from a PGR standpoint. Uh, this is one that, that's really gonna be focused on West and South Texas. Uh, Semi-smooth leaf pubescence, uh, really strong emergence, strong performance in the Northern High Plains and Panhandle. Uh, I think it's gonna certainly replace Delta Pine 1522 in that market and certainly something that we might be looking for some seed production in Arizona. Then we've got uh, Delta Pine 2141 ENR B3XF. This is a root knot nematode and reniform resistant variety. Uh, it's a real pretty bushy phenotype type plant. Uh, one that, that is gonna need some PGR management. It, it's very broadly adapted. This one's best fit's gonna be uh, in the Southeast and the Mid-South. A good seed size on this one. Um, it's got moderate tolerance to bird. It is bacterial blight susceptible. Um, one, one thing that, that I do want to mention here, uh, it, we've observed up to 30% split terminals in, in our trials over the last two years. The terminal typically, typically aborts at node two to three uh, in the plots this past year and it's variable counts from field to field, but we did not see this affect yield, nor did we see it affect maturity. So I, I don't think it's gonna be a, a big deal, uh, but just something that, that you need to know about this uh, as we go forward with it. The, the other NR variety is Delta Pine 2143. It too is both resistant to reniform and root knot nematode is a bushy type plant. Uh, main market for this one's going to be West Texas. Uh, again, it's got the same split terminal scenario that we talked about on, on the 2141 as well. So that kind of 
goes through the, the class of 21 fairly quickly. Uh, in the class of 22 uh, NPE candidates this year that our NPE growers across the belt will be testing, uh, we've got some really uh, neat genetics coming forward, I think, that I'm really looking forward to this year. There will be two varieties that are root knot nematode resistant to 20R745 and the 20R722. Uh, 1XF variety in there, 20R926, of course, will be focused in that West Texas market. Then there's three uh, B3XFs that are will be tested only in Texas, uh, but again, may have Arizona seed production at some point in time. The 20R727, 732, and 739. Um, these are really high performing varieties uh, specifically for that West Texas market, short compact plants, uh, good fiber quality and, and excellent yield potential on those. Across the belt uh, in B3XF, 20R733 B3XF, I, I'm, I'm really excited about from a yield potential standpoint as a very vigorous growing plant, um, really a high level of indeterminacy in it. Um, this one actually reminds me in its growth pattern of 1549 somewhat. So I'm excited to see what that one does. Um, the 734, 741, and 744 will be tested belt wide. I certainly think the 20R744 may have a, a particular fit for Arizona. And then Eric talked to you about Thrive On. We've got three B3TXF varieties that we'll be testing this year. Uh, the 19R325 was named Delta Pine 2131, uh, and it'll be tested uh, mainly in the Delta, but uh, this year because of some restrictions, but uh, we will test it a little bit broader than that. And then the 20R816 B3TXF and 20R822 B3TXF will be tested in the, the NPE trials in the Delta as well. So, I, Paul, I'm really excited about where we are from a commercial perspective at Delta Pine, but also we've got some really exciting new genetics that we're rolling out to our NPE growers as candidates for the class of 22. Fantastic, Keelan. Um, really appreciate that information. Again, I wish we could have been here in person, but uh, appreciate you calling in today. You bet. Thank y'all. All right. Thank you. All right. Let me get out of picture mode. And saving the best for last, of course. Tom, are you there? Yeah, Paul, thank you. Great, I'll hand it off to you, Tom. Your slides are loaded. Are you able to see your slides? I know you had some problems earlier. Uh, let's see, I'm still seeing Keelan's stuff here. Let me uh, go ahead and pull mine up and just kind of follow along with you. All right. <clears throat> you have the, uh, the welcome slide up? Yep, looks like snowy four peaks, yep. You know, uh, we need a lot more of that uh, to uh, provide some moisture to get behind all of our dams. We sure need it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, next slide, please. Good morning. My name is Tom Jen. I'm the field production manager for Bear Crop Science. Ne next slide, please. So basically, uh, I'm going to be covering several topics. So we're going to review uh, briefly several of the uh, class of 20 and class of 21 actual commercial performance from last year. Uh, as Paul said, uh, the commercial supply of these uh, materials are gonna be rather limited this year. We're gonna work very diligently to uh, increase that supply for, for subsequent years. Uh, but I thought it'd be good to uh, go ahead and, and review the actual performance. Uh, a lot of these are, or actually all of these are gonna be uh, uh, Looking, we're going to be looking for seed contracts on these uh, this year. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to review briefly some of the seed production contract requirements and with an emphasis on the worker protection safety reporting. So next slide, please. And Tom, we're running about three or four minutes ahead. I mean, behind, ahead. So you have a few extra minutes. Oh, so don't okay, go. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, no pressure. Anyway, no, so the none. first slide, uh, basically, all, all, all of these slides are going to have the same format. If you look on the left side, it's going to be your planting dates, your harvest date, the uh, acres in the example, yield in pounds per acre, uh, equivalent yield in 500 pound bales per acre, 
uh, lent turnout from the gen recaps and when available an average loan value uh, based on a base loan rate of 52 cents. The comment section is going to indicate some notes about what type of quality we're talking as far as staple and mic and also the area that that uh, commercial example was grown in. And as you can see, the 2012, uh, as Keelan mentioned, it's, a, it's one of our earlier maturing varieties uh, with yield potential equal to 1646. Uh, this is a B3XF, uh, which is a, a different than the 1646. It's uh, rather indeterminate. It's got very strong terminal growth, uh, smooth leaf, and good vigor. I've seen this variety do well all the way from central Arizona over to Alfreda. And as you can see, it's it's a good yielder, especially uh, results from this last year, as Randy said, was a pretty warm year. Uh, one of the things that I want to highlight is the, uh, you can see the harvest dates there for the two uh, entries on the bottom in red. Uh, what I'm trying to emphasize there is the earliness of the harvest date and the corresponding yield. Uh, you know, you can still get a very good yield. And, and if you manage it for earliness, it can be done. And uh, we'll get to some of the benefits of that type of a farming strategy a, a little bit later. Next next slide, please. Uh, hopefully you guys are going to be looking at the Delta Pine 2020 B3XF slide now. Uh, this is more of an early to mid-season maturity plant, and it's uh, got a semi-smooth leaf, a good size seed and vigor. It's broadly adapted with very high yield potential. Uh, got some several examples here again. And as you can see, there's uh, the last two I have some very good uh, early harvest dates, uh, you know, early October, early November. Uh, and, and again, you know, very, very good yields uh, for that time frame. It's amazing when you go back and look over the data, uh, the actual results, actual commercial fields, uh, some of this cotton gets carried a month or two later than some of this earlier harvested cotton and yet the yields are comparable so it can be done it's it's uh, you know if you're looking at net profit per acre that's uh, really the strategy that you want to do even if you're not growing for seed um, next step uh, next slide please is a 2038 and that's also b3xf this is uh, going to get more into the mid to full season maturity this responds well to high yield environments it's going to be a staple or two shorter than the 1646, which is still in that good staple range concerning the quality of the 1646. This plant here is going to have to be managed aggressively, uh, starting with pin square treatments for PGRs. And if you notice uh, the high lint turnout uh, of this particular material, uh, you know, most of it's over 40% turnout, which is great. Next slide, please, Paul. Should be looking at the Delta Pine 2055 B3XF. Uh, this is a, a full season maturity, uh, smooth leaf. It works well in, in high input environments. Again, you're gonna need aggressive PGR management starting at Penn Square with this one. Um, the second uh, example I've got, I've highlighted the planting date this time, just to kind of highlight, this is a full season variety. Some of this uh, cotton was planted uh, you know, mid to late April, still did almost three bale. So uh, kind of an interesting uh, sideshow there. Next slide, please. Should be looking at uh, the first of our class of 21 materials yes, that I'm going to show you examples of. Delta Pine 2115 B3XF. Below it is the uh, experimental uh, nomenclature for it. Got a couple of examples again. This one here is again an early maturity type plant, compact plant type, semi-smooth leaf, um, high yield potential. And um, if you can go ahead with that next slide there. Paul, we're looking now at the Delta Pine 2127, again a B3XF, more of a mid-season mid maturity, uh, aggressive tall plant type with an open canopy as, as, as Keelan was talking about. Um, you're going to definitely want to manage this aggressively with PGRs starting at Penn Square. It's got good seed size and oil content, uh, good vigor. So uh, as you can see also, you know, some, some good length quality. Uh, next slide, please. 
Paul. And now we're going to be going over this uh, managing for earliness slide. A lot of you guys that have been regulars on our program will recognize this slide from years past. But again, I think it's very important to, to highlight the benefits of managing for earliness. This is something that you have to strategize about even before you put the seed in the ground. Get with your field man, you know, map out a strategy with a target of harvesting it, you know, late, early, early fall. Some of the benefits, you're going to reduce your input costs. You're going to save on water, pest control, late season and labor and interest. You're going to be doing a better job defoliating. You're going to be uh, utilizing those higher temperatures. A lot of our defoliation materials are temperature sensitive. You're going to, the result will be higher lint turnout, better lint and seed quality. The other benefit is going to be you're reducing your risk of weather related events which obviously can diminish the quality and the quantity of your crop. And we've all been through that in years past. Uh, the other thing too about coming off early is you can actually beat the, beat the crowd to the gin if, if you want to put it that way, uh, and which will result in a quicker turnaround at the gin. You're going to improve your chances for seed to be accepted, and you're going to be able to pay down your production loan quicker. The, the important thing here to realize is, you know, you're growing lint and you're also growing seed. So there's really two crops coming out of a seed crop of cotton. And, and you're going to increase your potential for the maximum seed revenue. And on a production seed contract, not only are we going to be paying you the top clean seed price at the gin, but we're also going to be paying, obviously, the seed premium. Now, if your seed goes into the feed channel, it's going to be sold as feed and it'll be subject to aflatoxin testing which uh, can result in quality discounts. So again, you're gonna be doing all these benefits while still maintaining the op top yield potential. Next slide, please. We're gonna sorry, get into now me. some of the seed. Five minutes. I'm sorry? Five minutes. Okay, well, I've got plenty, plenty of time. So uh, basic seed contract requirements for central Arizona isolation. We must have a half a mile of isolation from any Pima cotton. So please do your due diligence. If you're going to be growing seed block, do your due diligence. Talk with your neighbors. Make sure that uh, they, they're, you're all on the same page as far as that goes. Uh, we've had to kick fields out before because that wasn't complied. Crop history, very important for seed production. Number one, priority, put our seed block on clean, rotated ground, which means following another crop other than cotton. The other great choice is following, of course, the same variety with the same trait package uh, or clean fallow ground. Now, the key word there is clean. As you know, it's been very dry here uh, last year or so. There is potential, even on a field that was fallowed out of cotton for one year, there could still be viable seed cotton in that fallow field. So we got to really kind of take that on a case by case basis. We get a lot of questions about, well, what about plowed ground? You know, same thing, it's not our first choice. That will have to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis also. Now, as always, a grower is going to manage his own weed control program. If you're going to be using glyphosate, you must be using the Bayer branded Roundup. If you're using Dicamba, you must use the Extendamax with the Vapor Grip technology. Uh, the other thing, of course, that we require is uh, the labeling of the modules, proper labeling uh, with the grower's name, the variety, and the field of origin. Next slide, please. Seed contract requirements continued, worker protection safety reporting. This is going to be very important going forward. So as you know, reporting pesticide use on contracted acres has been a requirement for many years now. Unfortunately, the compliance has been minimal at best. So going forward, we will start enforcing this requirement. Growers will be provided a link to access Microsoft Forms which will be the reporting tool used to document and report pesticide applications. This tool will work on your, on your iPad, your laptop, or smartphone. Uh, next slide, please. All pesticide applications must be reported within 24 hours of the start of any application. The reporting and documentation requirements start no later than planting. And remember, if a third party vendor applies the pesticide, it's still the grower's responsibility to ensure application records are complete and reported. Next slide, please.
just like to do a shout out uh, to these two young ladies. They've been helping us out for well over a year now uh, in the data entry and also doing field inspections. On the left, we have uh, Amanda Garcia and on the right, uh, Danielle Walchley. And, and actually they usually are this jovial. Um, so just wanted to do a shout out for those two gals that are helping us out. And I'd like, like to always include a little bit about texting and driving and, and please don't be doing that. Uh, you know, nowadays everybody's got such a hectic life. Uh, we're all trying to multitask and driving down the road seems like a good time to try to get caught up on text messages and phone calls and that, but really it's not. Just allow yourself a little time. You know, if you're taking a trip, just allow yourself some time to make some stops along the way, pull off the road, safe place, get caught up on your messaging then. They say that texting and driving, uh, if you're doing that sort of thing, you're going to be 27 times more likely to get into an accident. You know, none of us want that. You want to be able to make it home at night. Next slide, please. And that's pretty much it for my, my presentation. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Good job. Boy, that was very precise, 1104. So with that, I'll just close by saying on behalf of Bayer Crop Science, Randy and the university, thank you so much for letting us get in on this and to the growers and dealers and consultants and applicators that are out there. We really appreciate you. Thank you very much and best wishes for a prosperous 2021. Randy, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And then with, uh, with the 20 seconds that we have left, uh, John Fender, if you're, uh, if you're still there, I think there was a question for you in the chat. We're good to go. I am. Let's see. Let me pull up the chat real quick. Well, you, might, you might have to answer it in the chat. <laughs> air, air label for warrant, John? Say that again. Are they going to they have any plans to do an aerial label for warrant? Uh, that was something that talked, that was talked about last year, but I haven't heard anything, um, as of recent, I can follow up on it. Uh, I'm looking for the chat. Who asked that question so I can follow up? Uh, Donnie England. Donnie England. Donnie England. Okay. <coughs> okay. Thank you, Paul and your team. We appreciate you guys all presenting and being here today. So we're going to move on to our next uh, presentation is uh, BASF. Dr. Kenny Melton is here with us. He's going to lead off for BASF, and then I'll let him kind of describe what they're going to do with their time slot. So Kenny, it is all yours. All right. And sure enough, as I get ready to do this, the uh, one that I need is not showing up on my, uh, there we go. Maybe this is it right here. Got too many windows open. All right, can you see that? You can see that. Into presentation mode. Well, I'll give you an update on the weather. In Lubbock, Texas, it is, uh, since Eric has spoken, it's reached up to a balmy 18 degrees. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, like uh, like uh, everybody else has said, I wish I was out there in Arizona with you guys where it's a little bit warmer. So uh, I'm Kenny Melton, the Western Region Agronomic Manager for, uh, for BASF and cover out there in Arizona and California as well. And uh, I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about our cotton varieties uh, this morning. And then following uh, my presentation, Jeff Boydston, who's our business representative for BASF out there uh, is gonna be talking to you about our crop protection materials. And then we'll wind up with uh, Tony Salcedo, our field seed production representative talking about uh, some of the issues around uh, seed production there this year. So uh, I'm going to start out, I'm going to mention, uh, go over three new varieties that we launched uh, just this year. And this first one is uh, Fibermax uh, 1730 GLTP um, with our technology, uh, the GL. Uh, indicates, of course, glyphosate and Liberty, and then TwinLink Plus, which is the three gene, uh, the BT system that will, uh, you know, has the has the VIP 3A in there, and and uh, has been mentioned already. I believe that uh, you know that's 
that's becoming more and more the standard for the BT cottons because uh, we want to, you know, that's typically not needed out in Arizona, but I do know there was a couple of years ago, I think there was some, uh, some breakthrough on some of the, um, on some of the two gene material. And so it was good to have, have that third gene in there to be able to protect against uh, any issues whenever they, they do happen to get some really heavy infestations that come through. Fibromax 1730 uh, is out of the same family of products as Fibromax uh, 1830 and 2334 GLT. Uh, it shares a lot of that, uh, that the same characteristics. One important difference is that it does have the root knot nematode gene, the A11 root knot nematode gene there that gives it good tolerance, very good tolerance to, uh, to root knot nematodes. So that's a plus for that variety. It still has, uh, like, the, uh, like the 1830 and, and 2334, it has, uh, has good verticillium wilt tolerance, not quite as good as Fibromax 1830 or 2334, but still really good tolerance to verticillium wilt. It is resistant to bacterial blight. No, that's not uh, too much of an issue. Uh, in Arizona, of course. And it has really good fiber, just like the, the, um, the 1830 and, and 2334 have. As uh, you can see down there on the bottom of the, of the slide there, uh, it's got our relative maturity. Uh, that That is uh, 1730. It, typically, of course, this is primarily uh, going to be planted in the high plains of Texas. And typically we see that as an early maturing variety earlier than, than 1830. Now we know that uh, in Arizona things can be uh, differently out there because of the heat stress that Randy mentioned just a while ago. And we know that, that with Fibromax varieties, we can see them impacted more uh, than, than uh, some of the, the Stoneville type uh, material that we have also. But 1830 has been one that, is, that has handled it better than most Fibromax varieties and 1730 is in that camp as well. And so, but you will see that this, uh, you know, because of the, um, because of the heat stress issues, you can see that maturity play a little bit differently than what we have in, in this chart. And you'll see some of that in, in some day that I'm going to show in just a little bit. It is a short, compact uh, variety. And you can see from our PGR uh, indicator over here on the left-hand corner, you can see that it does not require a real heavy, uh, a real heavy uh, aggressive program with PGRs. And we'll look at that, a little bit of data on that in, in just a minute as well. Next variety I'll mention is uh, Stoneville 4993 B3XF. Uh, as you know, we got uh, uh, got to, to the ability to uh, in license the uh, Extend Flex material, and so we've got this. Uh, we've got the the B3XF with 4993. Again, has the three genes with the Bulgard three this time, and of course, this will allow you to uh, to apply Ingenia uh, brand Dicamba over the top of it uh, for weed control, whereas you would you did not have that ability with uh, with the 17. So uh, with the 4993, it is uh, an early to mid variety. Now with our Stoneville material, our, our numbering system works at the 4000s are early, the 5000s are mids, and the 6000s are the full seasons. When you get it to the 4993, that's going to be, you know, really kind of at the tail end of that earliness uh, of the early maturity varieties. And so it, it's uh, it's really back there. We have another variety, 4990, uh, that we launched last year, and it's going to be pretty close to that. 4990, uh, 4946 GLB2 is one that a lot of folks are familiar with. A little bit later than than the 4946. Uh, it does have, uh, as far as it, its um, uh, characteristics, it's got the semi-smooth leaf. It is a, uh, it's a medium plant height, medium aggressiveness. Uh, we'll see a little bit of information on some PGR with that. It does have a little bit tighter uh, bowl than the, uh, than the uh, 1730 or the other variety that we're launching, 5091. We'll see that in just a second. A little bit tighter bowl. It still picks well, though, so we're in good shape there. As far as its disease resistant package uh, other than having bacterial blight resistance it's not not that great against verticillium wilt and it does not have the uh, root knot nematode gene and and uh, the subsequent uh, tolerance to uh, fusarium race one 
um, we can see there the uh, uh, how it fits in the in the maturity scheme of things and in the PGR recommendations. Next one we'll talk about is Stoneville 5091 B3XF, a little bit longer in its maturity. Uh, this one has a, a little bit better fit in the east than the, uh, the 4993. 4993 had a great fit across the entire cotton belt, but uh, this one has a better fit in the east and uh, in South Texas, but you will see data showing that this performed very well last year out here in the far west also. So uh, it is a, a semi-smooth leaf, uh, early to mid-maturity, a little bit longer, a little bit looser bowl, about the same as uh, Fibermax 1730 and uh, Fibermax 1830 that, that we uh, talked about a while ago. Uh, disease package, it doesn't uh, have much in the way of verticillium wilt tolerance, uh, and it is susceptible to bacterial blight and doesn't have the nematode gene either. Uh, it is probably the more aggressive out of these three in terms of its growth. This is just a couple of field shots from an agronomic performance trial that we had uh, out at Eloy this past year. Uh, this is uh, 2193, which was uh, the experimental number for uh, Stoneville 4993. You can see there, you can probably tell that it's a little bit uh, tight in the burr. And then when we go to uh, the 2191, that was uh, that is the one that was commercialized as Stoneville 5091 B3XF, a little bit a little bit looser there. And then finally, uh, Fibermax 1730 GLTP, a little hard to tell in this picture, but it, it's a little bit on the on the looser side as well. Start, uh, we're gonna run through and, and look at some data from, from west to east, uh, starting over in the Yuma area. Gonna start off looking at our agronomic performance trial we had out there this past season. I'm not gonna go over these in, in great detail, just wanna uh, give you this information. Certainly, if you want to want to get this information, we can certainly get this to you. Certain, reach out to, to myself, Jeff, or Tony uh, Salcedo or Jeff Hughes, and uh, we can get that information to you. Uh, just looking at, uh, again, out in Yuma, uh, the, the Stoneville 4550, which is done well across the state, uh, except over on the east side, primarily it's in the, in the central and the western part. Uh, it, it's done uh, very well there, and, and Stoneville 4550 was the top there. Stoneville 4990 B3XF was one we launched last year, and it's performed very well across the state. Very good fiber with that variety. You can see the link there of uh, 1.2, so it really did did well in that. Fibermax 1621 is a GL variety, one that we, we, uh, we produce out here some, obviously that's for the uh, West Texas market, but you can see it did perform pretty well out in, in this trial. Typically it's not gonna perform, be in the top tier of performing varieties. Uh, in the uh, any any of these trials, but it did pretty well there. We introduced uh, another variety a couple of years ago, Fibermax 2398 GLTP, and that was that's one that has done very well. Uh, it doesn't perform as well in Arizona as as some of these others that have a little bit higher uh, a higher heat tolerance, but this one does does uh, extremely well in the in, throughout uh, Texas. And uh, so we're gonna have a high demand for that one in terms of production in the future. So look for that one to stick around for quite a while. Right below that, you see Fibermax 1730 GLTP. And then you can see how it did out yield the uh, Fibermax 1830 GLT in this same, uh, in this same trial. Going to scoot over and look at the advanced strains. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the university trials because, of course, uh, you know, Randy has posted those uh, those results on the web, and and so I'm sure a lot of you have seen them. I just want to point out a few, you know, where where some of our varieties uh, landed in terms of their um, in terms of their performance relative to the uh, to the rest of the entry list. So I'm not gonna, uh, no, you'll see, uh, we'll go through several of these, but not dwell on them. The one I wanted to point out, of course, uh, here, the Stoneville 5091 B3XF did really well. This is just the top 15 varieties we're looking at. And then uh, Stoneville 4550 uh, came in there in the mid middle of that uh, top 15 varieties and then 4990. Uh, Came out at the uh, came out fifteenth out of that group there, and then looking at the UCVT, uh, there's forty five fifty, and and another one that we're uh, we're producing a lot in Arizona, I think, is uh, Stoneville fifty seven oh seven B two XF. 
Uh, this is one that has done pretty well out here and uh, does really well for us in dry land production in, uh, in Texas. Moving over to the central part of the state, going to start out, going to look at a, two, a couple of the trials specifically, uh, and that is, uh, uh, and then we'll look at the, uh, look at them in aggregate, uh, the three that we had there in the central part of the state. This is looking at our, our trial in Coolidge. You can see 4990 again, uh, that performed very well, followed right there behind it with uh, one of these new varieties, Stoneville 4993 B3XF. Uh, and then we had Stoneville 5610 B3XF, which did very well in the central part of the state. We are going to be discontinuing that variety, though, because it, you know, we've, we've had some issues with emergence on that. It's not a real strong emerger. And really the target for that, uh, the biggest target had been in the uh, Georgia market, and it, it just hasn't performed as well there as we'd hoped. And so we're, we're going to be uh, uh, discontinuing that after this year. Uh, then we've got uh, coming in fourth there, the Stoneville 5091 B3XF. So you can see the, that these new varieties perform very well for us. And then FiberMax 1730 GLTP, a little bit better than uh, FiberMax 1830 GLT there. Moving over to Eloy. Again, 5091 did extremely well, then 5610 was next, and then uh, 4993. And then we have the, uh, down here in this particular one, 1830 was just a little bit better than 1730, but not significantly there. Look at uh, the summary across <clears throat> the three locations. We had another trial in Casa Grande that I didn't go over individually, but the uh, 5610 was the one as we looked across the, uh, the entire group of those was the one that came out on top, followed by 4990 and then 5091 and 4993. And when we look at 1730, it did come in uh, ahead of 1830 in terms of, of its yield. Look at a little bit of phenotypic data on these. Not going to dwell on this uh, uh, just a whole lot here um, on, on this particular slide. I'll, I'll show a graph of these here in just a minute on the early vigor and stands. The one thing I wanted to point out was a little bit about the growth. Uh, so that uh, you know, if you were if you have a um, uh, have any of these, so you know a little bit about how to manage. Uh, manage these in terms of their growth. We can see that the, the tallest variety that we encountered uh, was uh, Stoneville 5991, uh, and then the uh, 4993 was, was not too far behind it. 4550 is also uh, a pretty growthy variety for us. And then I'd mentioned that 1730 was a, a compact variety, and you can see there that it does indeed have the, uh, have the shortest uh, plant type out of anything in this group. Look over here also at the storm tolerance. I want to bring this up just a little bit, just from the standpoint of, you know, the uh, uh, what the open, what the bowl type looks like. We can see that with the uh, 1730 and 1830, they're very close to the same bowl type. Not much difference at all. With 5091, you can see that's going to be pretty much the same as well. And then here's what I mentioned earlier about 4993 having a little bit tighter bowl than than the rest of them. Uh, then of course our, our tightest was the 4480 and then the uh, 1621 also very tight as well. And then 4990 certainly does have a more showy open bowl type than the rest of these. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the growth. I'm not going to, uh, um, I know this data is, it, this is a trial that was done in Texas, but uh, it does have the, you know, the relative differences would be the same. I just want to show a, a PGR trial that we had uh, back there, and just so you can get some more idea about the growth of these. This is a, a trial that we had set up, and because of some, we had some uh, issues, we were not able to get our first application out that was supposed to begin at Match Ed Square with eight ounces. Of, uh, of a mepiquot chloride there. Um, so we started out with our, our first application was just at first bloom, which is typically not what we recommend uh, there, but um, that's uh, for this particular one, that's the way it worked out. And then followed by another one, another application 14 days later. Initially, we, you know, we had planned on that eight ounces at, at Match Head Square, followed by the, the um, uh, 12 ounces at first, uh, first bloom. And then we have a late application because we have, uh, have situations where, you know, growers um, typically, they, you know, they might not think that they've got a, a need for an application. And then 
wind up at the last minute trying to come in and make an application and you'll see that it it really doesn't help out in terms of it of, of growth management again i know these uh, numbers are, are shorter a lot of times than what uh, what we would experience in arizona but you can look at some relative differences i want to bring up the 5707 because we're you know we've done a lot of production out there with this now the dark blue bar is going to represent what the target treatment the red bar, the late treatment, and then the lighter blue bar is the untreated. And you can see here that uh, because we missed that first application, we really didn't get, even with our target application, we really didn't get uh, that much in, in terms of control. Weird deal that we actually had uh, a higher uh, a higher plant height with the, the late applications. Not sure what's going on there, but the main thing to look at here is 5707, probably the most aggressive uh, out of this, uh, out of this uh, set of varieties that we had. There's 5091 and 49.93. You can see there are relative differences in how they grow. And then 23.98, more compact, 44.90, 22.98, we had a 22.02, we haven't really discussed that one, that's another GL variety. But then here is 17.30. And you can see that one is one of the, one of the few, that one and 44.80, these, these uh, uh, shorter, faster varieties are the ones that have uh, we have more impact with and, and are able to control those more with a PGR. So it just gives you a little, little idea as to how they're going to perform out in the field whenever you're trying to manage them. Looking at uh, how these came up and uh, what our stand establishment, this is early vigor, uh, the uh, higher the, you know, the nine would be the best on these. And uh, you can see that the 1621 had the best vigor out of the group. 5091 was pretty good. 1730, uh, pretty good as well. And then, and then 1830. 4993 did have a lower, uh, a lower uh, early vigor, uh, but you, you did see that it, uh, you know, yielded quite well. And uh, I think we're going to have, uh, you know, we'll have better quality seed this coming season. And so we should have, uh, we should have better vigor and a better stand count with uh, 4993 in 2021. Looking at relative maturity, this is going, uh, this is just percent open that's taken uh, towards the end of the season and, and combined here. And again, this, you know, we talked about differences and how they might, how they come out. A 1730 did come out to be a fair amount later than 1830 in this particular deal. We can see that uh, we look down here, there's 5091 and 4993. Uh, you know, oddly enough, those are, you know, those do show to be different, but, you know, with the scale that this is showing, that's just, that's actually just 4%, so not, not too much difference in their maturity. Very quickly, advanced strains trial uh, for uh, Maricopa, uh, showing the, the top 15 varieties there. 5091 did well there also, 5707 and 4990. Then uh, I, whenever I made these slides, I didn't have, uh, I think Randy has since gotten at least some of this uh, fiber quality data, but uh, at that point when I made this slide, I didn't, didn't have that. 4990 uh, did, did uh, pretty well there at Goodyear and 4550 there did not perform as well, but uh, 4990 did well over there at that Goodyear uh, UCBT. At Stanfield, 4990 did much better and 4550 uh, kind of mid-pack with that one. Go to Eloy and look at that one. 5610 uh, again did did well there. That you know it did well in our our um, uh, APT, which was uh, right there by that. And uh, so you know it was a uh, it was a high yielding variety for us there. 4990 uh, coming in kind of mid pack with that group. And then in Marana, uh, we had the 4550 and 4480. Uh, probably 4480 really is not as good of a uh, uh, as good of an option for that area. 45.50, kind of surprised that that didn't perform a little bit better, but we'll be looking at some different varieties uh, in those trials this coming season. Move over now, uh, over to the eastern part of the state, we had an APT uh, at Thatcher, and um, we, uh, at, at that location, uh, the FiberMax varieties, higher elevation, you know, it's a little cooler, and, and uh, our FiberMax varieties typically do better over there. 1830 did really well. Uh, 1730 was right there with it. Uh, you can see our, our links uh, there with those, with those two varieties. 
uh, just did really well with them. And then uh, we follow up there with uh, the 22. I mentioned the GLs typically, uh, you know, uh, are for the high planes and, and did well there. And then we had uh, 49.93 and 5091 that did did well at that location also. So uh, those are how we how we wound up with on these uh, APTs. This is the last APT that I'm going to show, and I, I just want to mention and and give Randy a, a great deal of of appreciation and credit for our APTs. Randy, uh, we, we set up, you know, the, the locations for these trials. Randy takes care of, uh, we contract with him to take care of planting and, and uh, getting that, uh, getting the data, the in-season data, harvesting. That's a, you know, it's a, it's a huge benefit to us. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it, it, we want to be able to have that to give to, to the growers so that they know that, you know, this is, this is not just from our own hand. Randy has done done the data collection on these things, so you know it's uh, you know it's good clean uh, data, and um, you know we really appreciate appreciate his cooperation, and absolutely, of course, want to thank the uh, growers that have worked with us on these because uh, without them, that that certainly wouldn't be possible, and it provides great deal of information that's real important for us to be able to um, have for the uh, for commercial sales as well as of course for the seed production because we put a lot of varieties in here that you know a grower wouldn't necessarily uh, wouldn't necessarily go out and purchase specifically for his Arizona commercial production but it's to help out with the seed production information as well so big thank you to uh, to Randy and to the growers for all of these agronomic performance trials that we do uh, this is looking at uh, the, uh, uh, the, the phenotypic data from that uh, same set. We'll look at the, uh, I'll look at the um, uh, storm tolerance there. We can see uh, a little bit tighter in this environment here. And uh, we can see there though that 50, 40, uh, 5091 looked a fair amount looser than, uh, than the uh, FiberMax varieties. It's uh, not more so than it was uh, back in the central part of the state. And again, the 49.93 looked pretty tight in, in this uh, particular trial. Go over to look at the relative maturity with this. 44.80, um, I'm gonna back up just a minute and look at 44.80 in this one. It did not do well in this particular trial, but uh, you'll see in the, in the Bonita trial, it actually did pretty well. That's a very short season variety. And I think you'll, uh, you know, given the right circumstances, if you're in that shorter season uh, environment, it can it can really do pretty well. And this this highlights the the maturity of that of its being so early. And then 40, uh, 4990 and 4550 were right there with it in this particular uh, situation. And then here we see how the rest of these came out. And again, 1730 showed to be a little bit longer than the uh, 1830 in these trials. Looking at the um, uh, the UCVT that was there at Thatcher, uh, 2280 uh, came in there. 2574 um, is variety that uh, hasn't done quite as well as we had anticipated. We had that in there this year. It's got great fiber quality, great um, uh, typically and, and great uh, verticillium wilt tolerance, but uh, we are discontinuing this variety after this year. Um, so we won't see that one going forward. And then uh, last I wanna mention is uh, the Bonita, uh, the trial at Bonita and there, uh, like I'd mentioned, the 4480 uh, is doing, has done uh, well there in that particular trial. This was an extend only trial and you can see how it came out. So that's my, my last slide. Uh, before we go to, uh, to Jeff, I do want uh, to mention our GLIXTP technology that we're working on. This GLIXTP, that's quite a mouthful, alphabet soup type thing, but the, that's glyphosate, liberty, and the I is for isoxaflutol, which, is uh, which is an HPPD type herbicide. It's a bleacher type herbicide. If you've ever heard of balance uh, corn herbicide, it's in that same thing a tremendous uh, uh, herbicide in terms of controlling uh, pigweed. Uh, it is, works best as a pre-emerge and uh, it also, also has some post-emerge activity, but works best as a pre-emerge. We'll also be looking at some addition of some uh, 
uh, another uh, uh, herbicide, tapramazone, that which also has some some uh, post some good post emergence activity. That's further down the line. But GLIXTP, this will all be in our own proprietary germplasm. We're looking at having that uh, in APTs next year, and then anticipating commercial launch in 2023. And so uh, we're, we're, we're fast tracking that. We've got a lot of material that we're working with on that to try to get that uh, out to, to growers as quickly as possible. So we'll, uh, we'll hopefully have one of those next year, at least one of those in an APT uh, in Arizona, hopefully two or three of those next uh, in 2022, so that growers will be able to get a, a quick, an early look at that and then anticipate launch in there. So it's also going to allow the, the application of uh, Ingenia herbicide uh, herbicide on there as a dicamba uh, that with the that's what the X is for in that so we're really looking forward to that technology so I'm going to move right on in to uh, Jeff Boydston's presentation so Jeff if you're uh, online why don't you uh, start out for us there all right I'm all hooked up I hope everyone can hear me okay it's good to be here today and um, I've enjoyed some of the presentation all the presentations so far um, I'm going to talk mostly about our herbicides and then a brief mention about um, Safina, our, uh, our insecticide, a little later on if we have time. Um, I enjoyed uh, Blaze's talk about uh, resistance management, and I'm going to hit on that a little bit with some of the products that we have. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. So we have a lot of problems in desert cotton with weeds. Um, we all know we have insect problems and we are doing a good job of controlling those. Uh, but some of the weeds we have in, in uh, desert cotton production are Bermuda grass, jungle rice, bearded sprangle top, Johnson grass. Those are some of the grasses that we face. But we have some new tough broadleaf weeds too. Um, hairy fleabane is kind of new to Arizona, but I've seen a lot more of that in the last couple of years in alfalfa and around some cotton fields. It's a tough one. We've always had morning glory, and the one that we fight a lot are the pigweed species, uh, palmer and, and redwood, red root pigweed. Next slide there, can you? Okay, so uh, Blaze talked a lot about this, so I'm not gonna spend a, 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 a lot of time on it, but our point being is that uh, Palmer pigweed makes a lot of seeds uh, and the resistance is carried in pollen. So if you have um, a, a few resistant plants, uh, if it makes seed, you're gonna spread that uh, pollen around. So I think the point that we wanna um, make here is that manage all weeds as if they are resistant already. And um, you know how it is, Year one, you see a few plants. Year two, a patch of plants. Year three, field wide, what happened? And then year four, it spreads to other fields on your farm. So um, we want to get on top of these. And that's why we're happy to join up with the university in promoting uh, an overall herbicide program to help uh, fight this resistant weed. Next slide, Randy, please. I mean, Kenny, sorry. Um, and we think you should have a holistic approach to um, weed management. And you know, you can stop resistance on your own farm. Your neighbors may have it, but you can stop it on your own farm. And, and the ways to do that is to manage all crops and non-crop areas on your farm. Uh, try your best to keep uh, it out of fence rows, out of your other crops as corn and alfalfa. Those are good places that we can use, utilize other herbicides and try to get rid of, uh, of uh, resistant pigweed. Um, your storage yards, field borders, and ditch banks. If we can control, uh, do a comprehensive um, control, we can create a defensible space on your farm so that you can stop resistance on um, your farm. Next slide, please, Kenny. So, what we suggest, and um, Blaze did a good job of covering all this, but like eight steps. Uh, rotate effective modes of action of herbicides when you're using them. And the key thing we think to start out is to 
overlap residual herbicides. Don't let them run out, especially when you're talking in alfalfa. Overlap your prowl applications or uh, prowl with your warrant applications or prowl with uh, TR10. Use uh, as many residual herbicides as you can to keep this uh, nasty weed in, under control. Implement cultural practices where you can. Um, and again, manage all areas of your farm, the crop and the non-crop land. Make sure nothing goes to seed as best you can to stop that. Um, proper application stewardship, water volume and speed is critical with good weed control. Clean your equipment so that you don't move seed around. And one thing that uh, is always hard to do but is critically important is it's best, they're easier to kill small weeds. If they're under six inches, most of the herbicides we have are still effective on that, except maybe some of the resistant ones, but you have a better chance of killing a small weed than you do a, a large weed that we've seen in some of these pictures. So we think don't fear resistance, let's just manage it. Next slide, please, Kenny. So an example of why we should use um, residual herbicides, and we'll talk about prowl in a minute, but the thing to remember is an unemerged weed only has one growing point to control. Once we let uh, pigweed germinate and start to grow, it develops a lot of growing points and it's harder uh, to kill them all. So if you've got a, a residual herbicide in the soil, it's going to stop that weed as it's germinating with one growing point and your herbicide is much more effective in that instance. Kenny, the next slide, please. So uh, products, the residual herbicides mostly are in the top of the soil, um, including Prowl H2O, for instance, it's only gonna move an inch and a half to two inches in the soil profile no matter the amount of tillage or the amount of water you put on it. So most of the weeds that we're concerned about are in that top inch or inch and a half of soil. And that's where your residuals rest and that's where it stops them. So um, it's good to have these uh, uh, residual herbicides down. Next slide, please, Kenny. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Prowl H2O. It's been around for years. Um, the H2O version hasn't been around as long, but in cotton, it gets grasses and small seeded broadleaves pre-emergently. It's a caution label. Um, Re-entry is 24 hours. It's a group three herbicide. The rate in cotton is two to three pints per acre, depending on the type of soil you have. So our encapsulation method reduces residue trapping and photo degradation. Um, so it, if you get it on residue in the field, um, it will wash off with irrigation and move into the soil and work. It doesn't attach to that residue. Um, application methods are ground, chemigation. It depends on the crop and, and cotton, uh, your timing. So um, it's pre-emerge and some post-emergent applications. Uh, you need to work with your PCA on timing for that. Uh, next slide, please, Kenny. Um, how Prowl H2O works, won't spend a lot of time here, but it gets the root as it's coming out of the seed, as it starts to germinate, uh, it uh, kills that, um, that part of the plant. And so that leads to seedling death without a root. It can't absorb nutrients and continue to grow. So we need to stop as many weeds as we can before they emerge. Go ahead to the next slide, please, Kenny. Okay, just a review of Prowl in cotton. It, it virtually has no odor, especially the new H2O formulation. Uh, it's increased surface stability. So if you put out a application of Prowl in alfalfa or in your cotton, it will sit on the soil surface uh, for up to 30 days before you have to get it incorporated. Again, you want to get it incorporated sooner, but if you ran into an issue where you couldn't get it incorporated, it will sit there and wait for you to do it. Um, and like in alfalfa, 
all the trash that's on the floor of an alfalfa field, once you spray it on, you put water over the top, it will not bind to that crop residue. It's very safe on almost all crops. Um, it's got good residual weed control and Prowl tank mixes really well with almost every other herbicide. Just a friendly reminder, put the Prowl in first and then you can tank mix just about anything with it. Uh, it stays in that upper soil profile, that upper inch, inch and a half, and it's got lots of flexible application methods. So it's a pretty ver versatile herbicide. Next slide, please. I'm going to introduce a new one that we, we've had around um, a little bit in other crops in other parts of the country, but we thought we would talk about Zidua uh, for Arizona cotton. It does have an Arizona label. Um, and the great thing about it is very effective uh, pre-emergent control of pigweed. So you can put it on post-emergent. Um, you got to start early when from the five leaf stage to early bloom is our window. And you got to avoid contact with the cotton leaves as much as possible. So it's not like Prowl, if you can't spray it over the top of a cotton plant, you've got to be a directed spray. And, um, um, but once you get that down there and if it fits into your rotations, this is another tool we have for um, um, pre-emergent weed control of tough weeds like pigweed and, and a lot of grasses it, call, it controls too. So, um, you can call me about this product or talk to your PCA and, and we can get together and, and figure out the best way to use it. But it's another tool we have for those fields that have a severe um, pigweed problem. Next slide, please, Kenny. So this is just some of the spectrum. Uh, it's really good on Palmer pigweed, on morning glory, uh, on all the grasses that we have. And, if you can look at the rating there, this was done in Mississippi and compared it to the other, to Outlook, one of our other herbicides. And on grasses, it's really good. And on broadleafs, it's very good too. And uh, much better even than Outlook or one of our other herbicides. So um, it's one to put in the toolbox. It's not as easy to use as Prowl is, but depending on the weed spectrum you have, it's certainly an extra tool that uh, we have. Next slide, please, Kenny. The other thing is, is uh, BASF, as you know, when we acquired um, Stoneville and Fibermax from Bayer, we also uh, were able to acquire the Liberty herbicide. Um, and most of you probably have more experience with this than I do. I've seen a lot of it in the field, um, but it's a, a warning label. Uh, the rate depends on the scenario you use, but it's 32 to 43 fluid ounces per acre, 87 ounces max in the season, a 70 day pre-harvest interval. Um, you got to make sure you got that tolerant trait. All of our varieties have that. Um, you can tank mix it with other herbicides, add AMS or a nitrogen source, uh, defoamer foamer is also recommended. Um, so remember the timing is 70 days before harvest. Next slide, please. All right, um, best use practices. Um, the thing to remember mostly here is that you need sunny, hot, humid to make this herbicide work best. So um, we've had sometimes when it doesn't work as well in early June, a lot of the time you're going after pigweed because uh, we spray it in the time of day when there's no humidity and it doesn't kill pigweed as well as it does when there's humidity. So just re remember that. And you've got to have a good adjuvant, a spreader penetrator and an AMS um, and use a good uh, um, nozzle when applying it. Next slide. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Ingenia, just a few reminders. Ingenia is registered now again in Arizona, as is um, uh, Astendamax that um, our friends at Bear spoke about earlier. So many of the things that pertain to that pertain to Ingenia. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
you can be confident in Ingenia herbicide. It's the uh, it's the child of a bunch of older dicamba products that BASF has been working on for 50 years. Um, we bought um, dicamba from uh, the old company um, that became Syngenta uh, prior to that. So we've had it for a lot, a long time and been researching it. It's part of our um, BASF herbicide portfolio and um, it is a good and safe herbicide. Next slide, please. So the thing to remember about um, Ingenia, it's the most advanced formulation of dicamba on the market. Um, as you can see on the left, that BATMA molecule is much different than the smaller dicamba molecule. Um, once it lands on a leaf surface, it's going to stay there. It's a low volatility salt. So uh, it Ingenia helps to control glyphosate and uh, PPO resistant broadleaf weeds. And it's more effective than most PPOs and 2,4-D for controlling resistant weeds. Next slide, thank you. So that's kind of our cotton uh, portfolio, uh, portfolio. I wanna to mention too that uh, with the new label requirements on dicamba, you can find that on um, ingeniastewardship.com. It has all the, answers to any questions you might have and the tank mixes that you can do. The, when you tank mix Ingenia, it has to be on that list of approved tank mixes. And we also this year are introducing a new buffering technology called Centris. And I'll be around to talk to people because you know it, with Ingenia, you can't use ammonium sulfate in there, but we've developed a new buffering technology that gives you some of the benefits of um, an ammonium sulfate molecule. So next slide, please. Um, just to remind you too that a lot of our herbicides you can use around the farm and other areas other than in, in crop like we've talked about. Um, Clarity is a dicamba formulation still available and used in um, hay, rangeland, and general farmstead. Uh, you can use Prowl around the farmstead. You can use Liberty around farmsteads and in public, public areas. And Sharpen, our PPO herbicide, you can also tank mix with glyphosate and use it around the, the farm and on ditch banks and that sort of thing. But read those labels before you do that. Uh, next slide. Sorry to jump um, in, guys. Five minutes. Okay, I'll stop here. Just to remind you that Safina is our white fly and aphid material, and we've uh, we're working on a two double E label for Ligus because we discovered uh, last uh, season that we have quite a good Ligus activity in cotton, and I'll be around all of you to talk about that in the future. Thank you. Okay, we'll uh, pass that on off to Tony Salcedo now. He's going to talk a little bit about our seed production. Yeah, I'm just going to be brief. Uh, Kenny, thank you for everything. And Jeff, thank you both for uh, sharing everything about BASF with uh, the Arizona group. Uh, I just also want to introduce myself. My name is Tony Salcedo. I'm the production manager for mainly central Arizona to, to, to Yuma. And uh, we also have my coworker, uh, Jeff Hughes. He takes, every, takes care of uh, production from Central Arizona to Eastern Arizona, uh, but just wanted to—I knew we we're going to have a full schedule today. We—I we, think we have about four minutes. I just wanted to kind of touch on a couple of things, uh, bullet points of a successful production program. You know, one of them, uh, you know, the strategy that we have is the early in, early out um, strategy, to, meaning that we want to get in planted and get out as soon as we can, and that enhances a lot of different benefits not only to the grower but to our seed program. Uh, um, over history, we have, it's been proven that uh, the best quality does come out in the months of uh, October and November. So I know weather has a big thing to do with that, but that's what we, that's our target. And so we try to do everything we can to, to uh, support that strategy right there. Uh, but before I move on, I think one of the biggest things too is, is the, our herbicide systems. I say this every time I start, uh, we run into issues. Um, you know, especially now at one time or another, we only had one system, whether it, it was either we had a, a glyphosate program or we didn't. And so now we have 
four different uh, systems that are out there. So I do highly encourage uh, taking the time and having that discussion with uh, your seed person or double checking a bag of seed before you put it in the ground and, and especially before you start applying any kind of herbicides on there. So we, we do run into, uh, we have run into uh, issues with uh, applying the wrong herbicide on the wrong technology and it's, um, and it's become, it's not irreversible. And so it's a, it's a tough discussion and, and tough position to put yourself in. And um, again, it, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, next thing is, is uh, the, the take home on uh, how to make a, uh, have a successful production program. You know, the state of Arizona right now, if you look at the gins that we have in operation, you know, 75% of the seed, uh, the, the cotton that's going through there has a seed production contract on it. So the dynamics of uh, what we're doing out there is is more important now than it's ever has because the cost of our inputs versus our, or what we're getting back out of it. I mean, these, our seed contracts are, are a vital portion of our, our uh, income coming out. So we wanna make sure, but the biggest problem for rejections uh, is, you know, Early in, early out, uh, trying, that's the number one thing that we're, try, we're trying to encourage. But the next thing is to uh, make sure we maintain good mixture prevention. So be wise out there on where you put it. Uh, you know, um, even though it's fallow ground or even rotated ground, uh, the residual um, cotton that we have out there uh, seems to, to weather the, 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 the dry climates out here and, and we still have volunteers and, and whatnot. So, um, just uh, do your due diligence on uh, making sure when you're you're putting cotton, uh, even on rotated ground, make sure we're 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 doing a, a good job on and, and on on mixture preventions. Um, so I know um, I'm short on time here, but I do want to kind of just make some bullet points on variety performances. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, the 4990 and the 4550 were in going in Yuma were were two of the the top yielders in the in the through the gin and in the region. And also uh, the 4946, which was a, a Boga a GLB2. Uh, that was a that was a number one planted variety that uh, in the in the Yuma region. So I, I say that because you know those are our three core varieties that do travel across to uh, central Arizona. Uh, so if you are looking for a variety that fits in that non-production category, um, those are something that you may want to take a look at. Uh, the up and comers uh, that Kenny showed it was a it was an experimental BX2193 B3XF. It is now a ST4993 B3XF. Um, you know, it was the highest yielding variety that ran through Chandler Gin, uh, so in Central Arizona. So if you're looking for something to refer to, um, you know, it, it averaged over four bales uh, on 300 plus acres uh, going through that gin. So it's definitely it. It got it went through the exposure of uh, the high levels of heat that we uh, were we experienced this year. So I definitely that's a one that if you're interested, we do have those in in in, uh, in um, production contracts right now. So get it, reach out to your Jeff Hughes or my, or myself. And the 4993 or excuse me, the 50 ST5091 is another high performer that we uh, we also recommend. So um, just going through some of that really quick. Um, I do want to mention that uh, we do have a shared risk program. We do pay um, basically 100% uh, plant, uh, replant back to you other than the $25 re restocking fee. Uh, we have programs such as uh, the Stonewall Legacy Club that we've had some winners on through Arizona this year that, um, that you'll see some, um, some more uh, advertisement on that here coming in the next couple of months. Um, also, I would encourage everybody to look at our E3 program online. Uh, that's something that's, uh, we, we encourage everybody to, that grow Stoneville or FiberMax, it's an interesting story behind all that. Um, but other than that, I, I just want to say thank you for all your services uh, and, and uh, that you give the Stoneville and FiberMax brand and, the, and especially the BASF uh, portfolio, portfolio that you support um, this last year. So I'll leave it with that, Kenny. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. We appreciate it. Randy, toss it back to you. Hey, thank you, Kenny. I appreciate the BASF team, Kenny and Tony and Jeff for their contributions here to our meeting today. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we're going to take a, a brief break here for about 10, 15 minutes. We're going to start back up at 1210. I know in a virtual environment, uh, it's a little difficult for us to provide lunch to you. I didn't get the lunch vouchers out to you, unfortunately. But if you want to stop and grab something to eat real quick, and we're going to start back up at uh, 1210 here in just about 15 minutes, a little less than 15 minutes. So we'll see. And, and th there's no need to log off. I'd re recommend you actually stay logged on. If you just step away from your computer, that's fine. But stay logged into the meeting. And we'll start back up at 1210. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Randy. And thank you, Kyle. And uh, thanks to all of you who were willing to um, navigate their way through this with me. Uh, I have to apologize for my friend, Dr. Doug Jost. He is stranded south of Lubbock in weather that won't allow him to have electricity as his house right now. So it's my honor to give his presentation. And uh, we'll be looking at um, a summary of our new variety releases from Americot uh, that would have been that Doug put together for y'all to see today. So the varieties here in the red on the left are our experimental varieties that were um, planted throughout the country in 2020. Uh, these varieties here in the dark black are our uh, core varieties that were in every one of our trials and these light black varieties are regional varieties. So for example, um, 3729 might have been planted in Texas, but not have been planted in Mississippi. And 4792 might have been planted in the Carolinas, but, but not planted in, um, in Alabama. And then these are our competitive checks across the country, uh, and they're different for every region. Uh, 1549 was the check that I used in Arizona. Uh, Americot has an extensive uh, research experimental trial program across the belt uh, from Arizona all the way to the Carolinas and you can see our 217 trial locations scattered across the nation. So it was uh, Doug's pleasure to introduce the Americot class of, of 2021 and I'll start with our new variety uh, NextGen 3195 B3XF. Uh, our numbering system starts with uh, the first digit here. In this case, it's a three. It describes the maturity scale of the varieties. And um, the three represents an early medium. The one is the year released, so 2021. And the last two numbers combine to make a refinement on the maturity scale. So um, the larger the number, the fuller the variety. So 3195 is closer to a full, uh, a medium than it is an early. Uh, if you grew, if you grew um, 3195 for us in 2020, it was on your farm as AMX19B001. It has a, a, a turnout in the 40% range. It's moderately resistant to vert. Uh, it has a smooth leaf and a medium plant height. And we had uh, production acres on this variety from Yuma all the way through into Coolidge. It was in my heat tolerance work here in Maricopa, at Maricopa Ag Center and our company gave it a heat tolerance rating of excellent. Um, the chart you see in front of you is a combination of data from all our trials uh, across the country ACE trials and OVT trials combined. So some of the characteristics about this variety as I walk through it this summer, I noticed that it had a real open canopy type. In fact, it's the kind you could probably fire a shotgun through and, and not hit a leaf. It ha does have excellent heat tolerance and it's a quick variety that fruits early and it is fairly easily managed. Under irrigated conditions, though, probably be a consideration for um, some early season and mid-season PGR applications. So this is a regression graph describing the comparison of 3195 to Delta Pine 1646, which of course is America's top variety. Uh, the blue line 
represents uh, next gen 3195. The red line represents Delta Pine 1646. And the mean of all the trials across the nation is the black line. So what I'd like to point out is that 3195 outperformed for 1646. So you get in this range right here, which is about the 2200 pound per acre range, and then they're equal. So if you're a 1646 fan, you're really going to like uh, 3195. And then this is a chart describing um, 3195 in, um, in Arizona. So these are, these are production acreage yields from across the state, from Dome Valley into Gila Valley, and then in Maricopa and out into Coolidge. And um, new, this new variety performed well across the state uh, from, um, quick, from quick plantings in March and harvests in September in Dome Valley to more um, common plantings in April and harvest in November in Coolidge. So 3195 is our new variety. If, and if you saw our signs last year, remember it was 001. Uh, and Americot's recommending this product uh, as a fit belt wide from Arizona all the way to the Carolinas. Our next, uh, our next new release is NextGen 5150. 5150 was, re, was tested in Arizona last year as AMX um, 19B003. It uh, has a, a, an average turnout in the 40% range. It has a smooth leaf. It is a taller variety than 3195 and the first fruiting branch in the six to seven range. It has a little bit higher verticillum wilt tolerance than 3195, according to our trials across the country. This variety uh, received an excellent heat rating um, from our research at Maricopa Ag Center in uh, 2020. It's a very, it is a very tall, growthy canopy type variety. It does have excellent heat tolerance. My observations of it across the state were that it does require PGR applications, especially early, mid, and possibly even late season uh, to set it up for um, defoliation. This is a chart that compares um, 5150 to um, 1646 again. And remember, um, 5150 is the, the blue line. Um, 1646 is the red line. And the trial mean is the black line. And this particular variety outperformed 1646 throughout its entire trial uh, um, locations across the country. And this is what I'm familiar with. This is, uh, this is 15, uh, 5150, uh, this is 5150 ACE trial results in, Ariz in, uh, in Arizona. So our company ACE trials um, in Dome Valley, Gila Valley, um, Matt Randy's trial at Maricopa Ag Center, and then an ACE trial in Coolidge and so these are, these are ACE trial yields. So this particular variety has a longer growing season um, and uh, it, uh, it actually has, it actually could potentially be a higher yielder, but it does require the extra, extra time for, for production. So we're looking at this particular variety fitting in across the belt. And our last new release is NextGen 4190. 4190 was tested in 2020 as AMX 19B002. Uh, it was primarily grown in central Arizona in Maricopa, Costa Grande, and Coolidge. It has a turnout percent in the 39 to 41 range. It has an average um, tolerance to vert and a first fruiting branch in the 6.5 range. This is uh, yields from production acres. 
I want to point out that these two locations were late planted for Pinell County, um, the middle to the to the end of May, and uh, I think that's a reason why we're seeing this yields these yields here in the 14 to 1600 pound range. Uh, good staple, great strength, great loan, um, and uh, get it in the ground in, in April and harvest it in uh, November, and I think we'll see those yields go up in 2021. So it's a medium uh, growth uh, variety starting with a four. So it's in our medium characteristic and um, it'll be available. It'll be planted in the 2021 heat tolerance trials out at Maricopa Ag Center in 2021. I have a little bit of data on this in my presentation afterwards. I can fill you in on, on the heat tolerance on this particular variety. And because it was in such limited production, uh, we're, we haven't made a commitment to its, uh, how it fits across the country, but from what I saw of it in Arizona in 2020, I think it's a good fit for our state. So uh, summarizing Doug's talk, uh, we're, uh, we, we're looking at our three experimental varieties that were tested in uh, across the country and in Arizona in 2020 and their comparable numbers uh, for releasing as a commercial variety. So in my talk, you'll see me um, discussing 3195 as uh, uh, an early mid for Arizona, 4190 as a mid, and then 5150 as a full variety for Arizona. Thank you, Doug. Gosh, I hope your power comes back on and, and you defrost a little bit out there in Garden City, South of Lubbock. And, Hope I hope I did justice to your presentation. All right. All right, folks. So um, thank you. Th um, welcome to my uh, Arizona update from Americot. We have a great seed team in Arizona. Max McGuire and Matt McGuire manage our seed production, and I cover the research trials in Arizona for Americot. My talk has three parts, a bit about friends and a wild cotton adventure, uh, a report on our 2020 heat tolerance research and summaries of our trials and our seed production data. So my friend Penny Malone works for the Arizona Cotton Research and Protection Council. And we've been friends for 35 years. In the fall of 2019, we set out on one of our cotton expeditions. On our way to Kitt Peak, Penny told me about the story of Arizona's wild cotton. Gossipum thurberi is a wild cotton native to the higher elevations of the Sonoran Desert. And this was reported by Dr. Herbert Hansen from the University of Arizona back in 1923. It's common to the foothills around Tucson. It can grow up to 10 feet tall. It has familiar blooms and flowers and bowls about the size of a hazelnut. Nature is not without controversy, and in the 1930s, an effort took place to eradicate wild cotton. Some thought it was a host plant of the evil boll weevil. Thanks to research at that time and current molecular research, it's been determined that wild cotton is home to the Thurber weevil, not the boll weevil, and therefore not a threat to domestic cotton. Thank goodness. May you have friendships that last a lifetime, and may you find a bit of wild cotton on your travels throughout Arizona. So 2020 was Americot's third season to evaluate next-gen varieties for heat tolerance in Arizona. We sample our varieties and a competitive check within the UCAS trials at Maricopa Ag Center. This trial was planted on May 5th and harvested on November 12th. We use ASMET data for temperature and follow the same protocol as the U of A work done by Dr. Randy Norton, which includes pistol, pollen, and bowl ratings. If, if you ventured outdoors in Arizona last summer, you know just how hot it really was. 50% of the days during my research were level two heat stress days. 41% were level one heat stress days. Note the peaks in level two stress during 
first bloom, peak bloom, and cut out. The Western US was simply on fire. It was an inferno. Phoenix had 144 days over 100 with 53 days over 110. I don't know about you guys, but I seriously questioned my career and thought about applying as an ice skate renter at Polar Ice in Chandler. Our pistol and pollen ratings follow the universities. We had five sample dates with the first occurring on July 7th before level two heat stress. The mid to late July heat stress was so severe that on July 29th, basically no pollen could be found on any plot in the entire trial. So here's some conclusions. This chart represents the average of all the pollen and pistol observations. Note that Delta Pine 1549 is our competitive check. The blue bars are pollen scores with four as the best score. So the taller the bar, the better the pollen. The orange line is the pistol score with one as best. So the higher the orange bar, or the higher the orange line, the better the score. Four of Americot's varieties performed as well or better than the check. So I just wanted to mention this is Next Gen 5150. That's one of our new releases, 4098, 4936, and 5711. We also, we also made bowl observations. Um, our bowl presence and shape ratings followed the university. Now this research on bowls, as well as the university research is establishing a relationship between the ratings we give the pollen, that rating of zero to four and the formation of the bowls. So I think that the, the work that Dr. Norton's doing and that Americot is doing is make is providing an opportunity for growers to make pollen observations and link that to the potential for bull formation and and yield potential so here's our results uh, the average of all five sampling dates of the percent of bulls that were present from a flower and then the percent of those bulls that were actually perfect so the blue bars are the percent of bulls present from tag flowers and the orange bars are the percent of those bulls that were perfect. The best scenario would be that the blue and orange bars, of course, would be the same height so that all bulls were perfect. But you can see that next gen 4936 and next gen 5711 actually outperformed the check in the percent of flowers that became bulls and the percent of those bulls that were actually perfect. I want to give some credit over here to these two new releases, 3195 and 5150. They actually perform very close to the trial average. Now, this is after harvest. So the chart you're looking at here represents the pounds of seed cotton that were harvested, and it's comparing it to the percent bulls that were present. So the seed cotton weight is on the blue bars and the percent bowls present are, is the orange line. It's very impressive to confirm the heat tolerance of next gen 4936 and next gen 5711. Their yields are high, the bars are tall and the presence of bowls is high as well. Um, uh, and they, they, are, they are at equal to or greater than the performance of our competitive check. But what's up with these varieties here in the middle? If you're paying attention, you're like, you're, you're noticing that, well, hey, Karen, they, they had, they're great yielders. Um, how could that be? Um, it looks like uh, they didn't have very many bulls present. But there's an explanation for that. High yielders, but average bull producers. 
could be explained by the fact that not all the flowers were sampled. So I sampled some of the flowers, but not every flower on every plant. And cotton is a great compensator during the season. It's likely that these three varieties have that capacity to compensate for the environment. And uh, that would explain their high yields but their low recorded number of bulls present. Keep in mind though, these two varieties right here, Americot is very proud of their, their, um, long, their long standing uh, heat tolerance. Um, right. So this, is, this, this chart represents the top 10 yielding varieties of the, 93, of the 39 entries at the University of Arizona's UCAS trial at Maricopa Ag Center. So um, uh, next gen 3195, our new, our new release, um, uh, topped the trial at 2,500 pounds. Uh, we come down here to next gen 4098, its second year in production at 2,400 pounds. Here's our next new variety at 2,400 pounds. And then our two confirmed heat tolerant varieties here at uh, 20, 2,350 pounds. It was, a, it was a great year. It was a op great opportunity for me to spend time out at MAC and, and, uh, and learn from the university about their processes and, and, uh, and make an, have an opportunity to provide this information to growers so that as you look at, uh, at, heat, at heat tolerance capacities for different varieties, you can have confidence in those produced by Americot. All right, the third part of my presentation is uh, some regional data and the presentation of some trial data. I wanna mention first a little bit about the USDA Cotton Varieties Planted Report. Uh, we're growing our footprint in a, and Americot is increasing our market share in Arizona from 2.3% in 2018 to 10.7% in 2020. Uh, we also are the second most popular brand of cotton planted in the United States. Thank you to all our growers for your confidence in planting our varieties. So I've included some information in this section from our ACE trials, from the university trials, and from our um, seed production across the state. In cooperation with the University of Arizona, Americot had six experimental trials in 2020. In Yuma, our trials were with Ware Farms and Harrison Farms. In Central Arizona, trials were grown with Dale Button Farms, Hiscox Farms, Bartlett Farms, and Pacheco Farms. We hosted two field days and gave away planting seed as door prizes. We hope to see you at our events in 2021. I have results from two trials to present to you today. This particular trial uh, is located in Yuma, in Yuma. It was actually in Dome Valley, uh, Arizona, and it was planted by William and Jake Ware on March 26th. It was harvested on September 16th. Overall, we can see that this trial produced excellent lint yields per acre, especially our new varieties, next gen 5150 and next gen 3195. Even in seventh place down here, next gen 4098 performed well, had excellent fiber length and strength. This trial was planted in Coolidge, Arizona by Noah Hiscox on April 23rd and harvested on November 18th. It shows the heat tolerance of next gen 4936 as the leader in the trial and the potential of our new releases 3195 and 5150, both over the one ton mark, 2000 plus pounds per acre. This university trial is in Goodyear, Arizona with A Tumbling Tea Ranches. I followed this trial from emergence through harvest and would recommend next gen 4936 to growers in the West Valley for 2021. 
Thank you to the Rainers for participating in the UCVT trials with the university and giving the seed companies an opportunity to showcase our products out in the West Valley. This slide is for all my friends in Safford and Thatcher. Guess what? We might have a fit for your region with NextGen 5150 and NextGen 4098. Next Gen 4098 has a great big seed. In fact, it's 3,750 seeds per pound and an excellent stand establishment. And those qualities are important for your region as, as temperatures can be kind of tricky in April and uh, having a seed with great vigor could be a super advantage for stand establishment uh, in your location. Let me know if you're interested in this variety. Be happy to talk to you a little bit more about it. This is production data from Yuko, Jin, and Yuma. So uh, all these are production location yields uh, on production acres, uh, starting out with our two new varieties, uh, 5150 and 3195, down through uh, commercial varieties. Would like to say a little bit about this uh, high yielder here on the bottom, next gen 5711 is our full season variety. Uh, these were not planted in combination with produce, but, uh, but planted early and harvested in November. So they were given the opportunity to carry out a full season worth of growing time, uh, both of them yielding over 2,200 pounds per acre. Here we are down in central Arizona now uh, with uh, production data from our, uh, our seed production acres in Pinal County and uh, Pima County. Starting out on the top here with NextGen 3406 out in Maricopa, uh, production acres in Maricopa on our new variety 3195. Out in West Maricopa, 3930 was a real shining star, 1,634 pounds. That particular variety was planted uh, in April and harvested in December. And then this, this uh, is uh, uh, production acres from Casa Grande, Arizona, planted in April and harvested in, in November, 1,886 pounds. Um, very proud of that particular farmer and the yield he was able to um, bring in this year. So one of the things that's important to growers when you make a decision about choosing a new variety is what's its track record. Um, you can visit with your neighbors and you can watch the signs um, of, the, of the companies in the region um, and you can look at university trial data. But what I put together for you here is the history of uh, NextGen 4936 in Arizona. So it arrived in Arizona in 2018 as an experimental variety. In 2018, the average yield for Arizona cotton production was 1,311 pounds per acre. And this is the yield for this variety at Maricopa Ag Center at the Advanced Strains Trials. And this is the yield on production acres in Maricopa that was um, ginned at River Gin. And so that's 2018 data for 4936. This is 2019 data for the same variety. So in 2019, the average yield per acre for Arizona cotton production was 1,142 pounds. At Maricopa Ag Center in the advanced strain trial, 4936 yielded 665 pounds. And in Yuma, um, that variety yielded almost 1,600 pounds per acre. This is 2020, and this is the average yield per acre in Lint so far to date. Of course, the season isn't finished. There's still a little bit of production coming in. This is the um, yield for 4936 at Mac, and this is the yield in Pinnell County for this particular variety. It has a very strong three-year track record. It's a leader in our heat tolerance work. It's adaptable to most all soil types, um, and uh, it does well with moderate PGR management. It's definitely a variety that is worth your consideration. This is a regression chart um, showing uh, the combined trial locations for this variety across the nation for our company uh, and comparing it to um, uh, Delta Pine 1646. 
So we're looking at next gen 4936 on the blue line, Delta Pine 1646 on the red line, and the average of all the trials across the nation for all the varieties that were entered on the black line. Um, Next Gen 4936 outperformed Delta Pine 1646 and the trial mean in all the tests. So you see the red line is above the blue line in all, all the tests. It's especially successful at these high yielding um, locations. So at the 22 to 2,500 pound per acre range, it's especially successful above above the uh, competitor and above the trial mean. Alrighty, so I told you I'd tell you a little bit about our new variety, uh, next gen 4190 and its heat tolerance uh, capacities in Arizona. Uh, this is uh, production acres that were located uh, in Casa Grande. The, the fields were planted on May 14th, there were 100 acres. 80% uh, of the bulls, 80% of the flowers made bulls. <laughs> Over 80% of the flowers that were tagged made bulls. And of those bulls that were tagged, 70% of them were perfect. So indications are that this variety looks like it's going to be rather heat tolerant. And of course, we're going to be testing it again in 2021. This is the result from that particular location in Casa Grande. It was planted on June 18th. It had a very good stand establishment. It was very vigorously growing during, during the season. It was uh, managed with only one PGR application. It was defoliated in October and harvested in December. And this was the, uh, this was the, the yield per acre, 1,892 pounds. Oh, sorry, that's the seed cotton. Let's start over here. So the lint yield, 1,367 pounds, but seeds also an important component of your overall um, production system. And if you have a seed contract, it's actually uh, profitable. Uh, so I wanted to provide you with the pounds of seed, almost two tons of seed per acre were sold from this particular production location. Folks, um, this is a summary of the varieties that we've been looking at. I wanted to remind everybody that I spent a little bit of time talking about our new release 3195. If you grew that for us in 2020, it was 001. And of course, we have 3930 acres in Arizona as well. In the mid to full range, um, our, our, our varieties this year will be 4098, 4190, which is new also. And of course, 4936, which I made a case for its uh, three-year track record uh, in Arizona. If you're planting a full season variety, these are our two varieties. Uh, the new one is uh, 5150 and then 5711 is definitely a fit, if, especially in the Yuma Valley, uh, if the, the, the time period's available to you not to be rotating back into produce. A little bit about how to get a hold of us again. Next Gen Seed is very competitively priced. Uh, we have company financing and payment terms through February of 2022 at 0% interest. We have full contracts, option contracts, and commercial sales. And our warehouse for seed distribution is located in Eloy. Um, please. Uh, uh, please get a hold of uh, our West Gain Seed representatives, Max McGuire and uh, Matt McGuire um, to see if you have any interest in, uh, in contacting us for our varieties for this year. And then I did start out my presentation talking about friendships and I kind of wanted to end on that note too. I'd like to give a big thank you to all our growers and all our research partners. I had a great time again in, in 2020 and I'm definitely looking forward to, uh, to working with everyone again in 2021. So thank you, Randy. Great, thank you, Karen. Appreciate your uh, your work that you're doing here in Arizona with America. Uh, it's great, appreciate it. And I'm glad we were able to get your computer working. <laughs> thank you. All right, so now we're gonna move on. Any questions, we do have a little bit of time. Does anybody have any questions for Karen before we move on? 
that you'd like to un unmute yourself and ask? Okay, well, if any come up, feel free to put them in the chat box and we're, we're monitoring that and we can, we can get those questions answered. All right, so we're gonna turn now to Corteva and Kristen Nelson, appreciate you being here with us today. And I think you're by yourself today, correct, Kristen? I am, how's my audio? Audio is good. We're it's seeing your, your uh, yeah, switch your, dis your display if you can. Yes, well, there you go. How's that, good? That Perfect. All right. Kristen, it's all yours. Thanks, Randy. Um, first of all, big thanks to Randy and the university personnel for hosting this virtual meeting. We had some good presentations today. Um, and thanks for all the participants still on the call. Hang in there. We are almost done. <laughs> all right. So just a quick introduction. Um, the cotton team in the West for Phytogen is Jennifer. Um, Valette, who is our cotton development specialist. Um, you guys have probably all seen her at our meetings. She covers both Arizona and California. And then myself, um, I am the territory manager for crop protection as well as Vitagen Cottonseed, and I handle this stuff in Arizona. I just wanted to make a few comments about the 2020 season, um, kind of echo what everybody has said along with all the trials of last year, and as Randy's graph showed, and we all lived through it, we also have had to deal with one of the hottest summers on record. Not only was it hot, but there was no monsoon, so it was hot and dry. Um, the picking season was pretty cooperative, but overall the yields were probably average to down in most parts of the state, so that was a little bit difficult. But some positive notes, um, I had no major replants. We had great germination, um, no major issues as far as insects for the year. And we got a really good look at how uh, varieties tolerated the heat. Uh, a few key benefits when choosing phytogen cottonseed, we have excellent seedling vigor. Um, we really do have some of the best emergence in the industry, just a big seed with lots of energy. Our varieties are also quite manageable. Uh, while you may have to pay attention to water and fertilizer and PGRs, uh, as long as you manage these applications according to the plant's needs, our phytogen varieties really respond very well. Uh, the Enlist technology gives growers another tool in our hard to control weeds. This additional option is important in re, uh, resistance management. So not only do we have the 2,4-D trait um, with the Enlist technology, most of our varieties are triple stacked, triple stacked sorry, for herbicide tolerances, including glyphosate as well as glufosinate. Um, we continue to provide varieties that perform in both yield and quality. Our replant, replant program covers 75% replant costs. And we, like everybody else, we have grower financing options as well with Corteva, True Choice, as well as Rabobank. Um, a quick reminder of abbreviations. First of all, let's just throw out my number scale completely out the window. Um, <laughs> if you want to know the maturity, you look it up or ask me. It used to mean something, but as of today, I don't recommend making any decisions based on those numbers. Um, however, these abbreviations, so W is our wide strike, W3 is our wide strike three, so those are our BT genes. Uh, RF is Roundup Ready Flex, E will be Enlist only, um, FE the Flex Enlist, BB is Bacterial Blight, RKN Root Knot Nematode, VM Verticillium Wilt, REN Reniform Nematode, and FOV will be for the Fusarium Race 4. I wanted to address this. Um, I've had a few calls and wanted to clarify. We have been advertising with Thrive with Phytogen for a few years now. Um, and this is not, I repeat, this is not Thrive On, the gene that um, Delta Pine has for Ligus and Thrips. I know it's a little bit confusing, but it's kind of just a coincidence that we've been advertising with Thrive and then they named their gene that. So for clarification, this does not have the Ligus and Thrift gene in it. Um, I'm gonna dive off into my Arizona recommendations for this cotton season. 
but I also wanted to recommend you look at Randy's cotton trials from this year as well as previous years to get a good feel for how some of these varieties um, place and perform year to year. Starting off with Phytogen 400. I just have to say I was very pleased with this variety this last year, especially on such a hot summer. This one just took the heat very well. Uh, over here along the river where we had some of the hottest temperatures, I had some phenomenal yields. This variety is a mid-maturity variety with a semi-smooth leaf. I would consider it moderate management with PGRs um, and definitely broadly adapted. I didn't see anywhere in the state where I just thought, oh, this might not fit here. Like it, it performed fairly well across the state. As mentioned before, it has the potential to be highly yielding and probably my best heat tolerant variety to date. Um, as far as what this variety has to offer, so W3FE, Wide Strike 3 Flex Enlist, so the Wide Strike 3 BT gene, uh, glyphosate, glufosinate, as well as 240-choline tolerant, bacterial blight, root knot nematode resistance, um, excellent heat tolerance, like I mentioned, and very high yield and quality potential. Uh, okay, I did get asked if the phytogen varieties are as good as the old with emergence and seedling vigor. So phytogen 400 is our newest launch from last year, and I'm very confident in saying absolutely we are as good. This is from Randy's evaluation, and as you can see on a scale from 0 to 9, 9 being the best, we continue to set the bar high with the new varieties as far as emergence. Moving on to my next recommendation for 21, Phytogen 350 W3FE. This is also a mid-maturing variety, semi-smooth leaf, medium to tall plant height, very broadly adapted as well, and a good yielder. The question that I get about uh, what variety do I like more, Phytogen 400 or Phytogen 350? So my answer is what kind of summer are we going to have? <laughs> I feel like on a more average Arizona summer with monsoons and the temperature breaks in the, at night, that 350 will be the top performer. But if it's gonna be hot as heck like it was this last year, I think Phytogen 400 will be on top. So I think you'll kind of see these two switch places back and forth, but both really good choices. Um, 350 really is our full package variety. It is triple stacked herbicide traits, like I mentioned, has bacterial blight, root knot nematode, as well as verticillium wilt. So if you have grounds that have vert, this would be the ticket. Um, it is a consistent performer across the state as well, and it's probably my safest and most versatile variety. Uh, moving on to Phytogen 480 is a mid-maturity variety, semi-smooth leaf, moderate PGR. I think this one responds very well to PGRs. A medium plant height, it can get growthy, but again, it, it's very manageable. Um, and it is another one that the heat tolerance, it has done pretty well historically. It's a W3FE as well. It has bacterial blight resistance and root knot nematode. And like I said, it's a consistent performer and seems to do pretty well in um, central Arizona. And it did pretty darn good in the Safford Thatcher area this year. Um, Phytogen 580. Um, so my last upland recommendation for the state and the sake of this webinar is Phytogen 580. So this is a true full season variety. While it performs quite well in Maricopa um, and Stanfield and other central Arizona locations, it kind of surprised me the last couple of years in a row and also done well in Safford and Thatcher. Um, my comments on this one would be not to try to fit this one in behind like a double crop situation or any late plantings. Um, you won't be happy with it then. So um, a lot of them you can tell if they have a zero at the end, they usually have the enlist trait, but we have some new varieties that were launched who also have the enlist trait who aren't zeros. So that used to be another rule, can't use it anymore, but <laughs> so W3FE, bacterial blight, root knot nematode, truly a full season variety and um, really good fiber quality. All right, so my Pima recommendation is super easy. I know we have some uh, Pima guys on the call and here's your slide. Um, <laughs> this has been in the industry leader for the Pimas for the past few years and continues to perform, Phytogen 881. With that said, uh, we do have a limited amount of a soft launch Pima 807. 
um, that we're pretty excited about, but I'm really excited is we've got some really good Pimas in the pipeline that I'll talk about here in a few slides. But Phytogen 881 is broadly adapted. It's done well in like Casa Grande area. And of course it's the leader um, over in Safford and Thatcher. It is a semi-hairy leaf. It's a medium to full season variety, medium to tall plant, excellent seedling vigor. And knock on wood that this doesn't ever be an issue for us, but it is also very tolerant to race four fusaries. I think so. I mean, I already got some text messages from some people that said they thought um, and then another two varieties that every year I tell you, don't ask me about it, guys. I'm not going to have any. We're done with it. And then lo and behold, it kind of sneaks in and I have some. So if you're just an absolute lover of Phytogen 312 or Phytogen 444, reach out to me. We might we might have a little bit. We might not. But like I said, it, every year I say we don't and then we have a little bit. So I did want to mention that. <coughs> Excuse me. So in summary, um, these are the phytogen varieties for 2021 that I would recommend for Arizona. Uh, for specific areas, feel free to give me a holler. Um, I've talked about it with most of you guys, but if you have any questions about any of the varieties or any of the trial stuff, just uh, feel free to reach out. Um, like I mentioned, we have some new, new Pimas. So looking ahead, I'm really excited for that in the pipeline. Um, pretty stoked to see them in Arizona. They've done pretty well in California. So. That's something to look forward to for 2022, 2023. Um, we continue to look at improving our trait packages. So just know that Phytogen is expanding our traits in the pipeline. Um, while not a critical issue here, this year we launched Phytogen 332 and Phytogen 443 varieties that have reniform nematode resistance. Um, and in some states, that's a huge deal. So that was a big win for some growers. And we have continued commitment to strive for the highest quality and yield when addressing the growers' needs. I wanted to address our production seed. This will continue to be managed, <clears throat> excuse me, by Bayer. Uh, these gentlemen will place those contracts. So if you need assistance contacting Ray, Tom, or Adam, please let me know. I did want to mention that the contracts being offered are only on these varieties that you see here. Um, again, if you would like further information on those production contracts, please reach out to them or get a hold of me and I can get you in contact. If you would like some variety information on those, um, feel free to give me a ring as well. As I round out my Phytogen uh, recommendations presentation, I wanted to put in a plug for the women's leadership of the, from the Arizona Farm Bureau. We partnered with them on this awesome event called Comforting Kids in Cotton. This is our second year that we have been able to help them make a donation to the Ronald McDonald House. Last year, we helped them donate cotton sheets, and this year, we helped make a donation of cotton towels. I can't say enough how important it is to help our communities, especially at a time like this and last year. Uh, Phytogen and Corteva, as well as myself, are very committed, and we will continue to invest in our communities. Now let's talk Enlist. Um, I will be doing an overview on Enlist today, but I strongly encourage you to participate in one of our upcoming webinars. You should have received an email from me with this information on it. Um, when you register, it is very, very important that you follow the instructions. If you don't sign up with your license number following your last name, like it is in the example, you will not receive Arizona CEUs. Excuse me. This is the only way I'll be able to track my Arizona guys. Um, this is a national meeting, so I need you to put your license number back there. Uh, so please pick March 18th, April 28th, or May 27th and listen in. All right. Okay, so with Enlist Herbicides, you have two options. Um, just kind of a refresher, Enlist Duo herbicide is the 240 choline combined with the glyphosate in our proprietary blend. Enlist One is our straight goods 240 choline that offers tank mix like flexibility. So you can apply um, alone or you can do your own approved mix. So while you may think the 240H 2,4-D trait means you can spray any 2,4-D on Enlist cotton, that is wrong. Only Enlist One or Enlist Duo are labeled products for Enlist crops. So there are three key aspects to Enlist cotton. So first, the use of Enlist herbicides for broad spectrum control 
um, of hard to control weeds. This has a multi, uh, multiple tolerance meaning, so more weeds and more control options in one system. Um, second, you have more options. Three herbicide tolerances enable additional herbicide modes of action. Um, so thus getting you flexibility and easy to use. So our reduced drift potential and what we call near zero volatility um, from our Colex D technology means endless herbicides land and stay on target. So we have a wide application window and the versatility of endless herbicides make them easy to incorporate with your weed management plans. Um, and just also a note, Wide Strike 3 is our BT technology that I mentioned before. Um, so just as you know, Jeff mentioned and Blaze has talked about, we strongly encourage a program approach. We are working to promote good practices against pigweed and other hard to control weeds. Uh, this includes pre-emergence and cultural practices. Enlist isn't a save all, it's another good tool in our toolbox to be used along with good practices. So one of those best practices is full rates. Apply full rates for both Enlist One and Enlist Duo. Um, the Enlist Duo rate is 4.7 pints per acre and the Enlist One rate is two pints per acre. Uh, use sufficient water so that 10 to 15 gallons is where you need to be by ground only, absolutely no air applications. Spray when weeds are both small and actively growing. So the difference between volatility and drift, I think it's important that people understand this formulation to build their confidence in it. So this is, I think the third year in a row I've been talking about it, but the refresher is always good. Physical drift is the movement of the herbicide before it reaches the intended target. Volatility is the movement of the herbicide after it has landed on the intended target and then moves, moves away from it. So extensive testing in lab and field settings um, with university cooperators as well as internally has shown significant reduction in off-target movement with herbicides containing our Colex D technology that is in Enlist. So one of my favorite slides, here's my chemistry lesson that I get to give. Um, let's talk about the chemical structure. So uh, in 2,4-D, <clears throat> which is the amine, uh, DMA, the amine portion is more likely to break away from the 2,4-D acid. So uh, if you look at that chemical structure, the amine that stabilizes the 2,4-D acid when they are connected, but when they break away, the 2,4-D acid is left unprotected and it's more likely to volatilize. So that's what you see on the, the top. Um, in 2,4-D choline, the choline portion of the structure is much less likely to break away from the 2,4-D acid. Uh, the negative charge that you see on the, the O negative, I can see kind of on the, the middle of your screen on the bottom. Here, I think I have a pointer, sorry. Can you see my pointer? Okay, so the, the O negative. Um, and the positive charge on the N positive here, so that bond is what keeps it um, basically protected and more securely together. So when the 2,4-D acid portion is protected by the choline portion, the 2,4-D acid has a much less occurrence of actually disassociating from the choline, which would cause volatilizing. So that's why it does not volatilize like the amine. So I don't know if that made sense to you guys. <laughs> it made sense to me. <laughs> Um, and as far as volatility potential, if you look at the chart on the, the right hand side over here, so here's your 2,4-D ester, here's your 2,4-D amine. So these are the old 2,4-Ds that we're used to dealing with. Here's our 2,4-D choline. So this is why we call it the near zero volatility because it has a 96% um, percent reduction versus the ester and an 87 and a half reduction versus the amine. Um, and just to kind of touch bases again about it. So on the chart here on the left, that is our BAPMA dicamba and glyphosate. And here is our endless duo with the Colex D technology. It is a 236 times less volatile than dicamba. So I'm not saying it's not gonna, not gonna move, right? Cause there's no product that doesn't drift but the, the actual formulation and the characteristics of this product, it's not a volatile product. Uh, 
Um, another thing that makes us different is the ability to mix glyphosate, glufosinate, as well as AMS. Dicamba labels um, restrict these uses. Small quantities of AMS can greatly increase the volatility and potential of dicambas, but when you add an acidic product to Enlist One or Enlist Duo, it doesn't break the charge or cause volatility. Uh, let's talk label requirements. So you need to understand your wind direction and speed. You need to be aware of nearby crops and landscape that includes susceptible as well as sensitive crops, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Um, avoid inversions. You must have the correct equipment that includes nozzles. Nozzles are key. Um, have them at the correct pressure as well as your boom height. Um, you need to check enlist tank mix dot com for label take mix partners um, and then of course thorough equipment clean out so uh, wind speed apply and list herbicide when the wind is between 3 and 10 miles per hour you should not apply and list herbicide during any temperature inversion or when you think there is potential for inversion so i know sometimes you go three to ten well what if there's no wind well no wind is not good no wind usually means that there it could move later or there might be an inversion um, and the other thing to really mention is shifting winds right you can start an application and if you don't check it by the time you're done the wind could have shifted and moved four or five different ways so, um, and then of course, do not spray when the wind is blowing towards an adjacent susceptible crop. This doesn't say there's a buffer. This doesn't say, you know, if you're two, two fields down, if the wind is blowing towards a susceptible crop, you cannot legally make that application. Um, so understanding what a susceptible crop is versus a sensitive crop, um, a susceptible crop is where you spray drift may occur on food, forage, or other plantings that might be damaged or crops thereof, rendering unfit for sale, use, or consumption. So these susceptible crops would be melons, um, cotton that is not traded within list, those such things. Sensitive areas are those areas that have been identified by the EPA as potential habitats and locations of protected species. So I would say, I would think of like a park or yard or um, anything like that. So the label requires a 30 foot downwind buffer to protect sensitive areas. So if the wind is blowing towards a sensitive area, you can use that 30 foot buffer. On a susceptible crop, if the wind is blowing towards that area, you cannot make a legal application. Applications near cotton. Um, so this is a big deal for us here. Um, other than a few areas with melons, this is our most susceptible crop, right, when during in-season use. So non-enlist cotton is considered susceptible, and if there is cotton downwind, I know I'm being repetitive, but I need you guys to hear it, <laughs> um, you cannot spray enlist. There is no safe buffer. Um, kind of coming back to sensitive areas that we talked about, so a wooded area, pasture, roadside ditch, lawns, tree plantations. Um, sensitive areas are the areas that have been identified by the EPA as a potential habitat for a protected species. Um, so I think I talked about that in the buffer, so we're good. Um, here we talked about the 30 foot buffer does not apply to the downwind susceptible crop. Again, if there's a susceptible crop, cotton, melons, grapes, anything like that, you cannot legally make that application until the wind is blowing away from that crop. Some important non-susceptible crops to know, um, rice, peanuts, grow a lot of that here in Arizona, right? <laughs> Uh, sorghum, soybeans, corn, wheat, and alfalfa. <laughs> um, some advantage of these non-susceptible crops is you can make safe applications when the wind is blowing towards them and still have no issues. These crops um, have some level of inherent tolerance to 2,4-D naturally. Oh, and again, I think I made my little stars, yes. So these are the main ones for us here in Arizona. All right, so what is a temperature inversion? Well, it's a weather condition that um, could potentially allow pesticides to move beyond their field of application. This occurs when a warm, when warm air covers a 
cool, sorry, let me say that again. <laughs> when a layer of warm air covers a layer of cooler air, basically putting a lid on the surface level air and it prevents it from rising and mixing normally into the upper atmosphere. So these gases get trapped near the surface and they could shift, they could either hover there um, or shift sideways and move off target. So let's see what to look for. Um, so applying during an ideal wind speed of that three to 10 helps with that, right? Don't apply when there's no wind. Inversions are most likely when the wind speeds are less than three miles per hour. Um, you'll not always see a fog hovering, but sometimes that's an indicator, right? Like if you're driving down the road and your dust seems to just kind of hang out there, that's a good indicator that there could be an inversion. Um, so we want, like I mentioned, I know again, repetitive, but it's kind of important. We want a light wind three to 10 miles per hour um, when making this application. Applicators should continue to monitor conditions in the field throughout the whole herbicide application. So whether that's releasing smoke or powder, um, whatever you need to do to indicate there's particle movement, uh, it should, you should see that drift with the wind. If it's stationary or it's kind of gathered and doesn't go anywhere, it's suspended, then there might be a temperature inversion. I like to do some donuts in my truck and stir up some dust, but that's not the recommended practice for inversion testing. Um, field placement is so key. There are situations where you can plan yourself out of any legal application. So do not plant enlist in the middle of a non-enlist cotton block. <laughs> you cannot legally apply it enlist if you do this. Don't limit, limit yourself by planting non-enlist in the middle of enlist cotton either. Um, I hate to say pick a team for an entire farm, but I will tell you definitely pick a team for your cotton blocks. So don't interplant the dicamba traded um, along with our 240. I would say, you know, try to block things together, pay attention to susceptible and surrounding crops. And this is the most important and first step that you will make in being able to use this technology correctly or not at all. And there's just another picture of um, something that you would not want to do. Um, so I mentioned this earlier about shifting winds. How often does the wind blow perfectly straight? Like never, right? So take care during an application to monitor the wind. It's a pain. People are busy. We have acres to get across, but trust me, it's not worth the headache of just trying to get through the application. Stop what you're doing every now and then, take a little break, monitor the wind, make sure that it hasn't shifted and constantly be aware of the surrounding. Um, okay, so equipment setup. I measured, I mentioned the importance of nozzles um, and boom height. So we have two, we have two different lists, one's for Enlist One and one's for Enlist Duo, and they both have the approved nozzles, and you must use according to the label for each product. Um, I, Enlist One actually has more flexibility and more nozzles, but just make sure you're paying attention to that. So use only the labeled nozzles within the maximum pressure range. So that's the other side of it, using the correct nozzles, but then also using the correct pressure. Um, and then boom height, typically 24 inches or less above the crop canopy. Anytime you change that, the more you bring that up, the more you're gonna have drift particles. So definitely stick to both of those things in, in, on the label and paying attention to what you're doing. Um, and then another thing, start with a clean sprayer. Uh, we talk about you know our triple rinse system and cleaning out the sprayer, but it's also really important that you start with a clean sprayer. So here's examples of those approved nozzles. Um, these are the ones for the Enlist Duo. You can see that we have 23 nozzles here. So you, you have options um, and these are all air induction nozzles. And these are the ones for Enlist One. And like I mentioned, um, we have 47 nozzles on this one. So, I mean, worst case scenario, call me up, say, Kristen, can you help me out? Like help me figure out nozzles, help me get nozzles, whatever you need. Just make sure that you are using the correct nozzles. Um, water volume, very, very simple. 10 to 15 gallons by ground only, no air applications and no chemigation. Uh, tank mix partners. So enlisttankmix.com is our website. 
If you have any questions about any products that you can mix with, please go there. Um, there are products on or not on there that would probably mix just fine, but we haven't tested them yet. So another comment to make is this testing doesn't include crop tolerance or physical compatibility. So these are just the um, standards that are established by the EPA that allow us to put them on this list. Um, another differentiation that's important um, is specific drift reducing agents, so um, DRAs, are not required when tank mixing with Enlist Duo or Enlist One. So DRAs are not restricted in the same way as they are with Dicamba. Um, so this gives you the ability to recommend your qualified proprietary adjuvant or drift retardant. So while you do not have to put one, you can. And a mixing note, um, do not mix PowerMax <laughs> and Enlist at the same time. Make sure you have lots of water. So I would say fill your, your tank with the water, add the Enlist, and then do the PowerMax. So um, it, these two don't do well together. The key is making sure you have sufficient water. Um, okay, so here's our triple rinse system. Basically our sprayer clean out. It is a very important practice and also um, not just a practice, it is required by the label. So it's not usually the tank that gets forgotten. <laughs> Sometimes it's the small things, right, that cause the big problems. So pumps, hoses, booms, filters, screens, dead ends, all those types of things, um, they need to be addressed and cleaned out as well. So don't let the spray solution sit in overnight. That's kind of obvious, but it needs to be pointed out, I guess. Um, and always follow this triple rinse system that we have. So what does the triple rinse system look like? Um, completely drain the system, including the pump lines and boom. Fill the tank with clean water to at least 10% of the sprayer volume. I would encourage more, especially on that first one, I would say probably closer to half. Um, circulate through the system at least 15 minutes and then spray the solution through the boom. That's your first rinse. Now we're on to our second rinse. So completely drain the system, same as the first, remove and clean filters and strainers. Fill the tank to that 10% spray volume at least. Um, and if you're gonna use cleaning agents, this will be the stuff that you do that and use those at the recommended rates. So circulate through the system at least 15 minutes. Um, and then it says, let the solution stand for several hours, preferably overnight. I know that's not very realistic when you're trying to get <laughs> sprays done. You can't just let, you know, oh, I'm on rinse number two. I'm gonna let it set overnight but definitely circulate through this 15 minutes and let it sit. If you can give it an hour or so, that's, that's what you're gonna need to do. Um, and then spray out the solution through the boom. And we're on to our third rinse. So completely drain the system, including lines and boom again, fill with clean water to at least 10% of the sprayer volume, circulate through 15 minutes, spray out the solution through the boom. Completely drain the system. Um, remove clean nozzles, tips, and uh, strainers separately. So I know it seems like a lot, but this is very important um, when we're being good stewards of this product to not cause issues down the road. And uh, the other comment that I will make is yes, this takes time. So like if you guys are spraying and <laughs> your guy's like, oh yeah, 30 minutes, I triple rinsed. Well, he didn't. So <laughs> Make sure we're just, you know, stopping what we're doing, slowing down a little bit and doing these triple rinse system correctly. Um, I also have these application guide stickers for your uh, spray tanks, tractor windows, application binder, whatever you need. So if you're interested in having these stickers, just kind of as a reminder for your applicators, uh, let me know and I'd be glad to mail them to you or bring them to you. You are not required to record your application as in with some other chemistries. Um, however, I really do feel it's good farm management practices um, to keep these records, right? So that you know what's going on and, and not just to not incriminate yourself, but if somebody blames you for something, you can say, no, look, here's when I sprayed, these were the conditions. Um, it, you know, It's just a good practice to do. So I would recommend, Definitely your field location, the crop stage of growth, obviously the time and the date, what the wind was doing. Uh, put down your nozzles. Let them know that you were using the correct nozzles that were on the label. 
Um, and then again, I would even say, yeah, and then I did my triple rinse sprayer clean out. So while you are not required to keep this record, I, I do recommend it. Oh, I think I skipped over the knowledge check because we can't do this in person and no one can really raise your hand. <laughs> so in summary, uh, Enlist 1 and Enlist Duo are not restricted use pesticides and you are not required to have applicator training. However, I strongly encourage you to get on one of the webinars coming up um, and follow along with it. So we do have more tank mix flexibility than a competitors. Again, uh, AMS, glyphosate, and glufosinate are all fine to mix. Um, we have more nozzle selections, especially with Enlist 1. Overall, less volatile. Our sprays are allowed all the way up to mid-bloom, so you have flexibility. I do reiterate that we want you to spray when the weeds are um, small and actively growing and not wait till they're huge. Um, and basically overall less restrictive to make applications. So I encourage you to visit enlist.com or enlisttankmix.com if you have any other um, questions. There's the legal language. Please make sure that you read that really fast. Um, and if you just can't get enough of me, I am hosting another meeting tomorrow. <laughs> I'm gonna cover the same topics as today as well as some crop protection um, products as well. So please reach out if you didn't get an invite and you would like to join. With that, I say thank you. Thanks again to Randy and the university and all the participants, and I will turn it back over. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much. That was a great overview and reminder. You know, we have these phenoxy herbicides. It's critical that we use them according to label. Uh, we wanna keep them and, and protect that those tools. So thank you very much for those reminders and that training. All right, uh, we're going to move on. Well, any questions? Let, let's, if, if anybody has any questions that you want to throw out here to Kristen before we move on, we're, we're ahead of schedule, which is good. But uh, if you have any questions for Kristen, please uh, speak up. I have one. This is uh, Alex Holland. Um, do we have a label for Enlist One in Arizona yet? We do for cotton. We have a 24 C for both Enlist One and Enlist Duo. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. Thanks for the question. All right. Seeing no more questions, we're going to go ahead and proceed. We've got Frank Groves with us today from Nutrient Ag Solutions. Uh, he is going to be uh, discussing the Dynagrow offerings for growers here in Arizona. So, Frank, I appreciate you joining us today from, uh, let's see, where are you? you're in Arkansas, is that right? Yeah, I'm in Little Rock. All right, great. Well, we're glad you're here. And do you have some slides you want to share? Yeah, I'll share my screen. All right. Uh, let's see. Yep. We'll try this. Is it full size? Looks good. You're good to go. Okay. All right. Y'all, y'all have to bear with me a little bit. We use Teams all the time. I very seldom use Zoom. So this is a little slightly different format for me. Uh, so just uh, work with me. Well, Dr. Norton, I appreciate you inviting me to participate. Uh, been in this role. I'm the Down and Grove Cotton Product Manager. Been in this role for a couple of years now. Uh, been in the cotton business for several several years, a, a couple of decades actually. Uh, so been to Arizona uh, probably a dozen times throughout my career, but but certainly no expert on the Arizona production system. If you can't tell by my accent, I'm I'm from the Delta, and that's where uh, the foundation of my learning uh, started. But always impressed with how y'all do things out there. I will say this uh, as I slip over here to this other slide. If there was ever a time I wanted to be in Arizona for a uh, on location meeting, it would be today. Uh, over the last couple of days, we've gotten 16 inches of snow. And uh, a couple of days ago, I got up about seven in the morning and it was one degree outside. So it's typically uh, highs of 56 here, lows of uh, 40. So we're running about 40 degrees below 
what we're accustomed to here and certainly not used to any snow. So anyway, when the groundhog says more winter, he means it. I want to start by saying thank you. Uh, that's typically the way I wrap it up and I'm sure I'll say it again, but I just want to thank you all for, for what you all do. You know, the bulk of, uh, bulk of the production out there, I realize is seed block acres. As far as down grow is concerned, I think we book somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40% of our seed block in Arizona. And there's reasons for that. Um, I mean, there's certainly outstanding growers out there. There's gins that are uh, willing to work with us. And I mean, we all know the, the weather is as reliable in Arizona as anywhere in the country. And so it's kind of the bread basket for the seed block, I like to call it. Uh, but it's not all just uh, real easy either. I mean, there's double cropping challenges down in the Yuma area, We've got multiple elevation changes, water allocations, and of course, we're all aware of the heat tolerance issues. So despite all of that, uh, we're able to get things done. And uh, this last year, Randy, I, I commend you and your team for the work that you did with your trials under a COVID scenario, uh, making things even more complicated than normal. In 2021, we have three new varieties that we've released, uh, Dynagrove 3456, Dynagrove 3535, and Dynagrove 3799. Now, I'll kind of jump back and forth during my presentation today and discuss a little bit about uh, trialing data, a little bit about what's coming up that you'd want to put on, on your acre. And I'll also refer to production acres also because these varieties are new to uh, most of the cotton belt in 2021, but they're certainly not new to the Arizona seed production group. Uh, they've been growing these for the last couple of years, ramping seed up uh, so that the rest of the belt could enjoy these. So Dynagrove 3456 is an early, early mid maturing variety. It's, it's really targeted for the east. So I won't go into a whole lot of detail about, about it. It does okay in, in Arizona. It's something we grow seed of out there, but I don't know that it's, its home is, is in the heat. It doesn't, as well as the higher elevations, it doesn't do so well out there. Down and grow 3535, P3XF, we will go into a little more detail about it. It's a mid-maturing cotton variety, uh, really does well uh, across a large footprint and handles stress pretty well also. And I think there were several acres of it grown in Arizona last year. Down and Grove 3799, it's the full of season variety that we offer. It's targeted for uh, South Georgia. It's not anything that I would recommend for the Arizona market. Uh, we do have some seed production of it out there and you can get away with it if you plant it early enough, but it's critical that we plant it early enough. So because it's not targeted to your market, I'm not gonna be discussing it in detail today, but those are the three. If you look in one of our sales brochures that are new for 2021. We recently held our advancement meeting. We do that in January of every year and we advanced the varieties that we'll be releasing in 2022. So, uh, Many of you will be growing these varieties uh, this, this year. So, <clears throat> so the second digit in our numbering system indicates maturity. So we've got Dynagro 3214 B3XF. It's probably the earliest maturing variety that we have. We've got a, a very limited seed supply of it. As a matter of fact, we're, we're not even going to sell any of it in, in 2021. Uh, probably going to have very limited sales of it in 2022. Uh, so we're just working on getting it ramped up for the moment, but it's, but it's very promising. So we will have some acres of it on, on many of you this year, trying to get it ramped up. Uh, 3387, it's a mid early variety. Uh, it's probably the closest thing that we've had that from a uh, 3385 replacement. It's, it's not the same background, but it does grow off very similar, fits uh, a very similar geography, and we're, we're excited to work with it. Dynagrove 3422B3XF, it was tested as DGX13421 DR. So, so this was our 3421 reselection. We had some issues with 3421, as many of you may know. 
it, it's always yielded very well for us, but it had some, uh, some bigger issues, some emergence issues. And so we went back and made a reselection of it, got a little larger seed, solved the emergence issues and early season vigor issues, and uh, was able to come out with, with a version that yields very similar, has a very similar fiber package to the 3421 that we're all familiar with. Down growth 3469. This is DGX 13671-C. It's an early mid. It's got a broad footprint. Uh, it's, it's, it's one that we are very excited about for Arizona. It's shown uh, really good potential in, in an Arizona type environment. And so Randy, we'll be entering it in your in your test coming up this season. And then down row 3644B3XF was tested as DGX139241. It's a mid full, uh, but it's also, it's targeted primarily for the Delta, but it's a root knot and reniform resistant variety uh, that is probably the best offering that we have in our mid full lineup. And last but certainly not least, a, a little uh, diversity in our group here. We've got Dynagrove 1464 GLTP. Uh, so we're excited to continue our relationship with BASF and be able to offer this. It was tested as DGX 14003-1. Again, uh, an early mid variety that's, that's very broadly adapted. I didn't go through all the detail with each and every one of these lines, but with the exception of the 3422, every and the 30 and the uh, 3644 all of these are bacterial blight resistant vert tolerant and and all of them are smooth leaf so so those would be the only two that that are not bacterial blight resistant right now i'm going to kind of give a, a little bit of an overview of your testing i didn't have any any testing in arizona this year uh, we are expanding our testing uh, to encompass more, more regions, I guess we could say. So hopefully we'll do a little bit better job of that. Just in looking at what you had, you had seven different locations in 2020. And, you know, I don't know if these are typical, but just by kind of judging what you had uh, as, the, as the top performers there, I would say that the Yuma performed more like a, a typical mid. Uh, I'd say the Goodyear location performed more like a typical mid, whereas uh, Marana and Bonita performed like early mids. And then you had Stanfield, Eloy, and Thatcher performing like mid fools. Um, I don't know if you'd agree with that or not, but that's just by looking at what came to the top, uh, that's, that's the way that it looked. In our I guess uh, let's just start here in the mid category. So in the mid category, 3570 B3XF performed very well. Uh, 3570 led both Yuma and Goodyear. I think there were 10 entries it, it led. It was number one out of 10 at both of those. Uh, I think the second place in each of those cases, it wasn't uh, statistically significant from second place, but, but it did lead to trial as well as the value per acre. Uh, when we get down here to Bonita at uh, the early mid location there, our 3402 led the trial and it was statist statistically significant in both yield, uh, or certainly for yield, I'm not sure about value per acre, we'll look at that here in a minute. But, but I think you can tell here that the real gap in our portfolio and what I'm going to try to strengthen for you guys is our, uh, is our mid full our full varieties, especially in that high heat kind of area. We just, we need to do a better job there. So let's take a look at this. Uh, well, I don't know how to get my camera off my, off the side that's blocking me what I want to talk about, but I'll, I'll keep going here. So like I mentioned a minute ago, 3570, uh, it led to trial. Now it's it's certainly not bulletproof. It's it's got it's got a few warts that uh, I don't I don't mind talking about. You know it's it high mic'd in this trial. It had a mic of 5.2 where the test mean was 4.7. 
And the length is a little bit shorter than, you know, what we would like to see at 1.13. But even, even with those uh, issues, I think it still came in at the highest value per acre. And we all know how, how multi-location trials go, where you've got uh, same lineup across multiple locations. So it's being managed for one particular group or the other. So that's something to be certainly to watch out for on 3570. If you're not careful, it, it certainly will high mic. If we go over here to, uh, to Goodyear, again, 3570 led the trial there, um, 2,153 pounds with a 32.7 lint percent. So we are really uh, happy with its performance. Don't have any problem recommending planning it, but we do need to watch out for the micronair. Uh, moving on here to the Bonita location. So we had 3402. I think this was the only location that we had 3402 entered in. And anyway, it, it did lead that trial with 1377 pounds to the acre. Uh, its micronair looked considerably better at 4.1, where the test mean was 3.9. Um, again, the length was a little shorter than what I'd like to see, 1.1 compared to 1.18. That's a, that's a little surprising to me based on how it's performed in other areas of the country. But, you know, short season, high heat can, can change some things. So, so it is what it is. But anyway, we are, we are happy with that. We're going to certainly continue to look for a similar yield with a little better fiber package. And again, on, uh, on the myth fools, we, we really didn't have just a whole lot to offer there. So that's where we're going to try to bulk up our, our performance. And I think in Marana, I don't believe we even had 3402 in that trial. So, so I'd like to see what it would look like uh, with another shot. So let's talk a little bit about these six new varieties that we have uh, for, for 2022, especially the uh, 3469 and 3644. The reason I'm focusing on those is those are the two, those are two that we're gonna be entering into uh, your testing program. So let me just jump ahead here a little bit. So whenever, uh, Whenever I think about what I'm going to enter into your testing program for this next year, I think on the early mid, right now I'm going to enter 3402 again and 3469, and then in the mid 3570, and we'll take a look at, at 3535 and see how its stability helps out, uh, certainly with the micronair. And then uh, from the mid full, we'll look at 3535 there also, along with that root knot reniform nematode line 3644. So, how do I do this? I need to share a different screen. Okay, can, can you see my Excel file? Yes, it's up. Okay, thank you. So, so where we were talking about a minute ago, uh, with the early mid trials, you know, we'll have 3402 in there. This, this, is a, this is yield and fiber data across eight locations in Texas. I have a, another tab over here that shows 10 locations east of Texas. But if we compare it back to, if we compare either one of those to 3570, so I'm looking at 3402, And 3469 up here. So at eight locations across Texas, and these locations were predominantly mid to early mid locations. So you can see that the 3469 is yielding about 100 pounds, they're about uh, 60 pounds, I guess, better than 3570. And the 3402 is, is yielding pretty similar. Uh, I think the point here that we need to point out is on the micronair, each of these have a lower micronair than the 3570 had. Uh, the 3402 is, is running 
about half a point and the, the 3469 is running pretty similar, pretty similar in length, uh, not a whole lot of difference in strength, but, but I think we will see an improvement over Micronair. If we move over here to uh, what I'm entering into the mid and compare it to 3570, This is across uh, locations in, in Texas. I think we'll see uh, 35, 35 does a little better job uh, east of Texas. Maybe that's where we need to be looking, but, uh, but it's gonna have similar yield there to 3570 with again, a reduced Micronair. And then if we look at 3644 compared to 3570, Again, we're going to see uh, a reduced Micronair value and a uh, much better length and and better strength than what we were seeing with 3570. And so, you know, if I wanted to take a look over here east of east of Texas, you can see here that uh, 3535 is the highest yielding of all of those lines that 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 we've been discussing. If we compare it to that longer season RKN reniform line. It's got very similar yield and, uh, and a little bit lower Micronair actually with similar strength and, and length. Well, the length, the strength's actually better. So anyway, I, I guess my point here is that we've got some better stuff coming and and we're excited about putting it in your uh, testing program, Randy, and kind of seeing, seeing how it does. Uh, but we do recognize that gap there in the mid full, and we're, we're working to address it. But uh, I think the take home message, we are excited about what we have in the marketplace right now uh, from a, from a uh, let me get back over here where I need to be, from an early mid and a, and a mid standpoint. And that's really all that I have. If there's uh, any questions, I'll be I'll be happy to address them. We also have uh, we also have Brandon Thor on the phone or, or online. He's he's our boots on the ground out in Arizona. Many of you work with him, and he does a great job. And we certainly appreciate everything that he does. Um, so he's available if we have any kind of questions that I can't address. Great. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate you taking the time to participate with us today. Brandon, we've got some time. If you have anything you want to add to what Frank has, has presented here, feel free to speak up. Uh, at the moment, I think uh, Frank covered it very well. Okay, great. Well, we look forward to working with you guys in 2021 and, and hopefully seeing some more of these experimentals, getting the chance to test them in our environment. So I appreciate, appreciate your guys' participation here today. Thank you. Any questions for the Dynagro team? Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and finish up with our last presentation. We're, we're well ahead of schedule, so I was taught a long time ago that the best way to win friends and influence people is to let them out of a meeting early. So uh, we, we, might, uh, we might have the opportunity to do that today. So we're going to next hear from the Gowan Cottonseed Company. Rick Neuenschwander is here with us. I think he's joining us via telephone. He might even be traveling today. Um, but we're going to turn that over to him. And Kyle's got your slides loaded, Rick. So. You just uh, kind of direct him when you want to advance. The first slide is up and the stage is yours. Very good, Randy. How am I coming through? You're coming through just fine. Awesome. I appreciate it. You know, it's always a, always a pleasure, I guess, to be the last presenter of a day after a long meeting. Uh, you know, I thought I was going to start off this meeting. I, I thought we'd have um, 
anyway, I thought we'd have a little bit more time. I was gonna, I was looking forward to kind of telling the, the story about uh, Biden, Trump, and the rabbi going into the bar in Parker. But uh, in order to kind of keep things uh, a little on the short side, I decided to jump right into this. Uh, yeah, we're Dallin Cotton Company, Rick Newenschwander. I'm based out of Lubbock, Texas, but uh, a uh, U of A grad and, and uh, spent a lot of my early career as a PCA in the, on the Colorado River up in the Parker area. I guess we'll, we'll start it off by what is a hybrid Pima cotton. Um, in the simplest terms, what we've done is we've taken an upland variety, a Pima variety, and we've crossed them. We are the only hybrid cotton that's currently on the marketplace. And uh, I think it, it poses a, a lot of special and unique advantages by, by creating this, this hybrid system. We are, we are a pure Pima linen fiber. Um, we've been in the state of California for well over 20 years. We're paid as a Pima, we're classed as a Pima. Um, as far as the lint, lint is concerned, we are a Pima cotton. What does this look like in the field? It essentially looks like an upland plant. Um, it's very aggressive, it's a very vigorous variety. If some of you with a little bit of gray behind your ears like me, if you can remember Delta Pine 90, um, shares a lot of the very similar growth characteristics of a Delta Pine 90. Um, unmatched vigor up and out of the ground um what you would expect in a hybrid vigor it's the same same philosophy when you cross breed cattle for hybrid vigor um that's kind of what it looks like um if you want to go to the next slide these we've been in the in randy's university of arizona trials for the last two years 2019 2020 this is basically giving yield summaries uh for both of the two very different years 2019, um, more of a cooler, wet year by Arizona standards. 2020, but basically blistering hot, multiple uh, stage two um, heat scenarios. The nice thing about what I'm seeing in the data is that we can consistently yield in both environments. If it's a cool, wet year, if it's a, if it's a hot year, um, we can still perform in, in both of those environments. We are a mid full variety very very responsive to management um works well as an early pushing hard as a full season works good behind a double crop scenario or in a delayed planting situation if you want to plant a little bit later to kind of put that peak bloom curve over to the right and try to uh set a better top given the mid full dynamics of the variety given its response to management um, we can play in all three of those arenas um, in the 2020 trial um, we outperformed the nearest production or released pima variety by well over 400 pounds um, i personally have grown this variety for about 20 years in central california um, that's what really stood out to us about the hybrid Pima is just the significant differences in, in yield can, compared to traditional long season Pima types. Um, part of the biggest reason that we see these yield increases is because we typically, because again, half the plant is made up of an upland type, we're typically setting fruit on node five and node six, as opposed to node seven, eight, or nine on traditional long Pima season types. So we're able to set that early crop and then if we have a hot summer, we're going to shed just like any and every other cotton that's on the market. But setting that bottom crop, understanding we're going to see some shed in the middle, and then able to follow up with a strong top crop allows us to out yield and outperform most other Pima types just because we can set more crop earlier. And I think that the numbers bear itself out. If, if you look at... Uh, our two-year average across all sites, and that's Yuma, Maricopa, Safford, uh, we're, we're approaching three bales. Three bales on a 95 cent loan rate um, is a pretty good proposition. Next slide, please. This just gives you an idea of what we're typically looking at with the variety when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, to fiber quality. We'll typically be 46 to 48, probably in Arizona, a little bit higher on the 48 side. Strength, not an issue. Mike, typically not an issue with us. Uh, guys that have been out of the Pima business for a couple of years, you'll probably remember base loan rate on Pima was at 81 cents. In the last two years, that number has increased to 95.75. Next slide. 
these are just kind of, again, some of the key attributes about the variety. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit, uh, adapted to a wide planting window, long season double crop, late season planting. We're an extremely large variety. Uh, last year, I was planting cotton. Uh, one thing that, that I noticed was a trend within the industry was starting to see a, lar- a, a lot of small seeded varieties, BBs. Um, we're a very large seeded variety, 3,600 seeds per pound. Um, you know, I think it's been de- documented um, time and time again, larger seeded, seeded varieties basically equate to more early season vigor within that plant, just giving it a protein reserve in which to, which to pull from. Um, vigor is not an issue until it's an issue. Uh, you get into cool conditions, wet con- conditions. Um, We've seen lots of cases where the difference is, do you plant, do you replant or do you keep the stand? Um, again, early season vigor is a, a very strong attribute of, of the hybrid Pima cotton. One of the reasons, again, that we started growing this um, in California is because we had a lot of challenging conditions. Uh, we had high salt, high pH, low CEC, or area where we had basically zero or limited water availability or water allocations. Given the vigorous nature of the variety, given the attributes that you see in hybrid cottons, we could typically manage these situations, these less than optimal situations, sandy soils, high salts, high pH. Um, I was able to delay first irrigation um, by seven to 10 days. I was able to pull water seven to 10 days earlier. I was able to spread out interseason irrigation scheduling, again, just based the hybrid vigor and hybrid nature of the, of the variety. I think something that's that's kind of unique and talking on this last bullet point, something that's fairly unique about the variety is, you know, again, if you look in the field, this plant will look like an upland plant. It won't have those typical three lobe, you know, Pima type of leaf. You will have an upland leaf. You will have a Pima bloom that produces Pima fiber. But what you'll also have is you'll be ended, you'll end up with a fuzzy linted upland seed. What does that mean? Fuzzy linted seed compared to a naked Pima seed is generally going to save you in the neighborhood of $35 to $45 a ton on value because you're not having to crack the seed. Um, when we're looking at today's cotton seed prices, or, uh, it, 30 to 45 bucks is a big deal. Next slide. This is just kind of a, a take home on the heat. How does it handle a hot year like 2020? Maricopa trial yielded 1,839 pounds. Um, all trials combined in Arizona this year, on an average, um, taking all three trials into consideration, we were over over 1,500 pounds. I think this was a really good year for us. Um, that has been a challenge for Pima in the past, is to uh, have the ability to to withstand high daytime temperatures, high nighttime temperatures able to uh, maintain reasonable retention rates. Um, I, I think this is a big deal and really probably indicative of what to expect out of the variety in the future. One of the key things that I always try to look at when I'm looking at and assessing varieties and types of cotton and kinds of cotton is, okay, great tool. I see your yields. Um, how does this pertain to me and my, me and my farm? My take home to a lot of guys is, is this is a great tool in which to mitigate risk. Um, one of the reasons we started growing Pima is that we were tired of, of tired of growing 52 to 55 cent loan rate upland with no control and no dictate over the price that we received for the commodity that we grew. When I'm looking at a 95 cent loan rate, when I'm looking at, for example, the Calcott pool on Pima for the 2020 crop, you're looking at mid 120s as settlement. So when I look at 95 cents, when I look at a pool price or a pool settlement price of 120 plus, when I'm looking at yields over three bales, the equivalent of that on a gross per acre for an upland crop, you're going to have to be growing close to six bale upland on a consistent basis to compete with both the yield of a 1432 and Pima pricing at three bales. So do I say go out and plant all 1432? No. I say that it's a good tool. It's a good tool to mitigate market risk. It's a good tool to mitigate risk on your farm from pricing pricing pressures that we have no control over. 
I think it's a great tool to have in your toolbox. If it was all that easy, I mean, everybody would be growing that there are some challenges and, and, and there are some double-edged sword advantages to the variety. We are a non-GMO cotton. Um, that, pro, that poses opportunity and it pr pr proposes challenges. The challenges are obvious. No over the side, no over the top herbicide, no BT. Um, I'll be frank with you. We've done this for, for multiple, multiple years. I've grown the variety for over 20 years myself. Using a good, aggressive, pre-emerge program, overlapping chemistries, multiple modes of action, we have not had any major issues or things that have got away from us as long as we are on time with our applications, multiple modes of action, and we're nailing the time of our pre-emerge programs. Um, it's daunting. Um, it's a little bit scary if you're getting back into it. Um, but I, I can assure you with the products that we have on the market, with, with our Treflans, with our Prowls, with our, with our Caparols, uh, with our Outlooks, with our Warrants, with our Duels, with our Staple, just to name a few, um, we certainly have ample tool in the to tools in the toolbox to develop and put together high quality weed control programs for growers. When it comes to the BT side of the deal, we're early in this. We've been in this for two years in the state of Arizona uh, with pink bollworm eradication, with so much BT cotton in the marketplace. We quite, not, we quite frankly have not seen substantially different treatment thresholds or insect presence from a lepidoptera perspective um, that have posed any issues to us in our crop. Um, I can't tell you why that is. Uh, I can only tell you that it is. Um, so again, it's something to be aware of. I, I'm sure there could potentially be some additional sprays or input costs, but to this point, we quite frankly have not seen that in a meaningful way with this variety over the last two years. So I hope that answers a lot of questions. Um, I, it's really easy when you're a single cotton company with a single variety with no traits, it makes presentations uh, pretty time efficient. So, Randy, with that, uh, if there's any questions or anything that I can help address, uh, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you doing what you do. Thank you, Rick. I, I do have a question. One of the things that I noticed with that variety this year is the tremendous amount of lateral fruiting that you see on that. You know, uh, you can see up to five, six you know, positions, lateral positions on a branch. Have you guys looked at doing any... Uh, alternate row configurations, tested it under scenarios where you're looking at skip row planting uh, to see how it might fit in that type of an environment? Randy, that's a great question. And uh, being out here in Lubbock, Texas, we are the home of skip row. Um, we're looking at uh, two and two, two and one. Um, we're looking at a lot of different drip configurations with 60 inch, 80 inch. Uh, we're looking at splitting uh, tape that's on 80 inch centers and going 30 inch centers with 50 inch skips. Um, so we've looked at that across the board. I can tell you your intuition is correct. Um, given we, we are obviously not a stove type variety. Uh, we are a bushy type variety. We love to get wide. We love the row, the wide row configurations. That is part of that Pima genetics that is that you're seeing in that lateral fruiting positions. Well, give you an example first fruiting position on the hybrid will compose only 60 percent of that crop i say only 60 percent because when you're looking at other variety types you'll be at 70 to 80 percent of your total crop will be on that first position bowl we're basically close to 50 percent on the first position with the other 50 percent of that crop presented in position two three or as far out as four depending on total GDUs and total season length. So your intuition is dead on. Okay. Well, I know there's some interest here. I've talked to several growers in the state that uh, are looking at possibly doing that as a skip roll planting. So it'll be interesting to watch. Yes, sir. Any other questions for Rick? Yeah, this is Alex Holland. I'm just curious, uh, how do you gin it? Does it have to go through a roller gin or do, can it go through a saw gin? Yes, roller gin. Um, he, he, we have had some uh, some of our cotton that, that we, on an experimental basis, that we've run through a run through a saw gin. It, it just poses problems when you're running Pimas through a saw gin. In that number, first and foremost, the color doesn't match. 
So when you're looking at color grades between a Pima and an Upland, you're looking at two different color um, characteristics. So color will not match. Where we have done it in the past, um, we have actually marketed it as opposed to marketing it as a saw gen Upland. We've actually marketed it as a saw gen Pima. In, that, in those cases, you're typically looking at a upwards of 20 cent discount off of Pima price. So at the end of the day, I mean, it, it, you lose just so much value and there, and there, there's enough roller gins still left in the state of Arizona to where that, that should not be a prohibiting factor. You know, uh, one other thing that I will mention, and it's something that's gaining more and more prevalence is that because we are a non-GMO variety, um, we do have seed available both as treated and non-treated. Um, we have started to, to develop a pretty extensive organic Pima market uh, in West Texas. We're beginning to see that uh, in the state of California. Uh, just, I, I guess for everyone's benefit, where that organic Pima market is to date, um, I'm hearing prices between the $2.50 to $3.50 for organic Pima. Um, how that, it's a very young market, it's a very new market. Um, how that translates over time, are we going to be able to um, continue seeing those kind of prices going forward in the future? Uh, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. I can simply say what is happening today. And again, looking at cropping options, looking at risk mitigation tools, if, if that would fit into an existing organic rotation, I, I think it's something really worth looking at and really considering. Yeah, I agree. We were seeing more and more, I get more and more questions every year about growing organic cotton, so it might have a fit there for sure. Yes, sir. Okay, any other questions for Rick? Okay, well, that brings us to the end of our day, folks. Uh, I sure appreciate all of you hanging on to the end. Thank you very much to our presenters, the university folks, and also the seed company reps. You all did a great job. You kept us all on time. In fact, get out about 20 minutes early. So thank you very much for your consideration of, of, uh, of everyone's time and your presentations today. Uh, again, if you, if you want CEUs, make sure that we get your number your license number so that we can get you recorded. So your four and a half CEUs, if you haven't typed it in the chat box or send it to us, or if you didn't put it on when you registered, we need to make sure we get it from you. You can contact me, contact Kyle, uh, any of the university folks, and we'll make sure you get, you get your CEUs. So uh, thank you again, and uh, hope you all have a great 2021, a great season, and uh, uh, a good year and a safe year. So thanks again for joining us.